2020 meeting of the City Council. This part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. All Council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. Please note, if you wish to comment on a closed session item, call one of the following numbers. 
when you wish to comment on a new item. You may also send an email to cityclerk at cityofsantacruz.com. The comments will be shared with the council members if they are received and will be entered into public record. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Mayor, Council Member Byers? Here. Matthews? Uh, she's, yeah, Brown? Here. Holder? Here. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Before we begin our meeting, I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Owaswa speaking Yupi tribe. The Homelessman tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. They working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and restore trauma. To begin our meeting today, we have a number of proclamations, and uh, the first of which is uh, proclaiming the uh, week of May 3rd, 2020 as Professional Municipal Clerks Week. Our clerks work really hard um, in our city and we are very appreciative of all the work that they do. And so I'll read a few of the whereas. Whereas, is, whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens and local government bodies and agencies of government at other levels. And whereas the municipal clerk serves as an information center on functional on functions of local government and community. And whereas this year marks the 51st anniversary of Municipal Clerks Week, which is celebrated and endorsed throughout the United States, Canada, and 15 other countries. And whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Municipal Clerk. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 3rd to May 9th, 2020, as Professional Municipal Clerk Week in the City of Santa Cruz, in recognition of the exemplary dedication to public service and extend appreciation to our City Clerk Bonnie Bush, Deputy City Clerk Julie Wood, and the amazing staff of the City of Santa Cruz, Cruz Clerk's Office. Thank you all for your amazing work that you do to, uh, to help support our members, the members of our community. Mm -hmm. Our second proclamation um, is proclaiming and declaring the week of May 17th as Public Works Week. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Mark Duddle, if he's on the line, he'd like to say a few words before the proclamation. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, although this has been a very strange eight weeks, uh, Public Works continues to deliver core services, keeping our residents safe. Um, while much has been accomplished, many challenges still lie ahead. And I'm confident the passion and talent of our public works staff is ready to meet those challenges. We take great pride in our service to the community, and we look forward to continuing to serve and improve our city this next fiscal year. I'd like to thank every employee in the department for their commitment to customer service and their professionalism and dedicate this proclamation to them. Thank you. And I'll read a few of the whereas um, to honor the work that our public works workers do for our community. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, quality of life, and well-being of the people of the city of Santa Cruz. And whereas these services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals, who are engineers, managers, supervisors, and employees from state and local governments and the private sector. And whereas public works personnel provide essential services and thus are continuing to work hard each and every day to keep our communities functioning with various responsibilities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz Public Works Department has been frequently recognized as a regional leader and innovative and forward-thinking projects and services that include active transportation, infrastructure, wastewater treatment and refuse, solid waste, energy efficiency, and sustainability. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, 
Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, to hereby proclaim the week of May 17th to 23rd, 2020, as National Public Works Week in the City of Santa Cruz, and urge all citizens to join me in celebrating the important projects and daily services of public works professionals and recognizing the substantial contributions that they make in protecting our health, safety, and quality of life now in these challenging days of the COVID-19 pandemic and always. Thank you all for your hard work. Oh, you're muted, Mark. Just wanted to thank you again. We really appreciate it. All right. Our next proclamation is declaring May, the month of May, as Affordable Housing Month. And um, before I move on to the proclamation, the city has created a web page to a list of the Affordable Housing Month events. I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen with members of the community. website at cityofsantacruz.com slash housing month. The city is providing resources for the community to do their own self-guided walking and biking affordable housing tour, as well as YouTube video link for an affordable housing finance class that the city hosted last fall. There will be more hosted events posted soon, including a Democratic Women's Club event and Monterey Bay Economic Partnership event. So again, you can um, find out where these events uh, are located, and you can also uh, find information about the tour uh, by going to cityofsantacruz.com slash affordable housing month. I'm experiencing a technical difficulty, but to the proclamation um, where our community continues to try to find ways that we can increase the amount of affordable housing. Um, we'd like to proclaim May as Affordable Housing Month. And whereas quality affordable housing is vital to the health, safe, vibrant, and diverse communities, a fact highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas affordable homes are the solution to homelessness and provide support to seniors, families, youth, veterans, people recovering from illness and people with disabilities. And whereas creating new permanently affordable homes and preserving and improving existing housing makes for stable, vibrant communities, helping residents maintain community roots and fostering racial and economic diversity for generations. And whereas nonprofit organizations, local jurisdictions, community organizations, faith-based groups, and many others continue to build inclusive communities supporting low-income people and those with special needs. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2020 as Affordable Housing Month in the City of Santa Cruz, along with other local leaders in the greater San Francisco and Monterey Bay area regions. And finally, um, we have one last proclamation, uh, proclaiming May, the week of May 10th, to 16th, 2020, as Police Appreciation Week in the City of Santa Cruz, and May 15th, 2020, as Peace Officers Memorial Day, in honor of those law enforcement officials who, through their courageous deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice to serve their community. I'd like to see if uh, Chief Andrew Mills is on and could uh, speak to this item. You can hear me, Mr. Mayor, but uh, we'd like to really thank uh, yourself and council for recognizing the uh, sacrifice that many of our folks have made uh, nationwide, even during the COVID crisis. Uh, more than 35 officers have lost their lives to COVID-19 because uh, they're out in the field contacting people every day all around the nation. Even here in Santa Cruz, as we well know, we've lost two officers um, in the past uh, to gunfire. 
And uh, this is a remarkable way for all of us to pause and remember uh, the sacrifice uh, that many people make, not only in losing their lives, but daily in missing families and birthdays. Uh, they work around the clock and uh, take extreme risks in terms of uh, contacting people. So we thank you for this recognition and we appreciate the, uh, the support that the Santa Cruz community has offered to us over the years. And so thank you very much. Thank you and thank you all for your hard work. And so, in honor of Police Appreciation Week and Peace Officers Memorial Day, I'd like to read a few of the whereas of the proclamation. To where the police officers of Santa Cruz have worked devotedly and unselfishly on behalf of the people of this community, including intentionally de-escalating violent incidents in spite of personal peril or hazard to themselves, and where Santa Cruz police officers have consciously worked towards inclusivity by purposefully seeking community engagement and whereas by their service and their dedicated efforts, these men and women have earned the gratitude of the city of Santa Cruz, and whereas the presidential proclamation also designated that each year the calendar week in which May 15th occurs or proceeds shall be proclaimed as, as Police Appreciation Week in recognition of the service given by the men and women who day and night stand guard in our communities. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, Mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the week of May 10th to 16th, 2020, as Police Appreciation Week in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all citizens to observe the week with law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities, have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, and proclaim May 15th, 2020, as Peace Officers Memorial Day, in honor of those law enforcement officers who through their courageous deeds have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community, where I've become disabled in the performance of duty. And I, I would also like to thank uh, Councilmember Golder for bringing uh, the items related to Police Appreciation Week to my attention so that we can conclude it on our agenda. Okay. With that, um, We'll moving, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we need to move into an agenda item. They'll be open for public comment. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements or of disqualification today. If so, you can press the button that would allow for you to raise your hand. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the clerk to announce any additions or deletions. There are none. <clears throat> I'd like to make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur on or around 6 p.m. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. This morning, the council convened in closed session via teleconference at 10.30 a.m. to uh, discuss the following matters. Item A was a conference with labor negotiators, uh, police, um, the, the council received a report from its chief negotiator, Lisa Murphy, on all bargaining groups, including uh, Police Officers Association, Firefighter IAFF Local 1716, Fire Management, Police Management, OE3 Mid-Managers and Supervisors, SEIU Local 521, and unrepresented uh, employees. Uh, item B involves real property negotiations in which the council received a report from its uh, chief negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, concerning properties at 920 Pacific Avenue and 333 Front Street. Um, parties to that negotiation are the city and Metropolitan Transit District, Santa Cruz County. Item C was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation the matter of Save Our Big Trees versus City of Santa Cruz uh, filed in 2019 in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. 
Item D was an item of anticipated litigation specifically related to a uh, notice of intent to file legal action against the city under the California Voting Rights Act. Um, I also reported this out of closed session at the May 10th meeting. There was no uh, further action taken by the council at this time. Uh, and likewise, there was no reportable action uh, in closed session. Thank you, Attorney Gondati. I'd like to call on the city manager to report and provide updates on the city's response to COVID-19. Um, I don't have a report uh, at this time, but we'll uh, be updating you when we get to the vegetarians. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. Okay. Next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. These are items 5 through 13 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in. We'd like to comment on items 5 through 13. Okay. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star 9 to raise your hand, and listen for the cue saying that you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who'd like to pull an item from consent? Vice Mayor Myers. I, I just have a question on item number six. Okay. Um, then I have questions on Items number eight and nine. What was Donna's? Anyway, yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Housing project to move to to accomplish this, or is this a minor a minor redesign in terms of site planning or locations of buildings, etc. Thank you. Uh, sorry, um, Lee. Before you start, can we take a one minute break? I need to hang up and retry calling because you guys are all garbled and we can't hear what you're saying. One 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 minute. I'll be right back.
shorter, unfortunately.
in partnership with the public, we've been doing a great job in extending the life to landfill. Well, again, you know, uh, great work that Public Works is doing to make sure that we're much more efficient and sustainable community. So thanks for all the work on that. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any further uh, questions or comments by council members? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to the public for public comment. So if you are um, on this call right now, if you could press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. So if there's any member of the public who would like to speak uh, on items on our consent agenda, you should call in now and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Members Byers? Aye. Matthews? I'm still absent, right? Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes uh, with uh, all council members, Vice Mayor and Mayor voting yes with. Councilmember Matthews absent. Okay, the next item on our agenda is our consent public hearing. These are items 14 and 15. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item that you want to comment on. Now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Are there any council members who would like to pull items 14 or 15? Seeing none, are there any council members who would only like to comment on items 14 and 15? Okay, seeing none, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak to an item on the consent public hearing, with the exception of items pulled, uh, which there are none, now is the time to do so. So if you could call in um, and press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set for two minutes. Okay, seeing no members of the public who would like to speak on this item, I'll bring it back to council for action deliberation. I see a hand raised by council member. I was gonna go ahead and uh, make a motion for item number 14. The motion for the second. By. And I don't know if you want me to, re yeah. Second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2020-08, amending sections 3.08.03 and 3.08. Point one zero zero of and adding sections 3.08.091 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code establishing regulations for the use, award, and evaluation of best value project delivery methods for construction projects. And I'd just like to thank the Water Department and the Public Works Department for bringing this, this, this uh, resolution and this process forward for our approval. I apologize for the interjection, but the council may take action on both items uh, in a single motion, should you uh, prefer okay. to do that. Okay, I'll also move the item number 15, second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2020-09, amending the Santa Cruz Municipal Code section 4.02. 0.021, which identifies various city positions authorized to issue certain, certain, certain citations. 
Okay, so we have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers. Um, Council Member Watkins, I see your hand is raised. Is that a second to the motion? That's a second. Okay, so we have a motion to move consent of the hearing items 14 and 15. Motion by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by uh, Council Member Watkins. I'll turn it over to the clerk to do a roll call vote. Council Members Byers. <laughs> Brown, uh, Matthews is currently absent. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. The pass is unanimously with Council Member Matthews absent. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the 2020. 2021 HUD Action Plan and 2028-2025 Consolidated Plan. Presenters are Tiffany Lake, Principal Management Analyst, and Jessica DeWitt, Housing and Community Development Manager. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, can you see the title uh, slide for the second public hearing? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so this is the second public hearing for the HUD Action Plan and Consolidated Plan. And our goals today are to seek council approval for funding for the 2020-2021 Action Plan, which includes updates to the budget related to COVID-19. And we also have additional funding for CDBG coronavirus response under the CARES Act. So I'll continue to call this CDBG CV moving forward. Uh, we also have updates to the citizen participation plan that allow us to have this public hearing um, virtually or via phone. And the public comment uh, noticing period has been shortened to five days under emergency uh, conditions. So we have some updates to the schedule that we saw on March 10th. On April 2nd, we received that additional CARES Act funding for CDBGCB of approximately $350,000, 20% uh, by HUD formula is administration. So we have about $282,000 available for allocation. Uh, from April 24th to May 4th, we received applications for CDBG CV funding. And so today at the second public hearing, we're looking for that final approval of the regular action plan budget as well as the new funding. So a summary of the CDBG budget that we saw at the March 10th hearing is that we have administration by the HUD formula. We're continuing with the rehab program. And for community programs, we're keeping funding consistent with last year for the Teen Center, Nueva Vista, and California Rural Legal Assistance. And we have a new program for homeless services. And we had two capital improvement projects for the Senior Center on Market Street and for homeless infrastructure projects. So the bulk of that will go to the hygiene renovation on Coral Street. We have some updates related to COVID-19 to the home budget. Program administration is updated by HUD due to pandemic response. And we are um, it's suggesting to increase the security deposit program from 100,000 to 125,000. This is a program that's administered by the housing authority. And we're also seeking to launch a pilot TBRA, which is tenant-based rental assistance eviction program with a partner agency community action board. We're modeling this after a program Watsonville is attempting to launch, uh, which will fund their program with 100,000. So this funding from home will extend the program to low-income residents of Santa Cruz County. It will be split evenly, uh, roughly, between extremely low, very low, and low-income residents of Santa Cruz. And uh, for CDBG CV applications, we received some really excellent applications from organizations across the community that are providing response services to COVID-19. Community Bridges submitted three applications, one for expanded Meals on Wheels services, which are experiencing a greater demand as a result of the pandemic. And they're also seeking to create um, for their Elder Day Center uh, enrichment activities that will decrease isolation caused by the pandemic, and Nueva Vista Community Resources is seeking to expand their food pantry options and provide direct rental assistance to clients with vouchers of up to $500. The Santa Cruz Community Farmers Market is seeking to expand a match program 
So it'll make additional SNAP dollars available to those with SNAP benefits and also benefit farmers. And Hope Services is hoping to uh, provide internet connectivity for clients and staff to make client support uh, available during the pandemic. And Community Action Board, we mentioned, we're hoping to launch a pilot tenant-based rental assistance program, which would provide eviction prevention funds. Um, we're still seeking a HUD waiver that will allow those home funds to go to past due rent. That's not a normal situation for home funds, but we're anticipating that a waiver will come out. We've had a number of waivers and we're uh, in discussion with HUD on a regular basis. Dientes is requesting uh, support for enhanced screening protocols that are necessary for emergency dental procedures. And Second Harvest Food Bank has seen a tripling of people using their services in Santa Cruz. So this funding would help to continue making healthy food options available to city of Santa Cruz residents and partner agencies. And the Santa Cruz Community Health Center is seeking to make essential supplies and food available to extremely low income clients. Now the total requested is over 500,000, but we only have 282,000 available for allocation. Um, and a lot of the requests are coming from community bridges because they do a lot in the community. Uh, but with the total requested at 512,000, we're not able to fund all of the programs as we're oversubscribed. We have a couple funding options up for discussion just to generate discussion. Uh, one of the proposals we're uh, suggesting to fund organizations one through six at the requested amount, and that would allow us to use the remaining funds split evenly between the Community Bridges Meals on Wheels program and Second Harvest Food Bank. And then another proposal, Proposal B, would fund all of the organizations one through seven at the requested amount, and less would be available for Meals on Wheels and Second Harvest Food Bank staff per First proposal A, it would be fewer contracts for us to administer and it allows us to award additional funds for second harvest and community bridges. And then another consideration is that we are already awarding 100,000 to community bridges from the normal CDBG uh, grant year funding for Nueva Vista. Um, so again, the goals today, we're seeking approval of the 2020-21 action plan budget and also uh, the budget approvals for the new CDBG CD funding so that we can submit our consolidated plan to HUD. So in your um, packets in attachment A, there is a full budget and a summary view is shown here. For CDBG with the new COVID funding, we have $1.2 million approximately to allocate. And for the home program, we have 430,000 to allocate. Um, and a lot of those CDBG CV applications are all new. So um, these proposals for the budget are other options that can be considered today. We'll probably take a lot of our time. We'll be coming back to this after public comment. Um, based on the updates from today, we'll be able to draft and update the 2020-2025 consolidated plan and make that available June 1st for public review. Then we'll submit to HUD the week of June 8th. Funding won't become available until July 1st, um, but we'll be able to retroactively repay pandemic-related expenses with CDBG CV funds once we do get that funding. And then in case we do not get the waiver for the eviction prevention program for TBRA, we might need to bring that item back to council so that we can update the program and still help those in Santa Cruz. And if you have any questions about any of these goals, um, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm ready for questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, are there any questions from council members at this point in time? Councilmember Brown. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, could you go back to the to the options slide for a second? Sure. Thank you. And thank you for your work on this. Uh, it's a really quick turnaround and um, under really un, in uncertain time. So uh, it's much appreciated that you have worked to come up with these two um, options for us. I guess I'm wondering in that conversation uh, if the 
if you had any discussion about, uh, and I understand the, the rationale for having fewer contracts, but was there any discussion about, uh, you know, funding all of the programs and distributing those across the nine rather than providing full funding to the first uh, six and then, um, I, mean, I guess I'm just not sure why Community Bridges, why Meals on Wheels and Second Harvest would be the ones that were, uh, it was determined to do a uh, reduced funding amount if we fund no way. Yeah, so, yeah, so a lot of the rationale is just that those asks are so much higher than all the others. If we fund those at higher levels, we wouldn't really be funding the others at adequate levels. The other asks are much more um, moderate. Um, we're trying to help as many organizations as possible, but that definitely is a consideration. When we reduce the amount available for all of the other programs, um, then we um, cut into their ask a lot more um, while not necessarily being able to raise the amount for Community Bridges, Meals on Wheels, and Second Harvest Food Bank um, that much. But we definitely, the need is so great that we could consider, um, you know, putting the majority of the funding to just those two and not funding any of the others. Um, it's a very, it's a very hard uh, decision to make. Thank you, Councilmember Golder. Down. She might be having some trouble. I don't see her video. Um, I had a quick question regarding the um, the tenant-based eviction protection funding. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Um, like, what are some of the constraints, and how would that be rolled out? Has the, have those conversations happened yet? Yeah, so there are a number of home waivers that we've requested to try to make a tenant-based rental assistance program easier in this time, HUD's providing them so that in pandemic conditions, um, some of the regulations are loosened. So some of the loosening includes things such as allowing for uh, self-certification of income by the clients, not having to inspect the units, it being okay for a lease to already be in place, um, you know, allowing it to be available to all low-income persons and even those having trouble documenting their income. Um, given that these are federal funds, I'm also wondering, do, would people whose um, current citizenship status, would those people also be able to apply for these funds? Or would there be waivers essentially for those? Yeah, so that would not be something that would be necessary to submit for this assistance. It's not um, part of the required documentation required by these programs. Okay, thank you. That's really good to know. Okay, um, seeing no further comments uh, from council members, uh, members of the public would like to call in. Uh, the numbers should be displayed on your screen. <clears throat> uh, and if you're interested in commenting on item number 16, which is before us, please press star nine on your phone. Uh, when we click on, uh, we allow for you to talk, uh, you will hear an announcement that you are on the line and you will have two minutes to speak on this item. Uh, first member of the public, you are on the line. Well, good afternoon. My name is not Elmer Fudd, but I am a concerned citizen. I'm going to address uh, number 16. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, the special considerations based on this pandemic, pandemic, I just started making notes when this was done, so here I go. Many use these available funds, such as necessities of food stamps, so that they can survive, in particular feeding their children. Stipulations that will go into effect on July 31st, my understanding is that all funding will be cut from these cow, cow perks, whatever, food stamps, also unemployment, unless those citizens receiving that aid follow certain instructions. And it's my understanding that some of those instructions for these tests are really quite deadly and controlling. And this is leading to 
fascism. So I'm going to make note of the 1902 Biological Control Act, which greatly made it easier for vaccines to be um, put forth into the market. So I'm just concerned, and I'm hoping that other citizens are concerned about these actions. Thank you very much. I'm done. All right. Thank you. All right, next member of the public, you're on the line. Good afternoon, council members. This is Helen Ewan Story, Assistant Director of the Community Action Board. Hi, and this is Paz Padilla, Housing Program Developer for Catholic Ter uh, for CAB. <laughs> We're grateful to be included in the CDBGCV home proposal for pilot rental assistance funding during this critical time. We have seen a 50% increase in calls for rental assistance since the COVID-19 crisis began. We are seeing those who have lost employment or reduced hours at work, such as service workers, house cleaners, et cetera, calling as uh, in distress, needing assistance in paying the rent during this challenging time. This funding is critically needed at this time and will ensure it's distributed toward the greatest need in the city if, if granted the funding. We anticipate we'll be able to serve approximately 100 households with this funding. We thank you and your staff for your leadership and partnership in dealing with this crisis and supporting housing stability in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next speaker, you're online. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Brady. I'm a grant writer for Hope Services. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking the uh, city of uh, Santa Cruz Economic Development Department for their uh, funding recommendation for CDBG CV funding, as well as the city council and mayor for uh, your time and consideration. Um, Hope Services is the largest provider of services to individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities in Santa Cruz County. Um, uh, over 130 of our clients across our programs are Santa Cruz uh, residents. Like most organizations, our programs are currently being impacted by the shelter-in-place orders. All of our programs deemed non-essential are currently shut down. Uh, this funding would uh, allow us to uh, transition our non-essential programs uh, to home-based remote service delivery uh, or distance learning. Because many of our clients are medically vulnerable, we expect this model of service delivery to have to continue beyond the lifting of state and county shelter-in-place orders, uh, uh, possibly uh, going as long as six to 12 months or even until a uh, vaccine is widely disseminated. Uh, this proposal would allow us to expand service to 57 Santa Cruz clients uh, that are currently out of program due to the shelter in place orders. Uh, these uh, are clients that uh, attended our day programs, uh, but also people that have been furloughed from their jobs in the community uh, and are now isolated in their homes. Uh, we uh, uh, humbly request uh, you uh, accept the recommendation of the Economic, Economic Development Department uh, staff uh, to fund this request, um, and uh, we thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there any members of the public um, who are on this call who would like to speak on this item? Please press, press star nine, otherwise we'll, we will return to council for action and deliberation. Okay, you are on the line. Hi, this is Dina Logis calling from Santa Cruz Community Health, and I wanna thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. Um, as you know, COVID has had a huge impact on our community and in fact, at our, our East Cliff Clinic site, we've always done a few distri food distribution, but we've gone from distributing 1,500 pounds of food per month to 15,000, and it's not enough. So we have patients showing up who need food. We're doing our best. They also need other supplies, personal hygiene, diapers, maxi pads, you know, all the like critical supplies that quite frankly cost a lot of money. Um, 
I, I have one story here in front of me that is one of many. It just happens to be the one in front of me. It's about a family newly arrived from Central America. They didn't know how to navigate Santa Cruz, but they knew how to get to our clinic, and they trust us. And trust, as you know, is really big. As soon as COVID began, the mom lost her job and all resources. The food that they get from the clinic is literally keeping the mom and her two kids fed every week. So we see many, many stories like this. And again, I just want to thank you. Oh, so to back up a little bit, what we don't have and we don't have um, the ability is to have the same level of service at the Women's Health Center site downtown Santa Cruz. So we don't have the, you know, 15,000 pounds of food at East Cliff means that we've converted to a drive-through distribution, and we just can't do that downtown, and we don't want people congregating. So what we would like to do is do a food pantry where we have non-perishable foods and supplies that we can provide to those patients. Okay, I could keep going, but I'm going to stop. I want to again thank you for your time. Thank you as well, and thank you for sharing those stories. All right, next speaker. Yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. I tried to call in earlier on item 15, but you didn't allow sufficient time to uh, jump through all the hoops, um, which I think you should probably give more time for the first caller when there's only one caller. Anyway, I'm going to modify my comments to that, try to apply it to this, although it's, that's hard to do. I will say this. The government was initially misled and overreacted to the threat of COVID before the facts were better known. Mortality rates are now coming down, but still the government cannot admit it went too far, destroyed the economy, and will cost many lives in deaths of despair and isolation strategies without a cure will only delay infection, not stop it. This strategy may in fact not be saving any lives at all compared, for example, to the Swedish approach. Time will tell. Perhaps the opposite is true. Most people are well aware and in fact made to panic far in excess of the now better understood actual threat to the majority of the population, not so much at risk of death, who wish to cooperate and already widespread highly infectious COVID is not going away, no matter the isolation strategy, barring a treatment miracle. It is with this in mind that I urge a rethink of the authorities to deputize so many people that may be enforcing punitive measures for COVID social distancing violations, or for that matter, anything else to do with COVID, and suggest a firm stated policy for all such city employees that the policy should be first to educate, then warn, and only then, if violators refuse to obey, should they be issued a citation. And there's some more to this, but I'll skip that. So that's all I have to say. Bye. Okay. Next speaker, you are on the line. Hi there, my name is Kristen Gwen. I'm the development manager at the Entis Community Dental Care. I just wanted to say we're so grateful to be considered for CDBG CV funding. As you may know, COVID-19 is radically changing how healthcare is delivered. And dentistry is one of the highest risk industries due to the close proximity of our patients and aerosols that are produced during treatment. Um, there are several new important infection pro control protocols that are labor intensive and necessary for the safety of our staff and our patients. Um, this funding would make a huge difference for the health and safety of 2,800 City of Santa Cruz residents who are DNTH patients. And so I just wanted to thank you for your partnership and for your consideration. Thank you very much as well. All right. Uh, seeing no other count or, uh, members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, I'd like to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Council Member Golder, you had your hand up. Did I apologize if the question got answered while I got knocked off the meeting and um, came back? But my question was for Tiffany, and I was just wondering about that two hundred thousand that was for eviction protection or eviction assistance. I was wondering if you could speak a little to, uh, more to what that that was. Uh, yes, yeah, so in partnership with Community Action Board, we would be extending on a program that is in existence in Watsonville. It would pay up to two months of past due rent for those who um, are not able to pay um, that past due rent. Um, normally, home funds cannot pay rent that is past due. It can only pay rent moving forward, but in this situation, pandemic conditions, a lot of people are going to be soon facing with the eviction moratorium um, about to expire. They will need to pay past due rent. 
So we're hoping to um, help keep, keep people in their house and put a dent in a lot of that past due rent. Um, so that would be home funding, paying for direct rental assistance to the landlords. Mm -hmm. And can I ask a follow-up question to that? Would, yeah. would people that aren't necessarily um, um, in compliance with immigration status like still be able to uh, apply or qualify for that? Yes, they would. So the requirements would be um, the same for everybody regardless of citizenship status. They would need to have the economic need due to the pandemic. Uh, they would need to have the certification from their landlord that their rent is past due, and they would have to be willing to sign self-certification documents, uh, but they wouldn't be prohibited. So they'd be open to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, this, these decisions are always hard in general, and I think just um, even extra hard now, given how um, our safety net providers are providing so many critical services at this time, and um, and just sort of the thought of food insecurity and those that are impacted by it is, is so troubling. So I appreciate the um, interest in wanting to boost those funding amounts and also just encourage everyday citizens to give what they can, even if it's just a little to contribute to those organizations at this time. Um, I'm wondering if, Tiffany, you could re uh, share your screen, I guess, uh, with us so that we can see the two options that are presented before us in terms of being able to move this item forward. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, and then I have, um, if needed, I can switch the view to Excel if you would like to, if anyone would like to propose other options. Um, I mean, I, I can just sort of, I'm comfortable with the funding as, as presented in terms of the recommended amounts of Proposal A, but happy to have a conversation with my colleagues if there's interest in trying to tinker with the funding a bit. So with that, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion to kind of get us started to move forward with the recommendation of, um, uh, as presented in the agenda report and then as represented here on our screen for Proposal A. I'll second that. Uh, so we have a motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by the mayor for Proposal A, um, Vice Mayor Myers. You're muted, by the way. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany, for this, uh, for all your work on this. Um, this is always a hard decision to make every year, but this year, obviously, just an immense amount of need. Um, Tiffany, I'm trying to, I'm looking at attachment C, which is entitled Home Waiver Sum Summary, and the third page of that is the summary of the CDBG CV applications, and I'm just trying to rectify yeah. Yeah, the rest requested funding. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so after we had to, so we had a very tight window for applications being open, and we mm -hmm. had the staff report before we had all the applications in. So we had some updates. Uh, so the, up, the main updates is that Second Harvest Food Bank was able to turn in its application after we submitted the staff report. So that was um, an additional 70,000 requests so that we had to adjust recommended funding a bit. Um, and then Santa Cruz Community Farmers Markets increased their asks from 15,000 to 30,000 after we submitted the staff report. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just, I had, I had looked at that page before and with, I just wanted to make sure it was matching up. I, I thought that's what you said in your report, but I just wanted to double check. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so they, they d definitely don't match. Right, great, thank you. I'd just like to say before we take the vote on this item that, um, again, I'm just really grateful that we're able to offer you know, so much funding to this, these various organizations that are doing a lot of really good work supporting our community during uh, COVID-19. And so I'd like to thank uh, the staff for putting this together so quickly and um, getting us these funds and then um, helping us allocate these funds to the appropriate organizations. And for folks who might have um, gotten the agenda report, there's a breakdown of 
how many people these different programs can help. And, um, and it's just good to see that there's um, a lot of support. And hopefully, um, as we continue moving through this process, there will be more support for um, families and members of our community as we continue to um, deal with COVID-19. And while, um, you know, as mentioned before, uh, while community bridges in this uh, round of funding um, isn't receiving any of the dollars, they are receiving an additional $100,000 um, through the CBDO grant. And so um, I think that it's good that we're going to be able to, you know, expand the number of people we're, we're able to fund. Um, and so I want to thank everyone for their work on this. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Brown. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I um, I don't really have uh, much more to add on my comments. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that's been done here, and I'm uh, I'll support the motion. I do want to say though about community bridges, they are receiving funding through as a Chodo uh, through uh, our regular CDBG allocation, um, but they aren't actually getting uh, additional funds. There, this is. Uh, pretty much flat funding for a lot of these organizations, which really essentially means a cut because of cost of living increases. So just to be clear that that's what we're doing, we're not really giving them extra funding and they do have increased needs. So I, I'm hoping that uh, when we begin to talk about some of the, the homeless services category, for example, that is not yet allocated, that we, we think about that. And also just wanna remind my colleagues that as Tiffany mentioned, we are uh, running up against the uh, lifting of an eviction moratorium, and um, it doesn't sound like, uh, at least anecdotally from what we're hearing, uh, folks are going to be in a position to pay those rents, um, you know, and the back rent. So I'm really glad that we can make a contribution, at least for some uh, very, uh, very um, low-income households, and um, hopefully we can find other ways to be supportive moving forward. And I think that, you know, hearing that there's a 50% increase in calls for rental assistance really kind of highlights the fact that as time goes on, people are really um, getting, you know, further and further impacted. And if, if these funds aren't going to be available until July, we can only anticipate that these calls are going to increase. So um, if there's no further comments from council members, I'll turn it over to uh, the city clerk. There was a motion made by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Mayor Cummings, to move um, staff recommendation A uh, for the allocation of um, CDBG funds. Uh, Council Members Byers? Oh, you're muted. Aye. Um, Matthews is still absent. Yeah. Brown? Aye. Holder? Looks like Council Member Golder might have gotten kicked off. Um, do we want to wait, Mayor, or? Yeah, let's wait a second. I think she's been having some trouble with uh, her internet and staying connected, so. Oh, wait. Um, she, hold on. I need to put her as a. Watkins? Councilmember Watkins? Councilmember Watkins, did you say aye? 
I got kicked off and then I'm back. I. <laughs> Vice Mayor Myers. I. And Mayor Cummings. I. That item passes unanimously with Councilmember Matthews absent. Okay, so moving on to item number 17 on the City Council agenda. This is the City Council ad hoc revenue committee update uh, with the presenter Susie O'Hara, assistant to the city manager. Hi folks, um, I actually had not intended to present, but I can do a quick, um, let me put my account, let me put my video on. Um, sorry about that. So um, I was actually gonna punt it over to Cynthia and Sandy and Mayor Cummings um, to give a very brief update on the revenue subcommittee ad hoc work. Um, obviously, as you noted in the council member report, um, after several months of consideration of a TOT, um, first in March and then moving forward into November, obviously moving into the, this current crisis with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, taking a seat back and looking at possibilities for focused on recovery and really the support of our hoteliers moving forward. It's really incumbent upon um, the city to work on that recovery effort within the context of our budget and how best to support our tourism industry. And so the recommendation from the council members on the committee was to formally suspend the um, consideration for uh, the, this TOT increase at this time. So I will um, punt it over to Mayor Cummings or Council Member Brown for further discussion on this. I didn't realize that Cynthia was not gonna be here. Um, so let me know if you want me to add anything or answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. And I think Cheryl is probably on the phone as well, as well as uh, Bonnie, who can also provide answers to questions. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Susie, for jumping in to uh, give us that introduction. I would just add that um, just so folks are aware out in the public and other council members um, that, you know, this was a, the process that we were going through to uh, uh, tr try to determine the, um, the character of, and uh, the process for putting the TOT on the November 2020 ballot. I mean, we spent a lot of time uh, working through that and reaching out to stakeholders. And um, so it is not without some, uh, you know, some, uh, a little bit of grieving on my part that after the work that we did and the, you know, the hope that we were gonna actually be able to, to move in this direction that um, it's not likely to happen this year. Um, you know, I just, I think that um, it's, just an indication of how deep this crisis is. And, um, you know, so we wanted to make sure that uh, our, you know, our state stakeholders in the tourism industry were um, comfortable with the um, direction that we were going. And um, hopefully that will um, cause them to be more willing to uh, pick up that conversation when the, the circumstances allow. Yeah, and I'll just echo what um, Councilmember Brown said that, you know, we've been meeting uh, regularly with many of the folks in the hotel industry. We've been um, providing, giving, sending out surveys and taking in feedback on what would be, um, you know, the appropriate percentage increase where the hoteliers would like to see those funds go to our community. And uh, we were making some really good progress, but as a result of COVID-19, um, we understand the impacts that the hotel industry is taking. Uh, we're gonna see pretty big and major impacts to our TOT, and, um, and it's gonna be a difficult industry to get restarted once this is over, um, as far as travel is concerned. And so we took that into account to try to do, you know, um, to, to ensure that we were, were working in good faith with our community partners. And so we thought that at this time, um, maybe there's an opportunity for other revenue measures, but the consideration of a TOT is probably um, not the best one to consider at this time. So, um, Council Member Byers. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, committee. Uh, you actually, I think, answered my question. I, was, I know how much um, outreach you need to do 
before we get something on the ballot. And I didn't, I think you answered, you were well into that process of were you close to done uh, and bringing people on board? Um, Councilmember Member Brown, do you want to speak to that? Because you were on that committee much longer than I was. Sure. Uh, uh, well, I I think I wouldn't say we were close to done with the conversation, but we uh, felt pretty confident that moving forward we would be crafting the the final proposal in uh, collaboration with uh, the hospitality industry, and they were had expressed uh, willingness to um, move in that direction. I mean, it's not, a, you know, they're not a universal body with one mind, of course, and more work was going to be done to connect with some of the other uh, smaller motels and hotels as well. Um, so we weren't near done, but we were definitely on the right path. Good, thank you, that, that answers it. A lot of work. <laughs> Okay, if there's no other comments from council members, I'm gonna turn it over to members of the public to see if anyone would like to comment on item number 17, which is the city council ad hoc revenue committee update. So if you are on the line, well, if you're watching from your home, uh, please call one of the numbers that you see on your screen. And after calling in, uh, you'll need to Put in the, type in the member ID number, press and press town. And if you are already on the call, press star nine to raise your hand and I will provide you with up to two minutes to speak on this item. Hey, you're on the line. Yes, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I had the great fortune to be in a county council meeting in the county council meeting. I spoke, I was well received. My comments have to do with the recovery of the economy and I actually enjoy being proved wrong. My professional livelihood is trying to be proved wrong. So here are my comments. If the citizens do their homework, they will learn that indemnification for any of the tests, which are up to 80% inaccurate, or the vaccines, the companies are indemnified from this, but they are going to be required to get financial help to, to follow certain stipulations. Um, I think that's kind of quite strong-arming. Maybe it's totalitarian, maybe it's fascism. Um, my observation is many small businesses will not open again. I know that I certainly miss the 10 businesses I frequented at least some you know, at least once a week in all the beaches. I'm sure I'm not the only citizen that's worried about that. There are much greater and bigger issues going on that have to do with the world food supply, with its cultivation, transportation, and distribution. And if that is not solved in the next 30 days, there will be dire consequences, not just for the citizens of Santa Cruz, but the whole United States and the whole world. Um, so I suppose that's enough for now. I'll save my other comments if I can make them later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mayor, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, if there's any member of the public who would like to speak, on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes to speak. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action and deliberation. So if council members want to, if someone wants to raise their hand and move the item or accept the report and, uh, and a motion to sunset the revenue committee Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'll go ahead and move the recommendation that we uh, sunset the ad Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee. And um, sorry, I can only read half of the, <laughs> the what it's on my screen. Um, sunset the Ad Hoc Revenue Committee and focus on uh, council work on the fiscal year 2021 budget via the budget committee uh, that's been formed. Okay, 
Steve. As well, well, and I, I think we should add, just include the the the, um, the rest of the recommendation as it's it's printed there about uh, efforts to for recovery of the local economy and uh, assistance to individuals and businesses. So, so moved. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Watkins, I see your hands raised. I just wanted to second the motion and also just thank the committee for all the work you did and um, just a, your, my appreciation for the work and knowing that this was moving in a direction that this is unfortunate at this time, but really respect you coming to this place as well. So with that, I second the motion. Okay. So we have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Watkin, uh, Council Member or Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the committee also and for your work. Um, I know especially um, reaching out to the hospitality uh, industry and just working with them directly as well as um, sending them the letter to let them know that this was going to be put on hold. Um, I know that communication was really valued and um, really made that industry understand, uh, you know, our recognition of, of the times ahead. So thank you for taking that extra step and um, retaining that positive relationship and uh, working with the, uh, with the hospitality folks here in town. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further discussion on this item, I'll turn it over to the, the city clerk to do a roll call vote on item number 17. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Byers. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthew, Matthews is still absent. Um, Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously with Councilmember Matthews absent. She's okay. Okay, that takes us to our next item, which is item number 18, wastewater treatment facility, UV disinfection system, replacement project, bid protest, and award of contract. And the presenter today is Steve Wolfman, associate civil engineer. Uh, this is Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. I think Steve's trying to get on the call right now, so he should be there uh, momentarily. Um, I can give a little bit of background. Um, we had a, a bid uh, for the UV protection equipment at the... Goodbye. Yes, uh, Steve Wolfman, uh, Senior Civil Engineer with the uh, Public Works Department. Uh, we're doing um, an, uh, a replacement of the existing uh, UV disinfection system at the treatment plant. Uh, that system was put in about 25, 30 years ago, and um, it's very difficult to maintain. It's inefficient at this point in its um, method of generating the uh, ultraviolet light. So we are replacing that system and all of the controls and the electrical uh, work associated with it. And uh, we did that project about a month ago. We got four good bids. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the low bid uh, was deemed by the city as uh, non-responsive. And I think um, it's explained in detail in the staff report uh, legal department is here today and they could um, answer any specific questions. But um, instead, we attempt to award to the second low bidder, uh, GS 
S E, and uh, that's what's before you today is um, to award that contract to uh, the low responsible bidder, uh, GSE Enterprises. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from council members at this time on this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'll uh, open this item up to public comment. So this is item number 18 on our agenda. Um, if you'd like to comment on this item, you should see a number of numbers that you can call in on on your screen. Uh, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. And again, this item is wastewater treatment facility, UV disinfection system replacement project, C401504, bid protest and award of contract. See one person with their hand raised, and so I'm going to open up the line. Uh, you are now on the call. Yes, good afternoon. My name is William Kaufman. I am an attorney for Pacific Infrastructure, and I want to thank the City Council and the Mayor for taking the time to consider Pacific Infrastructure's bid protest. I myself am a Civic Improvement Commissioner in the City of Campbell and collaborate with the City Council on several items, so I know how seriously you take these and that your volunteers and how much work goes into this. Uh, first item is I wanted to uh, make three important points given the limited time I have here as to why the city would be acting improperly if it awards to the bid to GSE or frankly Pacific Infrastructure Corporation. The crux of the issue outlined in our bid protest that hopefully you have before you dated April 24th was in response to Mr. Wolfman's letter of April 6th indicating that Pacific Infrastructure was the lowest bidder. It was not found to be an irresponsible bidder, but yet this, the letter stated it submitted a non-responsive bid that failed to follow the bid specifications in allotting at least 3% of the contract sum for startup, commissioning and testing costs, and 3% of the contract sum for demobilization costs. I want to emphasize that language here is important. Allotment is nowhere in the bid specifications or the bid form, and Pacific Infrastructure's bid was the lowest bid. They are a responsible bidder. It was also a lump sum bid for $3,182,300. And it was rejected as non-responsive non by Mr. Wolfman due to technical noncompliance. But because it was rejected to the technical noncompliance, I think it's important that the council consider the potential protracted litigation that may ensue because of ambiguous terms in the specification itself and the absence of any requirement of allotment in the bid form. Okay, the analysis should be whether the bid was responsive in terms of technical application and regarding whether it complies with the bid documents. If you look at the actual bid form, it is silent as to any requirement in terms of 3% allocation, any item in terms of what those dollar values should be for bid items 1H, which are startup commissioning and testing, and 1J, which is demobilization. The issue really is the specification section that is ambiguous, unclear, confusing, whatever you want to call it, under section 01220 uh, entitled measurement and payment. So the reference that Mr. Wolfman 
makes to the 3 percent, and I think part of the confusion is there in those bid specs under the commissioning line item D or demobilization line item E, there's two paragraphs there. One says measurement and one says payment for both. Under the heading payment, it states it shall not be less than 3% of the contract price, but it does not say allocation. It does not say value. So if the reading of Mr. Wolfman was correct, it should have said in the specification the value of the contract should be not less than 3% of the overall contract price. The way it is stated in the specification and part of the confusion is that this requirement under payment simply impacts how much of the payment can be withheld or released when it's eventually due, not the value of the light item for work. So the city is attempting to justify the rejection of a responsive bid on a technicality due to an ambiguous specification section that yeah. I think needs to be put out for rebid because the I'm sorry, your time's up. We have to ask that, um, that we move on. But thank you for your comments, and we will take those into consideration as we move forward. Okay. Uh, seeing no other members of the public would like to comment on this item, I'm going to bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Vice Mayor Myers, I see your hands up. Sorry, that was from the last item. Okay, is there any, are there any council members who have questions or comments on this item that's before us today? Tony, I was just curious um, if you could speak to, to some of the comments that were made by the member of public around the legalities of, of moving forward with this. Certainly, I'd, I'd actually I'd like to ask um, my associate, Tori uh, Thompson, to address this. She's, she's worked with me on it and is familiar with the issues and the, and the circumstances. Yes, I'm happy to do so. Um, Mr. Kaufman raised a couple of issues. Um, first and foremost, I think, he raised a question of ambiguity with the bid specifications. If there were any, um, if there was any confusion or ambiguities within the bid specifications, uh, Pacific Infrastructure had the ability to, uh, to write to um, Mr. Wolfman to Public Works and ask for specification or to ask for clarification. Um, they did not do so. Um, I'd also uh, point out that of the four bidders for this project, the three other bidders all provided for at least 3% for the, uh, the commissioning and the demobilization costs. So this did not appear to be confusing for those, for those bidders. Um, Mr. Kaufman also raised the issue um, that if this is a variation, it is an immaterial variation. Uh, under the law, um, in, it, if there's a price impact or an unfair advantage, the variation in the bid is considered to be material. Uh, here, the impact from, um, from Pacific Infrastructure, not including that 3%, does have a price impact. Uh, they only included 0.3% for commissioning costs, 0.2% for demobilization costs well below the 3% that was required. Um, this had at least a $172,000 impact on, the, uh, on their bid sum. As far as unfair advantage, uh, Pacific Infrastructure was alerted that this was an issue before the, uh, the bid was, uh, the notice of intent to award the bid went out. Uh, Pacific Infrastructure could have revised, um, could have revised its mistake or withdrawn its bid and chose not to do so. Um, that opportunity to either withdraw or to amend is an opportunity that wasn't available to the other bidders. And so this also would provide an unfair advantage to, uh, to Pacific Infrastructure. And if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer, um, answer those questions. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, are there any further questions from council members on item number 18 at this moment in time? Okay, seeing none, I'd like to ask if there's a council member who would like to move this item. I'm happy to move that. Uh, uh, uh recommendation in the agenda report on this item. Okay. It's a motion made by Councilmember Watkins. Council Vice Mayor Myers, I see your hands raised. I'll go ahead and second that. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to move the staff's recommendations. I'll turn it over to uh, City Clerk to follow roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews is still currently absent. Um, Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously with Councilmember Matthews' absence. Okay. Up next on our agenda is item number 19, which are presentations uh, and which are budget presentations. And this will be, uh, we'll start with an overview from the city manager. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. If you were, and so with that, I'll turn it over to the city manager to kick off uh, presentations. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I'll be providing a brief introduction and presentation to kick off the, uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget hearings. Um, I first wanna start by saying that uh, these budget hearings are being held under unprecedented circumstances, which is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this crisis is affecting all of our work and personal lives. And the level of change and uncertainty has been truly extraordinary. And as a city organization, our focus has been on responding to, to this crisis. The demands on city staff to serve as the emergency management team while implementing um, a whole host of uh, an array of services in ensuring the safety of the public and our employees has been uh, pretty extraordinary and exhausting. And it has challenged our bandwidth and stretched us, uh, to many of us to be on capacity. Uh, but I'd like to express my heartfelt appreciation to all of our city staff who are doing really incredible work and uh, how proud I am of each and every one of them. As I said, the pandemic presents major disruptions and uncertainty and has necessitated uh, dramatic changes to our daily lives uh, of our residents and businesses. And while these changes have far reaching negative impacts on the economy, the ultimate extent and severity of the impacts will remain unclear for some time. And much will depend on the trajectory of the public health crisis. And there are a number of questions uh, that will need to be answered. Uh, how long will social distancing measures be necessary? How long until an effective treatment or vaccine is widely available? And how long until people feel comfortable resuming prior levels of spending and economic activity? And these questions are impossible to answer with certainty at this time, but are crucial and important to the path uh, of our economy going forward. Uh, what we do know is that the economy is, uh, is in, a, in a recession and, and and we can be fairly confident of that. Um, since the beginning of March, uh, three to four million Californians have appeared to have lost their jobs. Households have curtailed spending significantly nationally uh, and locally. Spending at restaurants was down pretty significantly, 25% nationally in March. Uh, new car purchases were down almost half in April. Home sales have been impacted significantly um, in major markets. Uh, and so these declines in economic activity surpass the worst of the Great Recession in many cases. So how long will the recession last? Well, economic activity has declined sharply, but the severity of the recession and its impact on California will depend uh, really on the, how, on the depth of the downturn, but also how long it will last. Uh, by way of example, anticipating the length of the downturn is extremely, uh, it's extremely uh, difficult. And uh, because of this, uh, in light of, of this uncertainty, it is really important to plan for a range of scenarios. Uh, and, and you formed the budget committee to help with that. 
Uh, and by way of example, the state uh, uh, legislative office recently published a uh, couple of scenarios for the state of California. Uh, one which predicted a U-shaped recession and another which uh, uh, looked at an L-shaped recession. The U-shaped recession predicted an $18 billion state deficit next, next fiscal year, while the U-shaped uh, 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 forecast predicts a $31 billion state deficit. You can see the wide range there just the, in one fiscal year for the state of California. So this is the larger fiscal environment that we are operating under. So now what I'll do is I'll share my screen and just go through some, some slides to kind of set the context for uh, getting more specific information with respect to our budget and then the outline of our meeting today. Martin, could I ask a question? You mentioned an L-shaped, and that's the $31 billion that the state project projected, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and the U-shaped is uh, $18 billion. $18 billion. thank you. Uh, let me figure this out. Can you see uh, my uh, screen? Yeah. No, we can't. Okay. Might be having a hard. Uh, I'd have to have uh, Laura help me with getting the uh, presentation up. Here we go. Yeah, okay, thank you, Laura. Sorry about that. I'm using my iPad today instead of my regular computer. This is the first time. So um, to start off with, I've got some slides to go through here. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. So the outline today of the uh, presentation, just to give you an overview, I've done a uh, kind of overview and introduction. Um, and I'll go over kind of our foundation, um, our, our working status quo budget that we'll be uh, putting before you, that's been uh, issued before you, um, talking about the adjustments and triggers that we'll have to go through in light of the situation we're in, the timeline, and then the departmental presentations and how those will work uh, during the uh, budget hearings, some of it will, which will be held today and, and the rest uh, tomorrow. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so, one of the things that we're fortunate uh, to have done is to, to really have been in a, in a, in a pretty strong financial uh, position uh, starting off uh, with this crisis. We had done a lot of work to put us in, in this place. Uh, we had uh, dealt with uh, uh, making some difficult decisions to put us, uh, put us in a place where we had adopted uh, uh, balanced budgets uh, and had uh, been a place to really project uh, 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 surpluses in, in years to come and, and again, had done a, a significant amount of work to put us in a position uh, to uh, really make progress, particularly in the area of capital. Uh, that, again, has all changed, but, but we are fortunate that at least we started in a fairly good, good position. The, the change is, is, is pretty dramatic. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Laura. Uh, we were at one time projecting uh, next fiscal year uh, that we would, uh, 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 this fiscal year, I'm sorry, that we would end with a surplus, small surplus. We went from that to uh, a projected deficit of now 10.4%, which is pretty significant for that to occur in just a matter of a few months. And then moving forward into the next following fiscal year, so deficits have really uh, increased pretty significantly. I will note that uh, the $6 million deficit that we are projecting for next year has a number of assumptions uh, that impact uh, uh, the significance of that, the, the level of, of, of deficit, and moreover how that relates to the, the uh, proposed budget before you. Uh, we had, with, with respect to the $6 million deficit, we estimate that the revenue reductions next fiscal year will be around $8.5 million uh, overall in the general fund. Um, and in addition, we are assuming that we would save about a little over $5 million as well. So if we don't achieve the $5 million savings, then we will be facing a $11 million budget deficit. So the, the forecast for next year is mm -hmm. level of savings as well as uh, a level of much reduced uh, uh, revenue, which also could, could, get, could worsen. Uh, so you can see here how those uh, deficits uh, 
uh, increase and will move uh, uh, forward, uh, again, depending on the level of recovery that happens, which, as I noted, isn't necessarily predictable at this time. Uh, next next uh, slide. So this just gives you, the next slide just gives you a sense of our, uh, the impact to our uh, fund balances. And this is actually to our uh, undesignated uh, fund balances. We have fund balances that are designated for uh, pension obligations uh, for a variety of, of, of uses. Uh, this is only our uh, undesignated, which at this point was at $2.7 million. Obviously, we will draw, down that, down, draw that down by $10.4 million which reduces it to 7.7, and then if we continue to grow down, uh, it becomes more significant. And it's not sustainable, obviously, so we can't uh, continue uh, to operate uh, under deficits. So and this is really the intent of what the slide is really supposed to show. Moving on to the next slide. So we'll need to, so this gives you a sense of the, um, the, the revenue uh, and, and how it, uh, uh, we were projecting it prior to uh, COVID-19 uh, and, and what has happened in this fiscal year and uh, what, uh, again, may happen. Uh, and this is more of a V, U shape, but again, it could be L shape, uh, and, and, and so therefore it could be uh, much more significant. Um, we'll, we'll have to uh, look, look ahead, uh, and, and I'll talk next about how we're going to try to do that. So uh, Mark, next please. slide, please. I just had a question. What do the numbers on the left side of this graph represent? The 50, 55, 60, 65, are those percentages or? Uh, no, that's the, I think that's millions of dollars. Is that millions? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, moving on to the next slide. So um, obviously to, to move forward, we will need to um, uh, institute a process and, and, and collect information and data to, to help us move forward. Uh, and uh, uh, we will need to look at uh, really at uh, everything uh, because the, 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 the level of uh, impact is pretty significant as I noted. Uh, and so we'll have to uh, look at uh, what we can do to address the, the major deficits. Next slide, please. And and so therefore, what we put before you is the is a working budget uh, that will have adjustments to be made. So essentially, in a normal year, we would have uh, plugged in all the data into our budget model. We would have held a whole series of, of meetings with departments, and then brought before you a budget that had been refined and adjusted. But given the level of response that we had to do for the COVID-19. Uh, we really were not able to, to do that whole process. So what's before you is what would have come, come before you um, before uh, we would have gone through our own internal process. And you'll note that it uh, projects a, a deficit of about $3 million. But again, once we factor in the loss of $8.5 million in revenues and then the fact that we're assuming that we're going to continue to try to achieve budget savings, that adjusts to the $6 million deficit, which again can and will likely change, and therefore we will need to make adjustments. And so to do that, um, uh, next slide please, uh, we'll have to look at a variety of things as I noted, uh, and, and have triggers uh, and collect data. Uh, obviously the shelter in place duration, as I noted earlier, we'll have to look at the revenue sources that may or may not be available to us, whether stimulus or FEMA funding, grants, uh, those sorts of, uh, uh, of possibilities. We'll look at expenditures, uh, again, to the extent that we can preserve and conserve funding, we should do that and we'll continue to look at the options there. Uh, there's a variety of economic models, as I noted, that are available that we can look at and we'll be uh, 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 accessing those and, and, and looking at those and seeing what makes sense for us and what we should uh, consider, um, and as well as other city and other financial data that will be coming in uh, over the months uh, from our uh, tax receipts. And so with respect to then the process, uh, again, it's really a process of adjusting. Uh, first of all, we have developed a staff uh, committee, a budget SWAT team we're calling, uh, that will help prepare uh, for this and, and, and provide assistance to the city council and the, the uh, council uh, budget committee. Um, the committee is comprised of budget leads, department heads, and the budget staff. And uh, the council 
will we'll consider uh, uh, the, uh, this process as part of the strategic uh, uh, recommendations. And then uh, the budget committee will, and then those strategic recommendations will then translate into uh, uh, operational cuts. So we'll look at the strategically, what is the, what is it that we want to achieve? How do we want to maximize and preserve existing services, uh, minimize impacts to services and to employees? Uh, and then what is the strategic approach and then how that will then, uh, again, formulate into operational cuts and, and what budget packages will be available. And again, we'll have to look at a variety of options depending on, on the various scenarios uh, that, uh, well, we'll have to look at at least a couple of scenarios uh, uh, looking at uh, what the various uh, levels of uh, revenue reductions that we might uh, uh, see. So the, the idea is to have these budget packages back to the city council um, at the, during the next fiscal year, and we've identified several uh, timing dates for this, and that those would be September, December, um, and then at mid-year, uh, which is typically in February. So that is the uh, really the, the process that we're proposing. Uh, and again, this would be work with the uh, budget committee, uh, the city council budget committee, to bring forward uh, those additional recommendations and adjustments as necessary. Um, so with that, I'll now I'll turn over to uh, the purposes of uh, the, the hearings today and, and tomorrow. And uh, uh, what we'll be doing is having a department. Again, it's a, a very different process than we've had in years past. We've got a working budget before you. We don't really uh, know exactly what it's going to uh, turn out to be at this point. And so um, it, it's very uh, different than in other years uh, because those that data and that information will come uh, to you uh, subsequently. So. For the purposes of, uh, of trying to provide you with the updates on, on the, the budget and, and on departments, we've de developed some um, outlines for the departments to present to you today. Uh, obviously, feel free to ask any questions that you might be and may have. And so we've asked the departments to, to do the following, to provide you with a department overview, to, to give you a sense of the top uh, achievements in the last fiscal year, to, to go over uh, core services, uh, and to discuss the, the working status quo budget uh, and uh, also to identify unavoidable and non-status quo aspects of our budget that uh, uh, they, sh they should be considered. We also recognize we have uh, new council members and so we want to make sure and kind of update the, them and inform them on uh, the department's uh, issues and perspectives. Um, so with that, um, the uh, order of the uh, presentations today will start with the administrative services departments and then we'll move on to the operational departments, land use departments, and then the uh, city manager's office and city council, and then public safety and, and library. That'll be the order. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on this overview. Um, uh, I know the other staff is here. Cheryl, if you have any, any questions, uh, uh, she's available also to answer questions. So thank you very much. Thank you for that opening presentation. Are there any... Um, Comments from council members or questions from council members at the time? No questions? Oh, okay. Council member Matthews. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. You're Cynthia. You're muted, Cynthia. We can't hear you. Yeah. Um, can we get the PowerPoints for these just so we don't have to be taking a lot of notes? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, email them to you. Yes, That's great. absolutely. Hey, if there are any members of the public who are, I'm sorry, are there any other council members who have questions for the city manager at this time? Okay, seeing none, if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on this item, uh, now is the time to call in. There should be um, a list of phone numbers on your screen. And so if you're interested, and calling in on this item, please dial in and follow the instructions. And uh, once you're on the line, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. Okay, 
seeing no members of public um, joining us for this item, I'll bring it back uh, to council. And I believe we can just move on to the next item, the next presentation. Which yes, is yes, fine. yes. The next, the next one is uh, is, is finance. So we'll turn it over to uh, Cheryl. Uh, 
uh, our primary core services of uh, the operations are the foundation of the department. And if they aren't working, functioning properly, it affects all the divisions with, in the department and the city. So uh, the operations are our foundation. And I'm thankful for everyone that, um, that works in those divisions. Next slide, please. Next, we have our, um, our audits, budget, and uh, financial reporting. Um, this is included within our compliance reporting and analysis function unit, and the audits division is currently responsible for auditing hotels and short-term rentals, uh, but will soon be expanding into cannabis tax auditing. Our newly established budget division, which has a, a, a uh, staff of three is responsible for working with departments to produce the city's annual budget. And of course they produce the fiscal year 2021 budget. The county division is responsible for producing the CIP, facilitating the city's external financial audit and producing the year end financial statement. The division also supports the, the city department's accounting needs. Next slide please. Highly important is the department's risk safety and collections division. This division is responsible for handing, handling all the city's liability claims and administering the city's safety program. The collection unit, which was established in fiscal year 2006, is responsible for chasing down all the city's delinquencies and it's quite successful. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is our status quo budget. Um, we're submitting a status quo budget and we have no additional request. Uh, it's supported by the general fund and the liability internal service fund. Next slide. And with that, I'm open to any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you for that presentation, for that presentation. Are there any council members who have questions at this point in time? I guess I have one question, which would be, um, so the, I guess where are we anticipating seeing um, potential uh, reduction, cost savings uh, as it relates to the finance department? Or, those, or have any been taken into consideration yet? Or, uh, we haven't yet, we're, we're working on that. Uh, we'll be working on that with the uh, budget SWAT team. Are there any other questions from council members? Oh. Martin, do you have something? Yes, yeah. uh, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, thank you. So with respect to the, um, you know, one of the things that um, we do as part of every budget process, and again, we didn't have a chance to uh, do it in, in, in great detail uh, this year in the budget process is to um, uh, do an analysis uh, of, uh, the, the savings that we can achieve in, in each budget. We always have a certain level of savings in our budgets. Uh, however, this year we want to try to achieve even even more so uh, as part of the directive to even try to reduce the deficit this fiscal year. So uh, in general, uh, what that is uh, included in those savings are vacancies. Uh, we always have vacancies uh, throughout the city organization as well as uh, to the extent possible uh, deferring contracts uh, uh, as well, and uh, putting off uh, projects or purchases, uh, equipment and, or supplies and services. So that's that's in, in, in general terms are some of the uh, initiatives that departments are, are undertaking to uh, try to achieve budget savings. Seeing no further questions from council members, uh, I'll turn it over to members of the public to uh, comment on this item. So if you're interested in commenting on the finance budget presentation, uh, there should be a list of phone numbers on your screen that you can use to call in. Please follow the instructions. And once you have uh, gotten on the call, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will be set to two minutes. So I'll give a couple minutes in case anyone wants to call in on this item.
Okay, seeing no members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council uh, to see if anybody has any further questions or comments. Seeing no further, oh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'll just say uh, thank you, Cheryl, for the presentation. And thank you in advance for all of the work that your department will be doing uh, as we move forward in these uh, uncertain times. I, ha I, I guess I have one question, and I, it, it's probably a longer term question, but obviously, and the same could be said for kind of multiple, de all the departments and uh, you know, functions of our local government, but given the need for these reductions and the fact that your department, your departmental staff are clearly gonna have additional pressures, which will likely mean additional workload. Um, I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that uh, moving forward. I know we're uh, kind of at the beginning of this process. But so I just like to know how you're thinking about that, um, how you'll proceed. Yeah, we've been experiencing the pressure uh, during this uh, crisis, uh, but uh, there's a real strong uh, team, team on board. So um, I think that, and, and that with uh, the new budget committee, uh, we'll be able to, be able to uh, provide the service that we need to. Have a great staff. Yeah, can I just add to that? Uh, in general, I think that uh, you know there's just no way also of uh, having some level of impact uh, to services when you reduce uh, resources and uh, when you reduce, reduce the the amount of uh, staff time that's allocated to services. So there will be some impacts that will be felt, and obviously we'll be. Um, quantifying those and, and describing those for the public as we move forward. Uh, but if that's unavoidable, that there will be some impacts. We'll obviously work to, to, to make those as, as limited as possible. Are there any further questions or comments? Hearing none, Cheryl, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, uh, next presentation is from Human Resources. And so I'll invite Lisa Murphy, Director of Human Resources, to provide us with a presentation on her department. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I'm, if you can hear me, could I have a thumbs up so I can see? Thank you, okay. Well, I'm here to present the Human Resources uh, FY21 budget. Just a brief overview, our mission that our employees have developed is as a resource and trusted advisor, we strive to cultivate an inspiring and fulfilling work environment that attracts and engages a talented workforce. And obviously as we move through this time, this is going to be a very big challenge for us. And never before uh, has my staff been tapped from so many different areas to, to be that trusted advisor, to be the resource that our employees need from benefit administration, um, to employee assistance, uh, you name it. We, we have been, I think, my team at the front and center of this uh, pandemic of trying to support our employees. I'm gonna just give a little brief overview of our department and you are well aware of the, the challenges and the, the functions that we perform, but we do, of course, total compensation where we administer salaries healthcare, pension, and other benefits. Uh, we have employee and labor relations where we provide guidance to managers and employees to enhance performance and create a positive work environment. We problem solvers, solving complaints, grievances, and of course facilitating uh, labor contract negotiations. A particular area of, of um, very proud of is our organizational and employee development. And of course, as we go through these tough times and we try to uh, reduce our budget, Oftentimes this is one of the first places uh, we look to and I'm hoping to find other ways to not do the, my reductions in this area uh, because employee development, particularly in this, this trying time and supporting our employees' skills is going to be very vital uh, to get us through this time. 
In terms of talent management, we recruit and select and we onboard our employees who, all of them, you can see have a passion for public service and excellent skills uh, and to take on the ability for increasing complex roles in their city career. Our training programs are incredible, which I will um, cover briefly. Our, our succession planning, our, um, our efforts to uh, enrich our employees' time while they're here and in their future is we put a lot of, uh, a lot of time and money and effort into that. Finally, workers' compensation, we manage all the citywide programs and we support the workplace safety and actively help to work reduce injuries and other potential liabilities to reduce employee claims. Just a brief overview of our department. We're 11 and a half employees. Myself, I have three principal analysts that work in, in the leadership of the areas of recruitment, classification, employee labor relations and workers' comp and administering all of our benefits for over 800 employees and nearly 400 temps at any one time. So you can imagine our workload is enormous. Um, also, I'm supported by five additional uh, analysts in the various areas, two techs and uh, one and a half admin staff. And then just a few of the achievements I just wanted to cover, and of course, I, I actually had a huge long list and they told me keep it, keep it simple. Uh, but I think mostly last year we spent our entire year uh, negotiating employee contracts, uh, and that was a year, long, a year and a half long process that took up a lot of my staff's um, resources. Uh, we did get seven contracts. Uh, another very big area of, of pride is our employee engagement survey and our work uh, plan that we've created to surround that to uh, continue to enhance and enrich our organizational culture. Uh, organizational culture is really the personality of your organization and what is it like. And um, I think the employees here have put a lot of effort in working on our subcommittees to, to create that. And as we go forward in this time, it's going to get very difficult. And now more than ever, we're, uh, as a team, my team is going to have to pull together to, uh, to support uh, employees through these difficult times. In our succession development and planning, again, another push that we put on for that program. I just want to give you a statistic. Last year, we promoted 38 temporary employees into permanent positions, and we internally promoted over 60 of our regular employees. So we have made huge uh, leaps and bounds improvement in our internal process and our development of our, our employees to get them ready for those next steps. And, and that's a very a great source of pride for us. And our, we have our training, our leadership development. I like to remind people that we're a leader in that area. We offer over 65 training classes and we keep adding more uh, to, and we, we change them out, whatever, what, what's needed and where's the, where's the desire to place those um, training dollars is, is very important to us. And, and that's a, um, a program that I will strive to, to um, hold on to with, with multiple hands. <laughs> um, another really great thing that we've just, uh, in the process, almost completed that I want to shout out to our recruitment team is that we have started to uh, almost complete the process of moving all of our recruitment processes from internal beginnings of putting a requisition in all the way to the very completion to put it all online. And what better timing than now to, to have that have um, been a, this huge undertaking and to be almost completed with that. And finally, I can't tell you since you know uh, March 19th or 17th, the COVID-19 has just um, taken up every inch of our, our brain power and our space of trying to administer all of the new leave laws and navigate the extremely difficult waters that we we're experiencing uh, daily from our um, you know federal government, the state government, uh, the county, and the requirements and then trying to achieve uh, safety for our employees as they start to return to work. So it is a um, all-consuming, as I can, I can tell you. Just in terms of an overview of our budget, we are a very small budget here at, in HR. Um, this is a total, our total budget composed by five divisions. And as you can see, um, Although this looks like leaps and bounds, it's really only a, the difference between last year and this year is approximately $109,000. And that is uh, all within our personnel 
administration. It lies with our um, PERS payments that we also incorporate our fees for PERS and health benefits and the uh, growth of uh, some of our salaries. So it's, it is a status quo. There's nothing new. It's purely in our um, required fees from PERS, which centers out of a lot of out of HR. This is just a quick look for you to see uh, for our budget. Again, we're five divisions. Administration is the first column. Uh, unemployment, we administer unemployment fees. I, I, uh, I can envision that's gonna go very high. I don't know what it's going to be. So um, until we start seeing some of those claims come in, we're going to see a spike in that. We also have, we administer workers' comp, and that's the largest of the bars there. And we also administer the medical insurance programs. Uh, and we also ha house the volunteer program within this department. Again, it's a very stat static budget. Uh, there's, there's not much change, although, like I said, foreseen into the future uh, in my Magic 8 Ball, that unemployment amount is going to increase. This graph just, I want you to see how we're funded. HR is less than a million dollars is from the general fund. The majority of our funding comes from the workers' comp fund, uh, group health insurance, and unemployment insurance. Uh, those are separate funds. So when we talk about how are we going to uh, do implement cost reduction, it's going to be from that general fund piece of that 632,000, uh, and you can see for a, for us, that's, uh, that's actually a big hit when you think of five or 10% to, for us. It, it will be significant, but we are planning for it and we're, we're looking for the least impactful um, ways that that might impact us going forward. Oh, that didn't show up. Oh, there we go. I just wanna go over through our HR priorities. I have not changed them from last year because I think they're, they're, they're monumental, they're significant, and they're worthy of continuing on and and not just packing them away as if we've accomplished these. These are ongoing and there's always new and exciting ways that we can continue to enhance employee development professionally and their personal development as well. Again, I wanna continue our focus on our succession planning with our continuing the stretch assignments, our over hiring, our coaching, our mentoring, how we're able to work people out of class so they can learn new skills and be prepared to move up within the organization. And finally, we're gonna to continue to improve our organizational culture through our employee engagement program and several other programs. Because like I said, it's, I don't think there's any more important time now than to start really focusing on internally on what our employees' needs are going to be in this next year. They're gonna face difficulties here and they're gonna face difficulties at home. And we as a, a department wanna be here uh, and to be able to support them um, in, in this really difficult time. And that really concludes my presentation. Uh, just a final note that human resources, we serve the people who serve the community. Uh, it, it really is all about uh, the employees that, that work for the city of Santa Cruz and how we can be of service to them. And with that, that's my conclusion and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, Lisa, thank you for that presentation. Are there any uh, council members who have questions for Lisa Murphy, our Human Resources Director at this time? Uh, council Member Watkins. Thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. In terms of um, kind of the last point that you made of supporting the employees of the city moving forward, are you anticipating that being linking them to the resources in the community and providing resources for them here or mental health services? What, what kind of spectrum are you thinking or is it all of the above? I, actually, that state, it is all of the above. We have our EAP program that we ha I have been in contact with and, and need to push out that, that service, what the availability is, so people are reminded that it's free, it's confidential uh, to take advantage of it. There's legal planning, personal planning, things for your children. Uh, this is a t difficult time for children uh, and our, our employees who have, obviously, uh, folks that they're taking care of and their children, it's weighing and taxing on them as well. 
Um, so those services are available. And in addition, unemployment insurance is also available. And we have all that up on our, our intranet and our internet. Uh, and I think one of the things, I don't know how we'll be able to make it available, but we're trying to figure out how um, to help bring along mental health services here, but in what shape, or form, or manner is, is a, a challenge we need to figure out. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Myers. I, you know what, I, Lisa, you, uh, I just wanted to say thank you um, for the report and the background on the department. Um, and uh, just also just express um, some thank my thanks on um, a really hard time. Uh, I know your, your department especially is the go-between with so many people's lives and their families' lives. So thank you for the, for the overview. And you answered several of my questions when you answered Councilmember Watkins. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, if there are no further questions, uh, at this time, I will turn it over to the members of the public who would like to ask questions about the Human Resources Budget Presentation. So on your screen, you should see a list of phone numbers. Please follow the instructions for dialing in. And once you have joined on the call, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the time will be set for two minutes. So we'll give folks a minute to join should they choose to do so. Again, if you are joining us and you would like to speak on the Human Resources budget presentation, uh, once you have joined, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And with your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you're unmuted and you'll have two minutes. IT Director. I am here, of course, to give you a brief uh, overview of IT's status quo working budget for the upcoming uh, fiscal year. Uh, similar to the other departments, the agenda is uh, going to be a department overview, uh, three of our top four achievements, a uh, summary of our core services, and then a quick overview of our working status quo budget. <clears throat> uh, these great people here make up the city's IT department when we are fully staffed. Uh, the IT department is about 21 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, three of those folks are funded by enterprise funds. Uh, 
And as you can see, we are organized into four functional groups. We have our strategic and admin services group, uh, client services and sysadmin, uh, infrastructure services, and then the process and application solutions team. Uh, strategic and admin services is really responsible for the overarching departmental functions like the development and execution of a strategic roadmap, uh, special projects, and of course, uh, we have our budget planning and execution. Uh, the client services division is, uh, they're the folks that are really our frontline customer service division and they are responsible for staffing the city's help desk and supporting our endpoint infrastructure, whether it be PCs or laptops or mobile devices. Uh, they also support the productivity software that runs on top of that applications you're familiar with like uh, Microsoft Office, and Word, and Excel. Uh, our infrastructure services division, uh, a number of criti critical roles including maintaining uh, secure high-speed connectivity to uh, more than 25 city offices and asset locations uh, spread throughout the city. Uh, additionally, they manage four data centers, uh, and in those data centers we house hundreds of uh, virtual and physical servers, uh, voice over IP, telephonic equipment, and other infrastructure that really delivers network services throughout our enterprise. Uh, last, we have our process and application solutions teams, and these are really the folks that uh, provide support for our over 95 citywide and uh, departmental applications, and uh, as the name kind of states, there is much focus on process uh, improvement and helping to enable services for our employees and uh, the community that are using these applications. <clears throat> So fun fact about IT, as I was looking at our org chart, it dawned on me that I had been working with a few of these folks for almost half of my life. Uh, so I got curious as to what the collective experience was of the IT team. Uh, turns out of the 18 currently filled positions, we have about 195 years uh, experience working for the city. Uh, and on average, uh, the uh, average IT employee has 11 years experience working here and with one third of those folks having been here for 15 years or more. So a lot of collective experience for the team. Uh, with regards to some of our notable accomplishments over the last fiscal year, I'd begin by highlighting uh, really the continued excellence of our, our client services and SIS admin group. Uh, this team not only epitomizes our excellent customer service, but they come with a, a wealth of experience and really collectively this team kind of sets the tempo for our, our, our can-do attitude that really embodies the spirit of our, our team here. Uh, this current fiscal year to date, we've cl uh, completed close to 6,000 tickets. Uh, we've directly assisted close to 600 of our roughly 800 employees, and on average, we're completing these work orders somewhere between two and a half to three days, and the number of tickets that have to be reopened because an issue has reoccurred is uh, less than 2%. Uh, also, with 600-plus uh, personal computers and laptops at the city, each year we conduct an annual PC replacement uh, so that that PC fleet can stay current. So on top of all the other support work this team is responsible for, they are also replaced uh, about 160 PCs in the fiscal year 1819 and are on target to uh, meet that goal this year too. So uh, lots of uh, hard work uh, in this division that really deserves some recognition. Uh, next up, I wanted to talk about an enterprise application that IT is currently in the process of upgrading, uh, Sire is an application that you may or, or may not be familiar with by name, but behind the scenes it plays a, a really a predominant role in how you all are, are interacting with the community. Uh, for the last decade, SIRE has not only been our document management system citywide, uh, in which we've archived close to two and a quarter million documents, but it's also responsible for the behind the scenes workflow that ultimately generates uh, council and commission meeting agendas and also captures the, uh, the video feeds for these public meetings. So in conjunction with SIRE approaching an, an end-of-life status, which means it would no longer be supported, uh, it was also purchased by a company named Highland, uh, whose on-base product has uh, really been a best-in-breed content management and agenda workflow application for some time. So uh, we went through the process of vetting a number of other industry standard equipment solutions, but ultimately chose and uh, council approved uh, implementing on-base. Uh, which uh, came at a substantial discount given our, our longstanding uh, business with Sire. So even with COVID, we've been doing our best to keep the traction and the momentum of this project moving forward. Uh, the backend infrastructure has been put in place and we're now working on converting those millions of files, uh, getting staff familiar with the platform and making sure that our process is in place to, to meet those uh, uh, meeting agendas and, and videos being published and posted. Um, 
particularly like to, to recognize Michelle Foley in our department. She's been the project manager, and uh, Bonnie Bush and Julia Wood, uh, who are with the city clerks. Uh, they've not only been juggling their regular clerk duties, but also helping to lead this conversion. Um, so big thanks to them. We're hoping to be live on the platform uh, sometime around uh, the return uh, to council session uh, after the July recess. <clears throat> As a final accomplishment, I wanted to recap uh, some of the details that I shared with you during previous departmental updates, um, but really, in my opinion, I think it's worth repeating. You know, on March 16th and 17th, when the city quickly responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, sent much of our office staff home, uh, IT immediately received an influx of requests to provide remote access for these essential workers. Uh, our existing infrastructure at the time was engineered to only satisfy about 25, maybe 50 workers at most at any given moment. Um, but within two weeks, uh, we were able to develop and sustain an infrastructure that could withstand 50% of our office-based workforce, uh, which equates to uh, about 200 plus users connecting to city resources all day. Um, we did this uh, as well as deployed over 60 laptops. Uh, we onboarded and trained employees in person, over the phone, in Zoom sessions, um, and all the while the team was able to maintain that same time to closure for, for work orders received. So. Uh, a really proud moment for our department and our folks. Uh, this slide on core services is really just an opportunity to kind of memorialize what uh, much of what I've already kind of shared with you. You know, IT is a service department that's focused on supporting and enabling our colleagues in the community. Uh, our our can-do customer service attitude begins with our, our client services division, uh, supporting all those endpoints throughout the city. Uh, infrastructure team manages the sustainability and, and life cycle of literally thousands of devices and data centers and offices throughout the city. Uh, the process and apps team uh, are working to enable departments and the community uh, to be effective and, and more efficient with the applications we provide. And then admin services is uh, uh, focused on strategy, our special projects, and, and also making sure that our department's efforts are, are really congruent with the, the goals and uh, objectives of the city and the community. Uh, so that brings us to our budget overview slide. As with the other departments, the focus was on adopting a status quo budget, uh, which is what you see before you. Uh, our personal services are at about 3.2 million. Uh, our services and supplies and other charges at 2 million. You know, an, an inherent challenge for IT when it comes to a status quo budget is that within the services GL, we have these unavoidable annual obligations to pay for our IT hardware and software support contracts. And not only do these contracts individually often increase by somewhere between 2 and 3 percent, uh, as we complete projects throughout the year, uh, we have to add those services to the, the support costs kind of profile. Um, Another thing worth mentioning is as part of a franchise agreement that the city and county have participated in with Comcast since 1989, uh, the city was receiving fiber uh, connectivity to our courtyard, our police department, our Loudon Nelson Center and Fire Station 2 for a dollar a year, um, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, Comcast, uh, for some reason, has chosen not to renew that contract, uh, and as a result, the city will have to move to a costed solution, so this is going to greatly increase the, the delta on our, our telecommunications and service costs. Um, despite that, we were able to do some juggling with uh, equipment and software purchases, and overall, the, the numbers that you are seeing are similar to last year's. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we are focused on uh, adopting a status quo budget, uh, knowing that subsequently uh, we'll be getting direction in the upcoming months on some strategic approaches to make some modifications moving forward. That's what I had. Open to questions. Thank you, Ken, for that presentation. And I just want to um, say thanks to all the folks in the IT department for helping us kind of transition onto online-based platforms so quickly as it relates to, public, to COVID-19. I know other communities struggled uh, transitioning to online um, meetings and, and services, and we've done a really great job of, of transitioning. So thank you all for all your help with that and keeping everything moving forward. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from council members um, at this time? I see Council Member Matthews, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. Yeah, the um, conversion to online has been spectacular and you guys are always fantastic. It seems like every year, um, and this this moves over into capital expenditure somewhat too, so maybe um, Martine or someone you can 
explain how we're going to deal with that side of the equation. We seem to be doing some operations now, but it seems like, particularly in IT, some of the public works there, are investments we'd like to make that will save money or be so much more efficient, and we really are only able to tackle some of those. It's, it's a frustration. And so uh, a lot of it has been like the, I, I'm just saying the online plan review that you the work with planning department and um, um, other efficiencies in IT. So I'm just wondering what's the status of those right now. Do you feel like you're making some good progress? Is some things hanging out there that you hope to continue with? Some things you're going to jettison? Maybe this is the time to go into detail, but um, it's, it's a good question. I can give you a little bit of feedback on some of the, the online aggregation that we're working on. We have a number of payment portals used throughout the city, uh, and we've made a concerted effort over the last year to work with a company named Interfile to develop uh, an aggregate payment portal that will also include uh, some efficiencies on, on business flow on the back end of our initial phase one, which include utility billing, uh, business licenses, our rental inspection, our uh, payments. So we definitely now understand the need to shape our services so that we can better serve the community. I think that is something you'll see uh, in fruition soon. Uh, we're also working with the planning department to continue to look at how we can take some of their uh, permit uh, and project uh, uh, requests online. Uh, so there's, there's still an effort from both those departments to make that happen as well. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay, seeing none. Um, if members of the public are interested in commenting on the information technology budget presentation, uh, the number that you can call in on should be on your screen. After you follow the instructions to call in, you'll want to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The time will be set to two minutes. So I'll give members of the public an op a few minutes to log on should they want to comment on this item. Seeing no members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council. Uh, if there's no further comments or questions on this item, then we will adjourn our item to 6 p.m. Uh, where we will have roll call, oral communications, and then we will have our evening item at 6.30, which will be the public hearing on 111 Eric Circle. <clears throat> so seeing that there are no further comments, it looks like we will adjourn until uh, oral communications at 6 p.m. I'd like to thank all the department heads for the presentations that we received today, and I look forward to seeing everyone this evening for oral communications. Take care. session of the May 12, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Byers? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Holder? Renee. Council member Golder? 
She's here. Okay. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Hey, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, uh, we're about to begin oral communications. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in and instructions should be on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for the public to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will have two minutes to speak. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. This is a time for counsel to hear from the public. We will not engage in dialogue. When we are able, we will address the questions raised at the end of oral communication. So again, if you are here for oral communications, please, please Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and I will invite you to speak to the council. So a couple minutes in case people are still joining us. Again, please remember to push star nine on your phone uh, to raise your hand to be acknowledged. Any members of the public currently calling in? Um, given that we have an item that's a time is certain for 6:30 to start, I don't think it would be in our best interest to start that item early. So um, I think what we can do is maybe wait another couple minutes, and if there are no members of the public who like to um, address for all communications then we can um, just break and then reconvene at 6.30. It does look like there's one person uh, who's just joined us. Hello, you have two minutes for oral communication. You're on the line. Okay, this is Garrett Phillip. The government COVID response melds the absolute worst in global and American political problems into a nightmare of false narrative propaganda, unwillingness to admit phenomenal policy mistakes are being made, censorship is everywhere, civil liberties are crushed, and a public being conned like never before using fear and intimidation. Reality check, isolation measures will never eradicate a highly infectious and already widespread virus like COVID-19, but will only slow down the inevitable spread only to reappear over and over as shutdowns and relaxations yo-yo back and forth. The strategy is praying for a miracle cure or COVID goes away by itself. Big Pharma will never see a word against them on the news. They own the news. Big Pharma will never see a word against them in AID. They own the Congress and the NIAID. 79-year-old Fauci needs to be fired and 39 years as the head of NIAID just bred good old boy corruption. I don't trust the monopolist Gates who said we don't want a lot of recoveries. Ask yourself if another virus like this appears as it will in the future, would this response be repeated? No, that would probably be really stupid. The WHO covered China's tracks on COVID and continued to issue advice against closing border travel until March 11th after more than 100,000 cases in dozens of countries worldwide before finally declaring a pandemic. So who is a globalist entity made up of nations who are not democracies and enemy communist countries like the CCP or less than transparent are now funding them? Corruption, greed, unethical behavior, immorality, globalist ambitions, and political maneuvering didn't take a time out because of COVID. Full throttle instead, and it is up to the people to hold their government accountable for their actions, including this council. Now, combined that with the totalitarian collectivist movements of socialism, communism, and leftism who believe
believe if we only give up our individual rights and hand them over to some all-wise beneficent central authority, all suffering will end. Dissent not be allowed and non-existent safe spaces where we all should live our lives uh, will be present. We are in what I call the deep bolsheta, which is what you get when combining the Bolsheviks with Sheta. Okay, I see my, my minor two minutes is up. Bye. Wow. Hello, my name is James Ealing Whitman. Um, Secret Health Club, six months ago, many psychological operations continued to be ignored in this tiny maritime courtroom in Santa Cruz, California. Like the subject of various civic elected leaders creating situations to make other civic elected leaders look bad, leading to a great deal of questions about both the integrity in this room and on whose side of the court railing is being served, the individual citizen or the corporate personhood. What an election. Is there no shame? That's all I wrote, and that's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's any other member of the public who'd like to address the council during oral communications, please press star nine on your phone at this time and you'll have two minutes. Right here on the line. Uh, thanks. Members of the community, my name is Robert Norris. I'm with Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Uh, on the last, during the last two council meetings, I've asked a number of questions as well as sent in those questions by email to uh, Mayor Cummings and various other city officials. They have to do with uh, Governor Newsom's room key project, which really is uh, an attempt to stop the contagion in the COVID-9 situation from spreading uh, among the homeless population here in Santa Cruz. The questions I've asked is how broadly, how much money has actually been spent from that fund? How many rooms have actually been made available to people who are disabled and vulnerable and on the streets who are homeless. And while that situation has improved somewhat in certain small numbers, I can't get the exact information, and I would encourage the community to demand this, because if you go through the city, you will find disabled people outside. And that isn't a good place for them to be generally, but in this situation, it isn't a good place for them to be at all, considering the entire community's interests here. So I'm just requesting some straight answers from the city council, which I'm hoping, well, that's a little strong, but I would demand that they give these answers to the community tonight. Um, we've gotten some sort of vague reports from Susie O'Hara and Martine Bernal, but the real issue is how much money do they have from the room key, uh, how much have they spent, and how many people have actually been housed, when how many people are not being housed who need to be housed. These are my questions, and I invite the community to demand that those in authority provide answers. Thanks for listening. You're muted, Justin. Okay, if there's any, thanks. If there's any uh, other member of the community who would like, speak to us during oral communications, please press star nine on your phone at this time and we will re you'll be recognized. Hey, you're on the line. Hello, my name is Hillary and I just want to second on the very first caller who talked about uh, the quarantine COVID and I agree with him, him 100%. Um, I feel that we've really, really been conned on this one and that uh, when you're sick, you're quarantined. When you're healthy, you're not quarantining the entire city, county, state, nation, world. I, I really feel it's, it's wrong. And, I, and, and our, our Bill of Rights and all of our rights are at stake here. And when they get away with this, we're going to see more of this. And I'd like to say recall Gavin Newsom immediately. I hope everybody will do that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. 
Okay, if there's any other member of the public who's joined us, uh, you can, if you'd like to speak during oral communication, please press star nine on your phone so that you can be recognized. All right, you're on the line. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Garcia and I am a resident of the Circles neighborhood and just wanted to make a comment about the two proposals regarding the property at 111 Eric Circle. Eric, I'm, I'm going to stop you uh, briefly because that's the next item on our agenda. And when that item comes forward, you'll have the opportunity to um, speak during uh, public comment. But right now it's oral communications and oral communications is the time for people to address us on items that are not on our agenda. Okay, thank you. I will save my comment for later. Okay, thank you. Okay, again, this is oral communication. If there's anyone who uh, has called in who would like to address us on items that are not on tonight's agenda, please press star nine on your phone and we will, and you will be recognized. Given that no one has called in, um, I wanted to see if maybe we could take a moment to, in response to uh, Robert Norris's question regarding the city funding for homeless services, I just want to let him know that the county has been taking the lead on, um, you know, dealing with the homeless outreach and the approach to dealing with homelessness under COVID-19. We, have, the city, has been assisting the county, but the county is the entity that's been issued the funding. And so uh, if you have any questions regarding Project Room Key, funding that's come through from Project Room Key, uh, we'd encourage you to contact the county. Uh, the Human Services Agency, on their website, you can find information about all the different options related to uh, homeless outreach, homeless services that are being provided under COVID-19. So uh, please visit their website to find out more information and please contact them if you'd like to know any specific details. And again, if you're just joining us, um, if you'd like to speak during oral communications, which is a time to address the council on items not on the agenda, please press star nine on your phone. You're online. Uh, is this comment time? This is oral communications to adjust the council on items that are not on the agenda. So if you're calling in about uh, the Circle Church item, uh, we're going to have public comment later. But right now, if there's any, okay. if you'd like to address us on items that aren't on the agenda, you can go ahead and do so. Um, no, I'm going to wait for the public comment time for Circle Church. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, seeing that uh, we haven't had more people calling in, um, I'm just gonna say that why don't we take a 15 minute break until 6.30 and we can reconvene uh, for the last item on our agenda. A little bit. He's in.
so we want to give it back so we can put on uh, videos to council members so we can get started. All set over here too. Okay. All right, next item on our agenda is item number one, public hearing for 111 Eric Circle. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the itemized staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. Uh, before we get started on this item, I also wanted to recognize that uh, Councilmember Matthews was able to be present by phone for items numbers 5 through 17, but was unable to vote uh, due to te technical difficulties. And so I just wanted to state for the record that she was in favor of um, items numbers 5 through 17. In addition to that, before we get started, I know that this is, there's been some questions um, in the past regarding um, council members making motions uh, before the, uh, before public comment, and I just wanted to reach out to the city attorney, because I know this is a quasi-judicial matter, and I, there's been um, some concern around making motions before hearing from the public, so I was wondering if you could speak to that as it relates to this item. Yes, uh, happy to do so. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, <clears throat> that's correct. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding in which the Council is being asked to evaluate a development project against uh, objective uh, standards contained in your <clears throat> zoning ordinances and, <clears throat> excuse me, general plan, plan use policy. And uh, it, as a quasi-judicial Proceeding the council task is to evaluate the evidence and the information that's presented to you against the city's uh, land use decision making standards and to apply those standards in uh, regard to the evidence. And so, while not technically uh, <clears throat> prohibited under principles of due process. Um, it is certainly preferable for the council to evaluate the evidence, including public testimony, before a motion is placed on the floor, uh, simply so that the public can be assured that the council is making its decision in light of all of the information presented, including testimony from members of the public, um, before it has rendered its decision. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. I also want to add that um, the, the applicants have reached out to me and asked for additional time, uh, similar to at the planning commission meeting, and so I've granted them 10 minutes to speak. And so I think what might be good is if we hear from the staff, the presentation, and then the, the developers so we get a clear sense of what we're going to be evaluating, and then we can ask questions followed by uh, public comment, and then we can return for action deliberation. And so with that, uh, I will turn this item over to Ryan Bain, senior planner, and uh, Lee Butler from the uh, Lee Butler planning director. Thank you, Mayor Cummings and council members. Good evening. I'm Lee Butler, the director of planning and community development for the city. And tonight we are pleased to be presenting this project to you for the redevelopment of the Circle Church. You'll be considering the applicant's preferred project, which is a 12 lot subdivision, and a staff preferred alternative to that project that would modify the 12 unit subdivision to combine two of the lots into one lot that would have um, six condominium units and four accessory dwelling units. And you will hear later from the applicant that they are now actually seeking approval of both alternatives. Um, leaving it to their discretion as to which they choose to implement. So that's something that um, is uh, expected from the applicant as part of their presentation. Um, 
This is a challenging site um, for many reasons. Um, obviously, it's a circular shape. We don't deal with circular shaped lots too often. Uh, but beyond that, the site represents a lot to many people. Um, its geographic location is literally at the center of the Circle's neighborhood, and it's got very significant view corridors that terminate at the site. Um, it's visible from Mission, um, along Young Love, from West Cliff, up Woodrow, and then um, for quite a ways along California as well. And the community has some very strong emotional ties to the site, and that's understandable. It's been a church, a community center, a gathering place for generations. And we've heard those feelings of connection expressed by many in the area, and I'm sure you'll hear some of that this evening. The general plan provides guiding principles for the development of the site, one of which is to encourage development at the top end of the density range. And as discussed at length in the staff report, given the objective standards from the general plan, particularly the one uh, that specifies we should develop at the top end of the density range, and given the site's proximity to commercial, job centers, transit, as well as its walkability and bikeability, uh, staff believes that it's important to develop the site at the high end of the density range, which would be um, alternative two. Um, not only is that the more sustainable option, but it also provides more socioeconomic diversity, given that condominiums are inherently more affordable than single-family detached lots. Um, I should also point out, and Ryan will go into this a little bit, that the higher density option is actually significantly less dense than the properties across the street on the other side of Arid Circle, and actually less dense than the properties throughout the Circle's neighborhood as well. The, Applicants' attorneys have stated that approving alternative two in and of itself would not be consistent with Housing Accountability Act. Um, you saw that in their letter to you. Um, I will refer to the Housing Accountability Act as the HAA here. Um, it's certainly up to interpretation um, whether alternative two in and of itself would be consistent with the HAA. However, we believe that it would be consistent if you just approve alternative two. Nothing in the HAA expressly precludes the city from increasing the number of units in a project, and the HAA states that it's the policy of the state that the section be interpreted and implemented in a manner to afford the fullest possible weight to the interest of and the approval and provision of housing. And alternative two would certainly provide more housing. Um, we recognize that the applicants have indicated that the multifamily project um, may be difficult to finance. And while we haven't seen information that expressly um, supports that, we certainly understand that stance. And um, the applicants have indicated that um, they would potentially be interested in modifying alternative two such that it could be a project which is individually financed. What that could entail is um, detached condominium units on that property, or it could um, be uh, uh, another form of a condominium project um, there. So we've actually added some conditions that allow for some flexibility, and Ryan will talk about those. Um, we are supportive of the alternative, um, while it hasn't been presented, um, we would support an alternative approach to making that more financially viable for the applicants, and the condition would provide for that. That um, condition, we also believe, um, would provide additional consistency with the HAA in that it would um, promote the ability of that um, alternative to, to be financed. But again, um, that HAA consistency is up for debate, up for debate and certainly the, the applicants are arguing in favor of having um, both um, projects approved, both alternatives. Um, so they want to maintain that flexibility and staff would, um, if the council is leaning towards approving alternative one, staff would encourage the council to also um, approve the second alternative so that there would be an option for the developers to pursue that more sustainable and more socioeconomically diverse project. 
Um, before turning it over to Ryan, I just want to thank the community. There have been a lot of really great comments um, that have come out of the public engagement here. We heard a lot of uh, great thoughts at the Planning Commission as well, and um, I'm sure you'll hear some of that this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. I'm not muted on there. There you go. Uh, so no one can hear me. Lee, you can hear me? Okay, you guys are good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Think everyone can see that? So, yes, um, thank you, Senior, Plan Senior Planner Ryan Bain. I'm presenting the 111 Eric Circle Project. Most everyone knows where this is located. Um, it's a, a significant um, part of the west side of Santa Cruz. That's a 1.62 acre uh, circular parcel located at the center of the Garfield Park Circle neighborhood. Um, the property contains a, a U-shaped church currently. Um, the church was constructed um, over a period of years from 58 to 61, and the site is surrounded primarily by single family residential, um, but there is one local market uh, convenience store adjacent to the parcel to the southwest. So uh, a little background, so prior to submitting um, a formal application, applicants held a community outreach meeting uh, at the on-site church in December of 2018. The owners also held uh, weekly meetings at the site through the summer of 2019 to hear from interested neighbors. Um, there were several neighbors that expressed concerns with the project, specifically the demolition of the church, uh, which some felt as, has historic significance and should be added to the city's historic building survey. Um, a historic evaluation was prepared um, by a city-approved historic consultant that determined that the property does not meet the criteria for historic listing. Uh, in addition, a peer review of the historic report was prepared by a, a city consultant, Dudek, who agreed with that report. Uh, in response to concerned neighbors, the city council directed staff uh, to refer the historic report um, to the Historic Preservation Commission for review and to make a formal recommendation to the council as to whether the site should be listed on the Historic Building Survey or as a historic landmark. Um, on January 30th, the HBC held a public hearing to consider the report, and the Commission recommended this, the Council on a 5011 vote that the property uh, not be listed. Um, and they also added some additional advisory recommendations um, regarding the pending project, and we'll go into that a little, a little later. Um, on February 25th, the City Council held a hearing to consider whether the project um, or property should be listed on a historic building survey, and the Council heard testimony from the public, and then on a 601 vote, upheld the recommendation um, of the HPC that it not be listed. Um, on April 16th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing for the project. Um, the Commission recommended on a 7-0 vote uh, that the City Council approve Alternative 1. Um, so that included acknowledgement of the environmental determination, the residential commercial demolition authorization permit, and a tentative map uh, was what they recommended approval to the Council. Uh, in addition to that, as part of that recommendation, um, they also included uh, revisions to um, condition regarding in the inclusionary requirements. Um, the, the amendment basically was, was they wanted the applicants to provide evidence that the project meets a co-housing definition um, as defined in our inclusionary ordinance. Uh, also that the common area building be constructed prior to or concurrent with the first um, dwelling unit out there. And also they wanted CCNR, <coughs> CCNRs to include language um, that basically confirmed it as co-housing, so such as congregate meals, resident community management, a non-hierarchical decision-making, um, and, and if the development does not meet the co-housing definition, they were recommending that to the council that the two affordable parcels be provided on-site. 
So we have two, two alternatives here. Um, the proposed project originally consisted uh, of two alternative site plans that involved demolition of the existing church and subdividing the, the site. Alternative one, um, the original proposal, and alternatively preferred by the applicants, consists of subdividing the parcel into 12 individual single-family parcels surrounding a common ownership uh, parcel in the center. This option requires a non-residential demolition authorization permit uh, to demo the church and a tentative map. Uh, Individual property owners would develop each lot separately with a single family home following the approval of the, of the final map. Alternative two um, was developed by the applicants in response to the planning department's recommendations to maximize the density on the site consistent with certain general plan policies. Um, pursuant to the L or low density residential general plan designation, a maximum of 16 units can be constructed on the property. Alternative two, um, the, the alternative that's preferred by the planning department consists of subdividing the parcel into 10 individual single family parcels and one lot with uh, six condominium units uh, all surrounding a common ownership parcel in the center. This option requires a demo permit, plan development permit to allow the multifamily and the R15 single family zone district um, with concurrent multifamily and ADU construction as well as lot size, lot width, and setback reductions. It also requires a design permit and a, also a tentative map. So just prior to the planning commission meeting, the applicants withdrew this alternative two option from their proposal, but staff continues to believe that alternative two is, is more in keeping with the general plan policies aimed at promoting maximum densities, social diversity, and sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, the general plan designation is low density residential. It allows for a 1 to 1, uh, 1 1.1 to 10, 10 dwelling units per acre. Uh, so based on the 1.62 acre site, it would allow a range from 2 to 16 units on the parcel. Uh, therefore, both alternatives are consistent with that designation. Uh, as I mentioned, there are several general plan policies that speak to maximizing density. Um, uh, policy LU, LU 3.7 talks about encouraging higher intensity residential uses and maximum densities. Uh, another policy talks to uh, allow and encourage development that meets the high end of the general plan land use designation density. Um, also policies about uh, foster land use patterns that balance economic, housing, community, and environmental needs. Um, also talks to, to using plan developments for clustering of units. Um, and then also land use patterns, street design, parking, and access solutions that facilitate multiple transportation options. So that's one of the, these are some of the reasons that we are supporting um, the alternative to with, with, the, with the higher density. Um, so while alternative one meets the requirement of the R15 zone district in regards to proposed single family uses, which is 5,000 square foot lot sizes, minimum 50 foot lot width. Um, only 12 lots are possible under these development standards. Um, alternative two, the project would maximize the density and number of units allowed on the site, provide varied uh, housing types to promote social diversity, encourage a sustainable and healthy lifestyle given the project's bikeable and walkable nature due to close proximity to commercial uses, job centers such as the West Side Industrial Area, the downtown, as well as the recreational amenities that, um, such as West Cliff and uh, uh, surrounding parks. The site is also in close proximity to public transit stops, thereby further promoting sustainable transportation uh, by the residents. So going through some of the permits that are uh, part of this proposal, um, as I mentioned, there's a non-residential demolition authorization permit. Um, we, we already talked about the church um, and determined that it uh, not, not, does not qualify uh, historic. Also, we have a tentative map for both as, as, well as part of alternative one and two. Um, alternative one would include the subdivision of the project into 12 5,000 square foot single family detached residential lots with the one ownership lot in the middle. Um, they'd be roughly pie shaped and arranged around the central common area lot. Alternative two would include subdivision of the project into 10, um, 4,933 square foot lots, a little smaller than 5,000 uh, required under the R1 district, um, as well as a 
almost 11,000 square foot lot, which would house the six condos and four ADUs, and then also the common area lot in the center. Uh, for alternative two, a plan development would be required. Um, and the intent of the plan development permits is basically to allow creative and an innovative design uh, to meet the public interest and general plan goals more readily than through just conventional zoning regulations. So in this case, alternative two would require a variation to the R1 standards uh, to allow the six unit multiple family condominium <coughs> development and 4 ADUs allow the lot less than 5,000 square feet, less than 50 foot width, uh, would allow for reduced front setbacks for the single family residences, as well as a reduced front and rear setback for multifamily. Uh, also part of this is a design permit um, for the multifamily. Um, there would be two separate two-story structures um, that would house the units, as well as eight uh, garage spaces. The proposed side design is, is fairly simple and balanced with a shared interior driveway that separates the structures. And four of the units are oriented toward Arid Circle with two of the lower floor units having front porches facing the street. Uh, so the building designs have a kind of a simple contemporary architecture with sufficient articulation and compatibility with the surrounding single family neighborhood. Um, they include architectural features such as porches and balconies, dormer windows and belly bands to really balance the height and mass of the buildings um, for them to be compatible with the surrounding single family homes. And at approximately 25 feet in height, they fall within the 30 foot height limit allowed in that single family zone district. Um, and as I mentioned, there are some reduced setbacks um, for the front and rear. Um, as Lee had mentioned, this isn't kind of, the, the Circles neighborhood isn't kind of your standard uh, R1 district in terms of minimum 5,000 square foot lots. It's made up of a lot of small substandard lots averaging approximately 2,800 square feet in size. So this really translates to a higher density than most R1 districts within the city. Uh, and in comparison, if, if, this were, if this project were to be consistent with the surrounding neighborhood in terms of density, the site would, probably, would accommodate approximately 25 units. Um, and potentially 50 if you included ADUs with that. Um, also wanted to mention that uh, in recent conversations with the applicants, um, um, they expressed some concerns with the ability to finance and develop the multifamily portion of the project as it currently is designed. Um, this especially is a concern in the midst of the current COVID crisis. And so it was therefore requested that we allow some flexibility with the design of the multifamily. So they wanted to be able to allow a detached or townhome style design. Um, staff is supportive of that and wants to allow them some flexibility for them to, to be successful. And so we've crafted a, a new condition that does allow some flexibility um, in the design of multifamily for the alternative to um, project. Um, it basically would allow for them to submit for a minor modification that would, that would allow for them to redesign the common infrastructure and site layout. So staff would review that as a formal application. And also as part of that, we've um, implemented in, in the condition some uh, flexibility in terms of construction timing that um, is um, laid out in some of the other conditions. So um, this is something that's fairly new that was discussed just recently and uh, we wanted to uh, recommend this as part of the project. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, as part of the review, there was a, the historic determination of the site um, included three advisory recommendations regarding the project and the city council also supported that when it went through that uh, review process for the historic designation. And those three were that the project design includes some type of open space at the focal point of the Woodrow Avenue view shed, that the project includes historic interpretive plaques, and that the street pattern be retained. So um, an open space has been designed um, into the subdivision at the focal point of Woodrow, as you can see here. Um, also, um, the, open it, the open space includes a garden, bocce court, uh, and then access to that central common area. and. Um, also, a condition of approval has been included that requires that four historic interpretive plaques be displayed 
around the site for the public to view. Um, the plaques would provide information regarding the history of the Circle neighborhood, including the origins of the concentric, concentric design of the area, uh, the original tabernacle of the church, and the historic development of the Garfield Park neighborhood. Um, so the design and content of those plaques would be coordinated with the Historic Preservation Commission. And as you can see, as proposed, the street pattern is, is remaining unaltered. Um, the general plan has a variety of policies that support quality design, such as the following that are directly applicable to this project. Um, the subject parcel is very unique in its shape and surroundings, and so located at the center of the neighborhood, it's a visually significant location with four intersecting streets. So design, design standards have been included in the conditions of approval that address the inclusion of front porches, um, conditions that call to diminish the visual impacts of the garages, as well as address proportions and massing of homes at each of the street termini. Um, a total of 18 trees are located on the site, of which nine are identified as heritage trees. Um, five of the trees to be removed are heritage trees that are in fairly poor condition with severe structural defects. Um, the city arborist has reviewed the arborist report and agrees with all of the findings regarding tree removal. Also, um, in terms of site improvements, um, there's new curb, gutter, and sidewalk proposed um, with a relatively large uh, five-foot planting strip located between the gutter and a uh, generous seven-foot sidewalk. That, the applicant's um, the application was deemed complete prior to the current inclusionary ordinance taking effect, so therefore both alternatives require a 15% uh, inclusionary requirements uh, for sale to low and moderate income households. So based on the 15%, both alternatives calculate to require two affordable units. For alternative one, um, providing two lots as inclusionary is fairly impractical as eligible households would likely not be able to afford both the purchase of the inclusionary lot in addition to securing a construction loan to build a house on the parcel. So given the uncertainty of the sale and development of two parcels, coupled with the fact that in fees could be leveraged to achieve significantly more than two single-family detached units, the payment of in fees would be a preferred option for alternative one. For alternative two, uh, an on-site option could be accomplished through a for-sale deed restriction on two two-bedroom multifamily units coupled with a rental deed restriction on two of the associated ADUs. Um, so this could be a good option for the city to consider since it provides four units, uh, including two deed restricted rental units. Um, however, the arrangement with a deed restricted purchase and a deed restricted rental included within that purchase is fairly complicated, and the city is actively pursuing several affordable housing development proposals um, and contributions to the affordable housing trust fund in lieu fee payments um, in the short term could be leveraged to create a more affordable unit than what could be provided on site. So, there are some timing issues with leveraging those funds, as this is described in the staff report. Um, so there's, uh, there would be a need for an accelerated payment, um, but the in-lieu fee option may be preferred for alternative two. Um, speaking of, in, also in terms of inclusionary, um, sorry for all of the writing on here, but I just thought I would get it down here. Um, certainly not gonna be able to read all of that, but. Uh, We've, this is a, uh, uh, a revised inclusionary condition um, that we've included. And it, it involves both alternative one and alternative two. I know there's different conditions. There's uh, both alternative one and two have different um, numbering in terms of some of their conditions. But uh, this is an inclusionary condition that we're recommending that we've um, changed up a little bit um, in negotiations and discussions with the applicants. Um, to address um, some of the inclusionary requirements. And I was just going to mention that uh, we have both, uh, we have uh, Jessica DeWitt with our economic development department who's available for any questions regarding inclusionary if you have any after the uh, presentation. Ryan, if I could just jump in for a second on this revised inclusionary condition. Yeah. I think one of the important uh, distinctions between this and the prior version was that our economic development staff found out actually yesterday afternoon 
that the, the grant that we are um, able to utilize uh, to match the funds that we have in our affordable housing trust fund, that grant, um, we previously thought that we had to have the monies actually deposited um, before the grant deadline. And what our economic development department found as of yesterday was that we don't actually need the funds deposited. Instead, we need a formal agreement that says, here's how much the funds are gonna be, here's when they will be deposited into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and here's what happens if those funds are not deposited. And so based on that, we've revised this condition to reflect that we can still get the matching grant funds in alternative one or alternative two if that agreement is in place with a specified time frame. So that's really the, the essence of what we wanted to capture here. Um, and then one other thing that I would point out here is under alternative two, um, we also specify here that if the applicant wants to um, do individually financed airspace units on the multifamily property, so this is where Ryan and I were both talking about if they go to, say, for example, detached units, six detached units, along with four accessory dwelling units on the multifamily property, those could actually be sold as lots. And in that instance, this condition would say, if they don't, and this is at the bottom of this under alternative two, it says if they don't provide the in-lieu fees, then they could dedicate three of those airspace areas to Habitat for Humanity or an alternative um, nonprofit developer, and then they would um, develop that property. And we, we've heard from the developer that Habitat is not interested in purchasing properties, so if they, they put properties up for sale, Habitat isn't in the position to purchase those, but if they were given properties, then they may be interested, in, that they would be interested, and that's um, something you can confirm with the applicant, that's a conversation that they've had. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for why that changed. Um, I know there's a lot of text there, and we're happy to leave it up there either now or later if the, the council would uh, like to go back that, go back and, and dive into that and, and read that. But those, that was the intent behind uh, the change there. All right, thanks. Um, so in terms of environmental review, uh, an environmental checklist was prepared by uh, DUDEC to analyze the project and determine consistency with CEQA. Um, based on the checklist and pursuant to Public Resources Code 21083.3 and State Secret Guideline 15183, no further environmental anal analysis is required. Uh, in addition um, to those uh, statutory exemptions, the project can also be considered to be exempt from CEQA under a categorical exemption uh, 15332 as an infill development. So, um, as I mentioned, while both alternatives are consistent with the L um, low density residential designation, um, there are many general plan policies that directly support alternative two over alternative one um, because it maximizes the density at the high end of the general plan designation. It, it promotes social diversity by offering lower priced housing options and achieves a higher degree of sustainability um, by more efficiently using land and by providing more housing options in an area where healthier and more environmentally friendly transportation options such as pedestrian, bike, and transit are convenient, um, particularly given the central location of the site and close proximity to various amenities. So um, these policies are, are really the basis for the Community Development Department's support of Alternative 2, uh, and it is recommended that the Council uh, approve the project consistent with the plans for Alternative 2 subject to the recommended conditions of approvals and findings. And that concludes my, uh, my presentation.
And Mayor, if I could um, just add one additional thing, and that is, um, that, you know, we talked about consistency with the Housing Accountability Act before, and I just want to, and, and that is in your report, but I want to be clear because um, some of the members of the public um, may be listening or watching and uh, may not have the benefit of having read our report. And that is that the Housing Accountability Act um, actually specifies the, the ability of councils to approve or deny projects. And they specify specific criteria under which uh, a council may deny a project. And um, while we have debated over whether or not um, you know, Alternative 2 in and of itself um, would violate the Housing Accountability Act, it is clear that if the council were to deny both projects that would be inconsistent with the Housing Accountability Act. And so we are looking for um, the, the council to not take that action this evening, um, which would be inconsistent with the Housing Accountability Act. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have about that or the project itself. All right, well, thank you both for that presentation. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to council in case there's any questions on the two items are before us before we hear from the developer because that was a pretty lengthy conversation and uh, the, develop, the applicants will additionally have 10 minutes uh, to speak and I just want to make sure that if there's any questions right now that can be addressed before we hear from the applicants, uh, I just think it would be good to provide you all with an opportunity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Matthews. And you're muted. I'm unmuting here. Thanks. Um, many questions, but um, most immediately, Lee, could you go back to that very last uh, PowerPoint that you had up? Um, asking the council. Sorry. Yeah, let me. Uh, whoever, uh, Ryan, whoever's here. <laughs> Sorry, let me bring that up again. There you go. Very, very last one. The very last slide? Or which, which slide are you looking for? Uh, I think it was the one you just showed last. The recommendation? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There, that one. So I know that the staff preference is for alternative to the applicants have asked for alternatives one and two, and I believe the staff has said they uh, they can make the findings, they can live with that. So my question would be if we were going in that direction, um, the things that would be in common would be acknowledging the environmental determination, approving the non authorization permit, they'd be different tentative maps, et cetera. So at one at what point are they in common? At what point do we have to, um, um, you know, alter the language to reflect those alternates? I don't need to know that right now, but that that will be a question to, to come up as we move down the line here. If, Lee, you're nodding your head. You see where I'm going with that, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and, and the, uh, to approve alternative one, it would just be the non-residential demolition authorization permit and tentative map, you could say, associated with alternative one, and then all of the items that are shown on the screen here associated with alternative two. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about the, the renderings for the proposed uh, multi-unit projects. Who uh, who created those? How, how did those come about? Were they those um, from the circle of friends um, in consultation with the planning department or elsewhere? Those were yeah. Those were prepared by the applicant circle of friends um, as an alternative as part of the alternative to. Um, and so they did. They hired uh, architects to prepare those site site plans and elevations and floor plans. Okay, thank you. I have lots of questions, but I think I want to hear from the applicants first. Okay. Vice Mayor Myers. 
Yeah, Ryan, could you go to the slide, um, the new slide on the um, inclusionary? Okay. <laughs> For the, the condition? Uh, yeah, on the condition, yeah. So down at the bottom, um, it discusses the airspace option um, that could be sold or developed. And so the the number of those are is still at the six, correct? As is in the original um, Alt 2. Or is Alt correct. 2, Alt 2 was supposed to, okay, six condos and four ADUs. Yes. So, um, okay, so there would still be, you would still retain those 10 units. Um, and then in the very last sentence, it says, in an in lieu fee is not, if an in, in lieu fee is not used for alternative two and a single project is developed, as is contemplated in the current alternative two multifamily project design, then two two bedroom condo units, each with an associated D ADU shall be sold. So that those two two bedroom units and the associated U ADUs would come out of the six. I'm just trying to make sure I'm following the math here. So that in the bottom, the last sentence reflects back on the original um, six units, but two of which would be sold, two of the condo and two of the ADUs would be sold at an affordable rate. Is that correct? Is that how, am I reading that right? I believe that is correct. Lee, did you get all that? Is that, do you agree with yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, Jessica DeWitt and the applicants and I were uh, <clears throat> going back and forth on this today. And yes, that is correct, Council Member Myers. And um, we have, the, the applicants have agreed to that. I think um, you know, they are thinking that if they move forward um, with the multifamily option, whether it's approved, um, in alternative two by itself, or if they choose to as part of an option, that they would go with an alternative um, means by which units are individually financed. Um, they, they, this is what the current condition, uh, what you previously had, I should say. The, this is consistent with the previous condition. So, so based on the alternative two that we saw before, that last sentence mm -hmm. is what we were contemplating. And um, the condos, it, it is tricky because the condos would be sold with an ADU and then the ADU would be rented with an affordability. It would be rented, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so that life, last sentence really reflects um, the proposal that has been uh, moving with with the project all along. It's the, it's the sentence before that lays out these individual units. Um, you got it. What is what what is the number? Is are, is the inclusionary condition still number whatever the number is on that number doesn't change? The number would not change. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a question, and I think you you all had a slide up um, discussing allowing and encouraging uh, higher density. I think it was. I'm not sure which slide. Probably consistency with general plans. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Here's some of the general plan policies that encourage uh, maximizing density. So I have a question with regards to, and I might need uh, city attorney to weigh in on this as well, with regards to just this whole application process because it sounded like the way that this has gone was that there was an initial uh, application, staff worked with the group to have a second application. <clears throat> Over time, the applicants felt like they couldn't you know, afford uh, to do what was in the alternative in the second application. So they withdrew their application, and so technically there's only one application currently on file. Even though we've kind of gone through the steps of developing that application, that application technically is not on file. And so I'm just kind of curious around our ability to take action on an application that is not on file with the city currently. And so I was wondering maybe if the city attorney could speak to that or um, if somebody from the planning group can speak to that. Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in and then Lee um, I, I had some views about that too. Potentially you're right, the applicant at the 
11th hour decided to withdraw the application for alternative two, which was the application that was favored by the by the planning staff. And so you're right, technically application number two is not before you. And so the recommended action, although the terminology has been sort of tossed um, around a little bit, would be to approve the application with modifications as recommended by staff. And so um, I think that's the distinction. And so you know, with a lengthy letter submitted on behalf of the applicants that address that issue, uh, I think Lee did a good job of summarizing um, the city's uh, arguments in favor of the approach that's recommended by the staff. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of uncertainty there given some slightly inconsistent language uh, in the statute. But that's, that's how I look at it is that really um, what's being proposed by the staff is approval of the project with uh, conditions that modify the uh, project density and the number of units and whatnot um, to further the policies inherent in the general plan with regard to um, desirability of uh, increasing the housing stock uh, in the city. And then I'm sure we would like to collaborate on that. So Paul's end. Yeah, I would. I would just say thank you, Tony. That uh, that's that's accurate. The the applicant submitted. Um, we had talked with the applicants early, and so their initial submittal uh, included both alternatives. And um, I would say, you know, um, you know, we'll hear we'll hear from the applicants. Um, it's a little odd now that they're asking for um, for both alternatives. So it's it's even unclear now. Is that second alternative technically? Uh, no longer withdrawn. Um, I, I think, you know, as Tony explained, um, from our perspective, the way that we're approaching this uh, of um, not denying um, the project that they have uh, presented, but rather approving that project and um, having a condition of approval that um, modifies it to be consistent with um, the second alternative with the multifamily lots. I think that's the, the distinction that um, that we believe puts us in uh, a consistent approach with the Housing Accountability Act, whether or not that second application is technically on file, which I think is, is debatable one way or the other right now, um, uh, given that the applicants do want to get approval of, of both of those. Okay. We think so, it's consistent either way, though. So just to be so it's clear for the community, and I think it's so clear for all of us, what we would be doing today is if we were to be moving forward, we would be approving the application that's on file. And there's the potential, then, so that's technically the first alternative, but then also um, including that the applicants would be able to modify that application so that it matches the second alternative that was included in our packet and that you all had discussed at an earlier point, point in time. That is one of the alternatives. I would say the council tonight has uh, three um, outcomes that would, would give a, a final approval to the application tonight. The first could be simple approval of alternative one. The second could be alternative, uh, sorry, approval of alternative one with the condition that it matches um, alternative two. So it is essentially approving alternative two. Um, and um, then the third would be alternative uh, would be approving alternative one or alternative two, with the applicant having the discretion to pursue whichever one they see fit. And um, I, I think, as I'm expecting, we're going to hear from the applicant. That's what they would like to have that maximum amount of flexibility to. Um, to pursue the solely single family uh, project or to pursue the, the mix with single family and uh, uh, lot with um, six um, condominium units and four ADUs. And then just final follow-up. So, and Tony, maybe you can weigh in on this because, um, you know, we have a letter from their attorney where, um, 
you know, they requested um, that the council approve the only application that's before us, which is alternative one. Um, they stated how that application is consistent with uh, planning codes, neighborhood character, supported by the neighbors. And they mentioned in this letter from their attorney that the approval of two would violate the Housing Accountability Act to expose the city to liability. It sounds like they're kind of moving uh, towards, you know, potentially having us uh, approve both alternative one and two. But my concern is, is whether or not the community, um, given that there's only one application on file, might also file a lawsuit against either the city or the applicant um, in violation of the Housing Accountability Act. And so is there any exposure to liability on that end? I'm not quite sure uh, under, do you mean if the city does not approve alternative two? I'm not, I don't quite understand your question. I'm if sorry. the city does approve alternative two. Right. Would that potentially, because it, you know, their attorney is laying out that, um, that alternative two could violate the Housing Accountability Act and put us at legal liability. They might not want, I mean, it sounds like they want us to go in that direction, but then could the community technically say that um, by approving alternative two, the city actually violated the Housing Accountability Act because that wasn't what was in the application and as a result put us in a situation where we're facing a lawsuit or potentially the applicants there is a um, there is language in the Housing Accountability Act that uh, that gives some uh, causes of action to individuals who might um, have benefited from the housing development that's proposed that's consistent with a local zoning code. But as to your specific question, I would need to give that a little bit further thought, and I'm happy to work on that as the discussion carries forward uh, and hopefully I can provide you with a, a more um, uh, thought out response uh, before the end of this meeting. Um, so so that, that's something that hadn't occurred to me and, I, and we haven't discussed it internally either, but let me take a look at that and I'm happy to follow up as the meeting progresses. Okay, thank you. Building, building on Tony's comments there, I would say that you know if if someone were able to argue that they were adversely affected because of an, uh, a lack of housing supply that would be provided, that's actually the opposite of what would be happening in the uh, situation here. Alternative two would be providing more housing and a more socioeconomically diverse base of housing. And so I think that's part of the challenge here is what we're trying to do is actually what is the intent of the Housing Accountability Act. The Housing Accountability Act specifically says that cities cannot reduce the number of housing units if the project is meeting the objective standards of the general plan and zoning. It does not say that the city can't increase it. And so, you know, the, the act is structured in a manner to, to prevent cities from um, having less housing and we're kind of doing the opposite of saying, you know, we should have more housing here. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps your uh, thought process there, Tony, but I thought I would share that. No good point. Council Member Byers. Um, I, would you put the slide up uh, that talks about the environmental impact? I think it was heading with environment. I'm not, yeah, I can't remember what it was. environmental review. Uh, everything fine with um, alternative one. If I look at alternative two, it seems to me uh, we have to change the zoning because it's R1 and, and with the idea of a multiple unit changes that. And the design also creates a lot of several substandard lots, which I think in our general plan or I, maybe I'm, I'm sort of been away from, from the general plan of some of our ordinance, but uh, clearly we are not, uh, I think it's an ordinance, we are not, oh, a subdivision may not create substandard lots. So there's two things with alternative two that to me kick in looking at CEQA because they are unusual and I think if they're unusual things that uh, it's, it's just not a regular subdivision, there's two major um, 
zoning and planning um, zoning, I guess I should say, that will kick uh, that they want to kick in to do number two. So I need an, you know, I want you to think about does that now and should it require us to really look at the secret impact because that neighborhood does not have any multi-unit housing, none. This is really a change and it will have an impact and somebody's got to look at that impact. And, uh, and of course, the other one, creating all these substandard lots, which clearly says uh, that we are, uh, all new subdivisions should not create a substandard lots. So I think this is a question for our, our people, and uh, I'm anxious for the applicant to get to speak, but I think this goes to the heart of what we are saying, or our, our people, are, our planning department people are saying. And so I, need I can an and I can answer that question for you. So yeah, I mentioned earlier the plan the plan development um, permit that's part of the alternative two proposal. I'll let me go back to it. Right. So the plan development section of our zoning ordinance does allow for variations to our zoning development standards. Um, and so that, that's where, that is the function, um, that's the tool we're using to allow the lots less than 5,000 square feet, to allow lots less than 50 foot in width, and to allow for uh, the multifamily um, within the R1 district. So the, the plan development section of our zoning ordinance allows for all of this. So it do, would not require a zone change um, or a, any of that. And, um, and I should mention that the, the, the checklist, the CEQA checklist that was prepared um, by our environmental consultant um, basically did a review for both alternatives. It includes both. So it was um, the CEQA review um, okay. was covered for everything. So now um, alternative two is called a, P, is, is called a planned unit development. Correct. You know, we, we all concentrated on one and not two because the applicant doesn't want to withdrew it. So I, I guess the, 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 everything is out of balance with our paying attention and looking at it carefully. Uh, I did not know that we were predicting a, a PUD on that uh, because we're just getting it tonight. <laughs> the, I think that uh, that's the only one I have right now, I believe, uh, yeah. My only questions, I can wait till after the applicant speaks. All right, thank you. Council Member Watkins. Great, thank you, Mayor. I think my questions were sort of in line with your um, line of questioning in terms of the process. And so my interpretation of the agenda report and the Housing Accountability Act is that we can't deny the project at, and, in terms of being in compliance with that act. So at minimum, alternative one um, needs to be approved. But what I'm hearing in terms of the options at this point is that we at minimum approve alternative one or else we would be held liable. Um, but we could potentially have uh, additional um, alternative two aspects included. And then if my understanding correct, is correct from you, Lee, is that then alternative three would be that we don't mandate alternative two, but essentially that there's discretion between at minimum one and two. Does that feel, because I don't think I've, I've seen a, an application like this come through with just sort of the two alternatives. That's correct. Um, it, you outlined it correctly. Uh, alternative one could be approved. Alternative two um, as a function of alternative one could be approved. And um, then um, the third alternative would be to approve both. Okay. And then, but both, and, and so my understanding to sort of the line of questioning that um, that Council Member Byers was, was that alternative one and two had both been sort of vetted, if you will, um, to, to kind of meet our standards at this time. That's correct. correct. Um, so um, the, the two applications, or sorry, this, the two alternatives were submitted together and then they were um, considered um, concurrently up until um, you know, roughly a week before the planning commission hearing. And so both of them were, were lined up and ready to go. 
And then in terms of the community outreach in regards to both alternatives, they were in play until just recently. Is that accurate? That's correct. You can, uh, Ryan, do you want to speak to that? That, I didn't quite understand the question. Was it that alternative two was? Was that considered at that first community meeting? Oh, the, first, the community meeting that happened in December of 2018? Yeah. I, I think, if, if I may, maybe just for a little bit of clarification, I think my, I'm just trying to get, is has, so both alternatives have been part of this kind of conversation, this evolving conversation over the past several years. Um, is that, I mean, does that feel accurate in terms of how it's been vetted by our city department, but also as it's been um, kind of vetted through our community engagement process? Well, I think for the first community meeting, um, they actually had the community meeting prior to them submitting the application formally. Um, and so they they basically introduced themselves and introduced, you know, I think just at that point it was just the 12 lot concept, alternative one. Um, and then through con further conversations with planning staff and encouraging them to maximize density they came up with and developed the alternative two to maximize the density, and then that was what was um, formally submitted, um, both both alternatives as, far, as part of a formal application. Um, and then I know they had meetings through the summer of 2019 where they invited, I think they had a weekly Wednesday night meeting or something like that where they invited people to come and speak, and I, I think that, that they presented both alternatives to people during that time period. And then obviously um, it went to um, HBC and Planning Commission. So um, the two alternatives, you know, have been around, you know, since I think the original application, which I think was in the big early 2019. Thank you. Can we go back to the mayor's question from just a minute ago because I identified the language that I was referring to. Brian, if I could share my. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen for uh, just a second while I show the. Yeah. Um, How do I get out of this? So, the language that I was referring to, um, Council, I'm going to show on the screen here, is part of SB 330. And that is not it. Um, <laughs> Bear with me a second. Um, is my screen showing now with the highlighted language? Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, so uh, SB 330 at subsection K 1A, Roman numeral lowercase one, says the applicant or a person who would be eligible to apply for residency in a housing development project or a housing organization may bring an action to enforce this section. And if in any action to enforce the section of court finds that any of the following are met, the court shall issue an order pursuant to clause uh, two. And um, Roman numeral uppercase two below that says the local agency in violation of subdivision J disapproved a housing development project complying with applicable objective general plan and zoning standards and criteria or impose a condition that the project be developed at a lower density and the argument that's been propounded by that's been put forth by staff here is that it's not recommending that you disapprove the project and it's not recommending that you develop the project at a lower density it is in fact recommending that you develop the project at a higher density um, and so then that calls in, into question um, the, the issue of feasibility and so um, the applicant has made an argument that alternative two is not economically feasible, but has yet to provide any objective um, evidence upon which to base that assertion. So that's where we stand with this. There is a possibility, although it's very, I, I, I'd say it's very unlikely, but there is a possibility that a third party who um, feels aggrieved by the decision could try to mount a challenge based on this language. Thanks, 
County. I'm going to think about that a little bit, but yeah, thank you for that yeah. update. Just to add a wrinkle. Yeah. I'll turn it back to uh, Council Member Matthews. Thank you. Uh, in the discussions of density in Alternative 1, there's just been consistently talk about the 12 single-family homes, but not where the ADUs associated with those homes come into the figures. So I'm wondering if you can address that. It's been part of the discussion all along, um, how those might be um, uh, built into the plan, if there's a way to do that. And then secondly, so there's two questions. In alternative two, um, there's the version that has been going through the, the pipeline at multifamily homes, but now the applicants are proposing a variation, which would be um, either cottages or townhouses on individual small lots, which appear to be um, uh, a, an acceptable variation um, to the uh, department staff. So I just want to make sure that uh, variation to alternative two um, is kept alive in the discussions as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor. I, I apologize, um, Tony. I, I wasn't really clear on what your determination or sort of um, assumption was there, but if I'm reading the Housing Accountability Act correctly, based on what we have in our agenda report, it appears that the liability would be more so around us not approving ultimate infill as opposed to the alternative of approving infill, right? I mean, it's basically trying to promote more it's saying that we can't go against more infill. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, question, I, I don't follow your, I don't think I follow what you're going to in terms of legal liability if we have proof. Well, if you think about the letter that was sent by the applicant attorney on Friday, they did take the position that if the city were to approve alternative two and not alternative one as they proposed it, that that would violate the Housing Accountability Act. And they, I don't want to repeat the arguments that are made in that, but uh, essentially that's their argument. And so if you give that argument credence, then um, it's theoretically possible that a third party, not the applicant themselves, but another person who uh, wants to potentially buy or live in one of the one of the units that may be eventually constructed there could take a shot at a claim under the Housing Accountability Act based on the language that I just um, read in, read for the council. Okay. All right, uh, council member Brown. Yeah, I, I, I really do want to hear from the applicants uh, before we carry on too much more, but I, I just wanted to follow up and, and try to clarify um, the question about the Housing Accountability Act to me is, I mean, it's, it's unlikely that we would get a lawsuit um, of that kind, but um, I think it's important to recognize that, that there may, there's a possibility there. But I think really the, the issue was related to the feasibility of the project getting done. So if we put, you know, if, we, if we're requiring alternative two and it's not feasible financially for the applicant, then that means no housing is getting built and that is a problem. So I just wanted to make sure that we're clear about that um, and I guess there'll be more discussion about that later. Um, but so the, so the issue to me is not about um, you know, getting in trouble for trying to create lower density, but um, getting in trouble for creating conditions that make it financially infeasible for the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, if I may, thank you, Councilor Brown. That's, I think, where I was trying to understand the logic behind that. Is that what you're saying, Tony? Essentially, is that we would be creating conditions for it to be a non-feasible project by adding this additional? That is the applicant's argument as, okay. as expressed by their letter. Okay, thank you, Councilman Brown. That's sort of where I was trying to go. Okay. I guess just to follow up with that, I think where I was kind of coming from was 
understanding that they removed that, they pulled that application, the second application specifically because if we had two applications before us, one with higher density that's not feasible, and we approved it, then we put them in a position where they couldn't build the housing. And that's exactly why they removed it. But it sounds like now we can alter that first application, and please correct me, um, or maybe Tony, you can speak to whether this is true or not, but I, and I guess that's the overarching question. Can, with the current application that's before us, that's on file, it sounds like we can increase the density to some point, to, to maximize it to the greatest extent possible. Um, is that true? Can we make those alterations to that application since that's what is before us today? And that is the, that is the crux of the question that's before you tonight and the applicant attorney um, as expressed by their letter uh, has taken the position that if you uh, condition the project or that if you take action on the project other than the way it is proposed by the applicant, that that would in and of itself violate the Housing Accountability Act. And that's a point of disagreement. Um, but, I'm, you know, as I said before, there are certainly ambiguities in the statute. Uh, and, and so there is some uncertainty with respect to that. Um, that is their argument, is that if you uh, don't approve the project as it is, uh, submitted, uh, assuming that it otherwise complies with all objective zoning and general plan policies in, that, that are that are applicable, that that would violate the Housing Accountability Act, and they make that argument in their list. And then just to follow up with that, you know, even if the applicants were okay with what's laid out in option number two, would there be any possibility for community members to say there's not an application on file for what we like if we were to pass option two that applica application is currently not on file with the city would there be potential for us to get in trouble for applying an application or um, for approving an application that isn't technically on file i think the question is whether or not a member of the public could fairly say that they were not on notice that the issue was going before the council and you know insofar as the staff's recommendation is included uh, both in the um, in, no. in the agenda description and in the agenda report, I don't think that's a, a fair statement. And for the council to approve alternative two, um, it would be the same thing as if the council uh, considered a project and approved it, but made modifications to it in the uh, Members of the public are on notice that this is the topic before the council, but not. Um, you're not required to notify uh, the public as to every nuance that the council might add as a condition or a minor modification to what's proposed. Okay, thank you. That that clarifies it for me, Council Member Watkins. Um, thank thank you, Mayor. My so I, I guess I sort of to sort of sum it all up. It seems like alternative three, which is essentially approving alternative one, allowing discretion to alternative two, would be that um, sort of sweet spot, if you will, in terms of um, the ability to not be held uh, liable for the Accountability Act, but also to leave room for a potential uh, expansion, but not demanding potential expansion at this time. Does that feel accurate? Is that the recommendation of the Planning Department, given the conversations you've had today? Our recommendation, we would still like to see the additional units for all the reasons that we've outlined related to socioeconomic diversity and um, the sustainability aspects. However, I would say that unequivocally, approval of both options without uh, a requirement that they do one or the other, leaving it to the applicant's discretion, that is unequivocally uh, consistent with the Housing Accountability Act. Okay, thank you. And I agree with the planning director on that point. That's Mayor Myers. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take my hand down. I, my question was just answered, thank you. Um, House Member Matthews. And to clarify again, what Martine referred to as alternative three, the uh, <laughs> 
unit um, also fulfills the planning department's interest in a greater variety of types and densities. Is that a correct statement? Insofar as the applicants choose that alternative, they would still have an option to just develop 12 single-family homes and nothing else. Right. I would say that if, if the, I'd reiterate, you know, if the council is leaning towards option one, and we would prefer to keep the option open for the additional units. So we would prefer option three to option one. <laughs> Again, Again I, uh, as I talked to you earlier today, option, did you say option three? I um, said option three, yes. <laughs> Martin, yeah. excuse me, Councilmember Watkins was referencing. Which was basically option two with variations on how those additional density, density, density units are uh, produce. Is that correct? We still would like to include um, those potential variations in option two. So alternative two, which has the multifamily, we, f we see that it's absolutely fine if the applicant wants to provide those in an alternative manner, and if they believe that it's more financially feasible for them to do that, then absolutely let's include that. So we, we fully support that condition regardless uh, of um, uh, which stance the council takes. Um, I, I appreciate you asking for clarification. So just for simplicity's sake, um, the alternative three would be approval of both options um, and letting the applicant choose. That's, that's how I'm seeing alternative three um, as uh, the third thing the, the council could, could approve tonight. All right. I, um, go ahead. I was just going to say I'd include that that flexibility in alternative two or alternative three. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'm going to see if we can. Oh, Council Vice Mayor Myers, sorry. That's okay. Um, I think I do want to go back and revisit alternative one. Um, and Director Butler, I believe you just stated that. Under alternative one, um, they can certainly build the they could certainly build the single family homes, but there's no requirement under alternative one that they provide the ADUs per se, correct? In the way that the project is now um, proposed. That's correct. Um, as we have listed the condition, we um, require that they include a, uh, a, they show us on their design permit a plan that would accommodate an additional ADU. That's an easy thing for them to do. It can be, you know, an area that's converted. It could be a new detached area. It could be an attached area. Um, but um, under the tentative map, um, the requirement for adding ADUs is uh, questionable. And so um, we didn't we didn't go there. The applicants have also expressed some concerns about um, the ability of each one of those individual homeowners to um, be able to construct both the unit and the accessory dwelling unit at the same time. And we recognize that and didn't want to preclude them from doing uh, from from having you know one unit developed. Um, by virtue of uh, them needing to develop two. Um, certainly, it's, uh, there's an economy of scale to develop them at the same time, but if, if the finances aren't there, um, that could be problematic for um, moving construction forward on the individual units. So for all those reasons, um, we structured the condition as we did. Thank you. I have one additional question regarding um, the communal building. Uh, I know that they have the, this group has, um, through their meetings with the community, you know, they've advertised this as this co-housing like project, and it doesn't seem like there's a condition on when that building needs to be built. And so I was wanting to see if you could speak to that. 
because it seems like there should be, if, this, if they've advertised this to the community as, as co-housing, um, and one of the conditions of that is that there is a building or space for communal cooking, gathering, um, you know, meals, things like that. I think that it's important that we include that somewhere, and and, then it's, it's, and it's also supposed to be, you know, uh, building for community space. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what we're going to do to actually, you know, hold um, just them accountable for, you know, making sure that that building gets built at some point. You want to start that, Ryan, or would you like me to? You're sorry. You're you're up there. I go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, uh, we had this conversation following. There was a lot of uh, focus on this at the planning commission meeting, and so we actually had some internal conversations about this um, amongst our team, and then we opened it up and we had uh, some conversations with the applicant about this, and. Um, we don't believe that the provision of a uh, communal building is a necessary component of a co-housing. Um, you know, if they have the, the center lot, and if they're using that as, um, as common area, you know, there, maybe it's got a bocce court, maybe it has uh, a, um, a community garden area for their residents, maybe it's got, you know, a common lawn area where people are picnicking together. Um, we didn't see the, um, the, the presence of a building itself as a uh, uh, requirement. There is a provision in the code that says that co-housing typically has a common area. It doesn't say that it does in, in um, uh, that it is required to have that. And so that's, that's sort of where our conversation went. We also, in talking with the applicants about that, you know, they weren't sure about the timing, um, whether or not they, they want that. And again, we, we fell back on if that common area is indeed um, being used as such, then we feel that that meets the intent of the, the co-housing that they have um, that they have advocated as uh, you know their their component. What we did as a response to that, though, is we recognized the the planning commission actually helped us recognize that we did need to strengthen our conditions surrounding um, what the ultimate disposition of that center area is. And so we added some things into the CCNR condition that uh, spoke to, that were actually pulled directly from some of the Planning Commission's comments and that spoke to um, that functioning as a, uh, a co-housing space and a communal space in the center area there. Um, we just did not include the um, Planning Commission's recommendation regarding the timing of the building. You do have the option of doing that, and we can, uh, the, that uh, Planning Commission recommendation is in your agenda report, and so um, you can um, tie that, um, that timing um, of a, a communal building to um, a date or to a number of permits that are issued. It's, it's within your purview, um, and I think um, the applicants may want to speak to that as well. Thank you. Vice Mayor Myers. Here. Okay. Uh, so at this time, if there's no further questions, I think it would be good if we turn it over to the applicants um, to do a presentation. I'm not sure. I'll It's 9544. Are you one of the applicants? Oh, uh, no. Actually, I um, am waiting to speak during public comment. Okay. Thank you. I'll just put you back in the queue. Do I need to hit star nine again? or? No, I'll take care of it. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I, believe it's, I believe it's a 650 number. Mayor, I think it is um, the one that you, last name Packer. Hello, this is Caitlin. Can you all hear me? Uh, there we go. Uh, you, Caitlin, are you giving the presentation on behalf of the uh, Circle of Friends or is that someone 
else? Yep, that's me. Okay. So the, app the applicants have uh, requested 10 minutes. That was something that they also had received at the Planning Commission, and so uh, we'll be providing them with the same. And then there was another member of the public, uh, Ms. Reeves, who reached out, and we will also be providing her with an opportunity to um, speak on this item as well. And she'll also be given 10 minutes um, for purposes of equity. So, uh, Caitlin, I will turn the, um, turn the discussion over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, and thank you, council members, for listening to our presentation and for helping us out through this very nuanced project. Um, I'm hoping that our slide is up on the screen. It's up. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, my name is Caitlin Wild, and I'm one of the Circle of Friends, and we purchased this property two and a half years ago um, with the intention of creating a communal green co-housing community. And our vision from the very beginning was to buy together and build together and create together what we couldn't do individually. Um, next slide, please. So this is us, the Circle of Friends. Um, locals, uh, that's me on the left. This is normally in the presentation where we would introduce ourselves, but this is the best we can do. Um, I've been in Santa Cruz for 20 years. I own a local business, an outdoor <coughs> company. Um, Mark Thomas there up on the upper left, um, local teacher, um, raised his three kids here, um, serves on the board of the Save the Waves Coalition. Alex up top is a retired businessman, lives down in Big Sur. Joe Combs, raised here in Santa Cruz, small business owner. And Brett Packer, who's six feet away from me right now, um, has been here, what, 40 years? Um, owns a, a local construction business. And Dwight on the bottom here is a uh, former firefighter. And Ginny, born and raised in Santa Cruz, is a local business owner. Um, next slide, please. So this is our original plan, plan A. This is the plan that we prefer. This is the plan that we feel like provides us with the most flexibility. Um, it's zoned for, well, actually, sorry, next slide, please. As you can see here, the, the zoning, the, all of the yellow is for R15. So our project is compliant with the R15 zoning. Um, next slide, please. And we are, we are a co-housing community, so there's been a lot of questions, I know, um, about what is co-housing. And really what co-housing is, is it allows people to develop affordable housing enriched with an, with an abundance of social capital. So like I said in the beginning, buy together, build together, be together. This is something that we couldn't do as individuals. So by working together and investing together, we plan on through sweat equity and being a grassroots bootstrap group, we can build homes on the west side that we wouldn't be able to afford to do otherwise. Um, during this COVID crisis, it's really reminded us of how important community is. And we wanna stay close to our friends and family and share meals and gardens, and we intend on doing all of that. Um, we recently had a Zoom meeting for folks interested in buying into uh, buying a share of our co-housing community, and we really believe in stewarding the legacy of the circles and keeping with with community building and inclusion. Next slide, please. We also plan on building green, so we plan on meeting and exceeding. Um, lead standards for building. We plan on having solar, winds, we're considering 100% electrical power. Um, next slide, please. We also are, we're all gonna be building our own unique homes and fitting with the style of the neighborhood. And we're also gonna be working together throughout the design process to ensure our homes and site layout is compliant with each other and the neighborhood. We're all planning on having front porches and um, a continuity of design throughout all of our homes. I'm gonna pass the phone over to Brett here and he's gonna talk about alternative one and alternative two. So can you go to the next slide, please? Um, hello, council members and community. Um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, 
we came together to purchase the property, and prior to purchasing it, we met with the city staff to determine the viability of a housing project here. And with the R15 zoning, um, it was clear that uh, we could build homes here, single-family homes. We proceeded with a plan for 12 single-family lots with an open area in the middle. And we presented that to the city staff early on, and they um, suggested that they wouldn't support that plan, and um, so, so they would requested more density and a variation in size of the units. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and created what is now Alternative 2 with 10 lots and six condominiums uh, with the open area in the middle. We've also, um, there's, uh, we've always been committed to uh, building ADUs along with our homes. Um, it's good, good for us and important to the community uh, to maximize the housing potential. Um, so with 12 homes, you have 12 homes and 12 ADUs, which would give us 20, 40 units. And I'm sure some of us would build junior ADUs as well uh, to raise those housing opportunities. In um, alternative two, with uh, 10 single family homes and six condos, we were, you know, we, we were willing to go along with this plan um, because we wanted the support of the city staff in going before planning commission and the city council, and we were willing to live with it. Uh, it, it was fine. It wasn't our preferred preference, uh, preference because um, we're not developers, and it was going to be challenging for us to build those big units. And the neighborhood prefers the single-family homes. Um, Community groups have expressed that, and um, it was going to be financially challenging for us to do alternative two. Um, we did bring both alternative one and alternative two. I just want to correct Ryan on this to the community meeting back in November. We had both plans fully developed at that time and presented them to the community at that community meeting. We then continued through the summer uh, with a series of meetings held at the church weekly. Um, to share our plans with the community and take their feedback. Um, so, um, what? So we we're carrying through with both these plans until, as noted just before the planning commission meeting, we took out our application for alternative two. And the reason we did this was because we were all being seriously affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, it's hit all of our selves personally, um, our businesses, our work, and we're seeing it start to devastate the economy, and we are pretty sure this devastation is going to keep going. And due to the conditions applied to Alternative 2 by the staff in terms of when the units would get built, as well as our own ability just to finance those units. Um, we're not in a strong position to borrow the large chunk of money it would require to build those units. And therefore, we would have, if had that been approved, we would be stuck um, and wouldn't be able to go forward with, with either our single family homes or the multifamily. So we pulled it off the table and we're proceeding with just alternative one. Um, as has been noted just in the last couple of days, we've been working closely with the planning staff and, and you know, we are interested in maximizing the housing on the site. We always have been, hence the ADUs and the junior ADUs. And we feel like we've um, kind of come up with an idea, a plan that would allow us to uh, be able to afford to build those smaller units. Um, if they're in a more detached form where we can um, do them one, one at a time um, rather than the block of six units all at once. And so that's why we are now open to moving forward with alternative two as well as alternative one. It is very important to us that alternative one is approved tonight no matter what, and we feel that state law um, is behind us on that and that the council is in a position where they have to approve it. We also feel that it's okay and we would very much appreciate if they would approve alternative two as well. And we can continue to work with staff to fine tune uh, possible alternative 
um, minor variation on alternative two, and then we could proceed with that to maximize the housing on the site and provide those um, variation in the units. Um, I also um, wanted to um, address our co-housing situation. We have worked together from the very beginning as a group of local people. We meet once a week, at least, sometimes twice a week for the last two and a half years. We work on consensus. All our decisions are worked on until we agree with them. Um, it's been a long road for us, two and a half years in three different city councils. We had a change in the PC. We've gone through an HPC meeting. It's been very challenging, and we've stayed together. We've continued to work together. We solve problems together. And that alone is a heck of, heck of a start to co-housing. Is that the end or just uh, close to the end? Uh, no. Anyways, we will be meeting in that center circle, and, bar and if we have to eat on picnic tables and barbecues, and easy ups until we're able to build a building, we will still be co-housing whether we have a building or not. It's our intention to build a building. We want to have a space for people to gather, for our people to gather. We want to share that space with the community as well. Do I need to stop? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, at this time, I don't know if council members have any questions specific for the developer, the applicants? Um, I do have a question for the city attorney. Just understanding that, I mean, I'm just trying to make some sense out of the, um, actually, no, I'll save my question. I'm not gonna ask it right now. Um, I think at this time, what we'll do is uh, there is a member of the public who asked uh, to speak on this item, uh, Jess Reeves. And so I will allow you an opportunity to um, respond on behalf um, of your group. And given that uh, at the Planning Commission they were allowing for groups to have 10 minutes, I will also allow you 10 minutes to speak and we'll pull you online right now. Hi, okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening. Okay, great. Hi, thanks everyone for taking the time today and giving me, uh, me and my group 10 minutes to talk. Um, I don't envy your position having to make all these decisions tonight, but I'm sure you'll all do really, really good job. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm Jess Reeves. I live at 260 Walk Circle. Um, and I'm, bless you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm part of, of a group called Save the Heart of the Circles. Um, next slide. And our goal, our overarching goal as a group, um, is to buy the property uh, at 111 Eric Circle and preserve it as a community space. Um, and we just wanted to let the council members know um, something that we recently learned that there are now two potential buyers um, for the property. There's our group, and we recently learned that the church that's currently there leasing the sanctuary um, is also um, interested in buying the property um, and have made, actually made an offer to the developers. So, however, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about specifics. Um, if the property is developed, um, we want it to provide the most and sufficient public benefit. Um, so next slide. Um, I just want to apologize before I get started because a lot of the conditions that I'm going to refer to here are based on the conditions that were put forward um, by the Planning Commission. Um, so I had to put my presentation in um, last Thursday. So I didn't really know what the new conditions would be put forward by the Planning Department. Um, but. What you can understand is that any of the conditions that we talk about here um, can be applied to alternative one, alternative two, or now this alternative three. So, okay, so we really like um, the count, city council to consider keeping the amended condition 35, um, where there's only in lieu fees if the group is indeed showing that they are co-housing. Um, we'd like to add a condition requiring that the ADUs be built within a certain time frame, which is something that I think um, 
Councilmember Matthews kind of keyed in on. Um, we'd also like to add a condition that the public be able to rent the community building or the community space a certain number of times a year. And we'd also like the council to consider upholding the condition 48 where the demolition permit is only approved with the building permit. So next slide. Um, so I went through and did some data analysis on all the letters and online form submissions and hand petition signatories that were done for this project. And I, I sort of coded them in a number of ways, but I mainly coded them versus, versus against the demolition and for the demolition. And within the city of Santa Cruz, there's actually 268, so 80, 85% are against the demolition and 47 or 15% are for the demolition. And that against number is actually not even including over 400 um, online submissions that we got from our online petition page. And all those 400, there was 2,000 in total, but 400 also were um, from the city of Santa Cruz. So next slide. And so just looking at the people who are for the demolition, so these are people that are, are, are really wanting the development, only 24% of those people were from the west side, um, and that's 17 people. So 59% of those who are for the demolition want co-housing on the property. 38% want ADUs on the property, and four letters included the idea of a community facility that could be rented out by the greater public. So I'm going to go into a little bit more details on these ones um, in the next slide. So next slide. So condition 35, as the Planning Commission had it written um, for approval, really looks at the fact that 60% of the people who are for the project want co-housing, um, and that's why a lot of the neighbors bought in. We're going to ask that the community building be built concurrent with the issuance of the first building permit. And if we, as, as the owners are saying today, that it's too hard to be asked it to be built with the first building permit, well, I think Andy Schiffer really clued in on it, is if we don't put a condition on it at all, then it might never happen. Um, and so whether it's the first building permit, the sixth building permit, we really ask the city council to sit down and think today, what is a reasonable thing that we ask of these people that are claiming that they're co-housing? Like, what can we ask of them? And we also ask the development, if it functions as a subdivision, so it's not considered co-housing, that the two affordable parcels be set aside on the site so that we can have a mixture of affordable units in our neighborhood. So if in-lieu fees are recommended, it's not clear when any affordable units might be finalized by the city. So just to go into a little bit more detail on this, if we go to the next slide, um, this is a map, on the right-hand side is a map of the revised density bonus, so 100% affordable. So this is a new zoning that just came into effect this year. And if we have those two inclusionary parcels concurrent with either lot 8, 9, or 10, they would fall within that new zoning, which means that if an affordable housing developer could buy these lots or if the city could buy these lots and give them to an affordable housing developer, then no density limits would apply, which is really cool because we could have a lot of great housing right in our neighborhood. Um, next slide. So something that the ADU condition that we're going to ask for. So 38% of people who are for the project want ADUs so that there will be more affordable housing in our neighborhood. Um, at the planning commission meeting, um, the owners mentioned that they would be open to adding the ADUs to the conditions of approval. So we're going to ask that a condition be added that requires each parcel to build their ADU within two years of the single family home permit issuance. This way, they can build their single family home, have time to get the property reappraised at a higher price point, and then build their ADU. Sort of like it's a win-win for everybody. We, we know that the ADU is going to get built and the owners get, you know, their property reappraised at a higher value. So next slide. So this community building condition, so it was really cool because I saw four letters for the project that included an idea of a community facility which could be open to the public. Um, at the Planning Commission meeting, the owners mentioned that the group was open to such an idea, which is really cool because it's the first time um, that we've actually heard that from the owners. Um, this is really common in multifamily developments, which is the idea of the common room sort of in HOAs that can be rented out by the public for events. 
Um, we ask that that condition be added that grants public access to the community building on a rental basis 20 times per year for functions and public events. And you know, this is once again, this idea of having um, community gathering spaces is very well supported in the general plan. Uh, next slide. So on to our last thing is condition 48. We ask that the demolition permit only be given once the first building permit is approved. Um, the planning department has set it right now with the grading permit, but that's not what the planning commission originally approved. Um, we do not want a huge empty lot sitting vacant in our neighborhood, possibly for one year or more. As the owners have said, their financial situation may be precarious and who knows what could happen to their funding. And you know, the church is currently being used, the offices are being used, by businesses, and once the shelter-in-place orders are lifted, there's a good chance that kids will be in the gymnasium once again. So next and final slide, this is a final remark. I think our group really feels like it's not the job of city council to help developers with their poor real estate decisions. It's really the job of city council to make sure that the developments that do occur benefit both the owners and the greater community. And I put links in there for the, so you can access the data I analyzed in a Google Drive file. And also the bottom link is for the map of the, the, the new zoning permit, permit that would hit the top, the top part of the circle. Um, thanks very much for your time today, and I really appreciate all the work you're doing on this. All right, thank you very much. At this point in time, uh, we're going to move into public comments. If you're interested in commenting on the 111 Aired Circle, and if you call in, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. When it's your time to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted, and the timer will be set to two minutes. And also, there should be um, a, number, uh, a list of phone numbers on your screen, so if you haven't already dialed in, please um, follow the instructions. And again, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be acknowledged by the city council. All right, first caller, you're on the line. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mayor Cummings and council members. <coughs> My name is Sue Powell. Um, I have lived on Wilk Circle for 37 years and that's a block away from Eret Circle. I've been working with residents of the Circle's neighborhood since November 2018 in efforts to protect the Eret Circle Church from demolition. We do not want to lose this significant community asset that has provided decades of great community benefit. I emailed the City Council petitions with a total of 2,484 signatures from people requesting protection for this iconic site. 655 of those signatures were collected from Santa Cruz City residents, 243 on paper and 412 online. The great majority of these 655 signatures are from neighbors closest to the proposed demolition subdivision and development. I um, also attached a document with a map of the Circles neighborhood and listing of the paper petition signers organized by street name. So I think that's a pretty impressive way to understand the opposition to this project. Um, I have um, two issues to bring to the attention of the City Council. My first concern is about the zoning exemptions that would be required for the higher density multifamily units proposed in Alternative 2. Um, from my understanding, these exemptions would cause significant environmental impact by fundamentally changing the physical character of our single family neighborhood, and we believe it would not be legal under CEQA law. The second concern is one that Jess already touched on, it's about the timing of the demolition permit application approval. When the City Planning Commission reviewed the development project in April, several commissioners mentioned that they doubted that the developers would be able to secure construction financing during the current economic downturn. It is important for the City Council to know that our neighborhood group has initiated fundraising with the intention of offering to buy the property and manage it as a community center. Because of the possibility that the owners may sell the property in the near future, the Circle's neighbors would like to request that the City Council delay the approval of the demolition permit application approval for the project until the first building permits are issued. This would leave a window of opportunity for the Circle Church to be purchased for the good of the community. Okay, thank you for considering our concerns. All right, thank you. And again, if you just joined us, um, if you can press star nine on your phone, that will allow you to raise your hand and then we can acknowledge you um, 
for public comment. Okay, next speaker. Yes, uh, Patricia Combs. I'm a Felton resident. Um, I'm the mother of Joseph Combs, and I raised my kids here in Santa Cruz. I lived in Santa Cruz for 91 through 2008, and now I'm in Felton. But um, I'm really, I support the circle of friends. I support the current choice they have, which gives them the most financial flexibility and um, planning um, flexibility, which the Planning Commission is in favor of um, and the planners. And, you know, I think that all these changes is because of the, you know, rigidity about the community housing building and requiring like the, some were mentioning that they have daycare, this and this and this. A co-housing does not depend on a building. It's the people. They can meet on grass if they wanted to or in somebody's home and have meals, communal meals. It doesn't have to be in a building. So demanding the building be built by a certain timeline, um, deadline, um, may not be feasible because, you know, saying that half the units have to be built before and then the, the communal building. Well, what if they don't want a communal building? And, you know, it's, it's private property. And so these oppositional save the circle, it's like they can't accept that it's private property. They have new neighbors now. Um, that they're not obligated to have events, especially 20 events, that's two a month. And, it, you know, they have to consider this is private property. They have the right to peace and quiet, enjoyment of their own property. It's not going to be a park. It's not a community center. They have the library. There can be a library space. I understand that Carfield Park Library is going to be rebuilt. They can put a communal room there and rent space. They're not obligated to rent space to the community. And um, the only thing I can see about the save the circle is that they're trying to derail this project and stop it. So I do support Circle Friends' current choice for Plan 3, which gives them maximum flexibility. Hello, my name is Freya Sands. I live on Woke Circle. Please, there's been a lot of new information tonight, but take in consideration not only re the recommendations of the commissions, the planning staff and owners, but all of the seven 2,000 plus of us who prefer that this place be revitalized as a community and spiritual center. Please take time to consider whether it's best for the city to support a relatively relatively small number of people over the hopes of a large community. There is no going back if the heart of our neighborhood is gone. That's forever. Thank you very much and thank you for your service. Good night. Hi, hey, thank you, Ron Council Member, for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, this is Carolyn Ronzano, and I've lived in the circles for 20 years, and I, too, would like to request that Condition 48 is upheld so that the demolition permit for 111 Eric Circle not be issued until the first building permit is approved. There may be still many hurdles that could cause significant delays, like what had happened with um, the 908 Ocean Street project. Specific for this project, COVID-19 financial and procedural issues, potential lawsuits could cause significant delays. You've heard they're having finance problems and even the planning commission has a doubt they can get funding. So why demolish it to have it sit as an empty nuisance lot? Even after the original tabernacle burned, um, the city took steps to prevent a nuisance lot by designating it as a park. Um, another point is that the Circle Church is still providing public benefit with active tenants in there today. So why not just let that public benefit continue for as long as possible? Um, so one final point I want to make on this is that there are groups interested in purchasing the property and maintaining it as it is to continue serving the community. So if the owners would like to, you know, 
maybe take this solution, it becomes impossible if the buildings are demolished. So there's really no upside or justification to demolish any sooner than when the building permit is approved. And I just want to touch about the communal building because that has been on their drawings for the last year and a half. It's something that's been promised, committed to the community, to the public. They have been promoting, providing housing for over 30 families to garner support, and now they're kind of pulling the rug out from the community. So I would just like to have the council members sort of um, consider that when making their decision. Thank you for all your leadership during this crazy time, and um, that's all I have to say tonight. Hi, my name is Steve Claywish. I live on the Circles, and um, I agree with the last callers that the plans aren't truly what they um, are, uh, what they were touted to be. Um, that they have been morphing um, to less and less interaction with the com uh, community. I think a, a group that is uh, 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 trying to be co-housing and about community, coming into another community and really dividing it, I don't see how that um, is a, a co-housing, a community-oriented situation. There's a block of land, there's a piece of land a block away that's absolutely vacant, has been for 30 years. And I don't understand why they didn't develop that rather than destroying the, the center of our community. Um, if you do vote to go ahead with this project, I would like to see the benefit, since the, our, the benefit to the community is being taken away. The center of our neighbor, neighborhood is being taken away. It should be maximum benefit to our neighborhood by providing it the maximum density housing possible. And ideally, that would include a green space for the public also, but I know that's not possible. And I know the planning, com, um, planning department's um, idea of, of um, compensating the neighborhood for the loss of this property is to put plaques around the uh, circle um, denoting its uh, rich history. And to me, that's nothing more than a headstone um, uh, pointing to the loss of, of the heart of, of this neighborhood. Um, and I, I also want to thank you all for working so hard um, on this project and through these uh, kind of challenging times. And I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thanks. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. This is Matt Huerta, Housing Program Manager with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And um, you saw our uh, support letter. Uh, thank you for, for uh, confirming your seat of that. Um, that really does uh, demonstrate a pretty large uh, coalition of stakeholders, business leaders, residents, um, organizations in, in your community that really support this kind of development. Um, really represents where the city has decided uh, time and time again that it wants to go in terms of infill, smart uh, growth and development. Um, and uh, we encourage you to stay on that path and um, that the state is behind you 100% with the Housing Accountability Act is, is another blanket that we can all wrap ourselves around and um, certainly want to comply with that, both uh, letter and spirit. And um, I also want to say that we, it's been a pleasure to work with the Circle of Friends who uh, requested our, the, our endorsement and have worked with us diligently to um, try to achieve um, their development in, in, in line with our mission and goals, and I think largely have. So we support them in their efforts to um, try to uh, make feasible Alternative 2 and um, with the baseline of Alternative 1. So I guess now we're headed towards Alternative 3, as Council Member uh, Watkins had mentioned. So that's certainly something that, that we encourage, and um, we appreciate your leadership in approving uh, their development this evening. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Jim Allen Young. Uh, I live on Eret Circle across from the church. Uh, I just 
like to mention a few things uh, regarding the, the alternatives. We're really in support of alternative one. Uh, I think it's very characteristic of the neighborhood. We're all, even though we're tiny, tiny lots, tiny homes, we're all single family homes. And that's different than apartments and multifamily housing. And that's why we're here. Um, you know, we've, I think living on Eret is different than living on one of the other circles. We've been right across from the church, that property, and seen its ups and downs for almost 30 years. I think that one thing to note is that this group and the circle of friends have been put through the ringer. I mean, the, they've hit opposition every time, and it seems like it's primarily just a way to delay the project in the hope that some angel is going to swoop down and buy the property back from them. And I think it's just disingenuous to say that that it should be denied or delayed in order for the community to somehow uh, do something different there. And we're certainly not interested in having it, the whole site purchased and being developed with much denser housing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we should just support the local community and what they're trying to do in these folks and, and let them move, on, move forward with building their homes and then we'll have some new neighbors across the street. Thank you. Yes, hello. Uh, the opponents of the Circle Church development have done just about everything possible to void the property rights of the new buyers of the property. They have lost in this endeavor over and over for very good reasons. It's not historic and it doesn't belong to them. They have zero rights and the developer's plans are reasonable and consistent with zoning laws. Redevelopment would be an asset to the community and neighbors should be grateful for the increased improvement to a lot with an old building. They could have bought it if they wanted to, but they didn't. It's private property and if they wish to redevelop their own circle properties in the future, I hope similar opposition to their plans equals this, as that would be most fair. I support plan number three, and I live within a few blocks of the property. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, so I live two blocks from the Circle Church, and I'm listening to all of this. There's some new information that's coming out here. There are many uncertainties around surrounding this uh, development proper, uh, project. That's what I hear. I hear a lot of uncertainties. I hear money issues. And my goodness, how many alternatives are there? Gee, I think I heard several development alternatives. Let me count them. First, there's uh, alternative one. Then there's alternative two. And then there's this one where you almost have to be a, a twisted pretzel to get, which is called alternative three. And even when I heard a lady say alternative A, what's A? Seems like there's a lot of favors being requested here. They want A, maybe they want three, alternative three. Gee whiz. I'm in favor of alternative leave the heart of our neighborhood as it is. It's our neighborhood. We get to say something about what gets developed in the neighborhood. The city council is there to listen, not just to one side, but to everyone. And the people in this neighborhood are gathering their funds together. And uh, hopefully the church will buy it because they're a great church. And I love having a church in the heart of the West Side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, if uh, you would like to address the council on this item and you've called in, please make sure to press star nine on your phone so that your hand is raised and so that we can acknowledge you and allow you to speak to the council on this item. All right, you're on the line. Yes. Oh, 
Thank you very much. My name is uh, Eric Garcia, and I am a resident of the Circles neighborhood. And uh, my partner and I are both uh, actually in favor of preservation of the church. Uh, however, I realize tonight is about uh, considering two options uh, for development. Um, we both feel that if a development is going to happen, that the alternative uh, one with the 12 units and no condominiums is preferable as uh, it better matches with the character of the neighborhood currently. Um, there are no condominiums presently, and uh, we feel that adding condominiums would change the character of the neighborhood greatly. We do recognize that there's definitely a need for um, increased affordable housing in the city and county of Santa Cruz. However, we feel that uh, in the heart of the west side in the Circles neighborhood is not the appropriate location for that development. Um, we, yes, that, uh, I'm going to ask my partner, do you have anything to add? Nope, that is, uh, those are our comments. Thank you very much for your consideration. All right, thank you. Hi. 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 Um, Hi, I'm Brett Packer's son and uh, uh, one of the developers, the big scary ones. And I'm a resident of the Circles community. I was born here. I live at 326 Wilk Circle in the old rundown farmhouse. And um, I, I really just wanted to talk about how amidst this coronavirus pandemic and economic collapse, what we really need is options. And we're considering three, well, three really plans here. And option three is just clearly what we need to approve because, A, it, it allows for the ability if they have the funds, which they may not because think about it, the eco economy is collapsing. So it allows for the option for both the 12 single family ha homes and for the option of a higher density housing, which is also needed in Santa Cruz. Um, and also uh, for the renting it out thing, it's private property. I don't know if that's even legal, really. And just, yeah, it's private property, private property rights, all that jazz. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one speaker left. So if you've called in and you'd like to speak to us on this item, please press star nine on your phone. Um, and it looks like a couple more people have joined us. Hello. All right, you have uh, two minutes. Welcome. Hi, uh, are, am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, hi, my name is Barbara Benish. I'm at the end of Woodrow on Westcliff. Um, I am supporting to keep uh, the Circles Church. It's been a part of this community, as you know. You've heard the arguments for 130 years. Um, I wanted to speak tonight for the people who are not able to speak out. Um, as you know, it's been a very antagonistic um, uh, dialogue between the two groups for two years now. I invited everyone over to my place in the beginning. We tried to talk it out. Um, there are many elderly and um, disenfranchised people in our neighborhood. Um, that's why it's so diverse, it's so great, that cannot, um, don't even know how to work the internet, so they are not able to speak up. So I would like to put out a voice for them, for the people who really want to keep the church. It is part of this community. Um, we have a plan, we, we want to keep it as a community space. It will be privatized, we will never get a park back in the center of the circles. We will never have a uh, civic society in the center of the circles with this group who's moving in. And we will never have um, all the, the benefits and, and the intangible uh, greatness that has brought the community of the West Side together um, for over 100 years if we lose this space. So, we, we, we ask you to please investigate how this sale happened in the beginning. We're not sure it was the culture and um, all the steps that have gone into it to make this happen um, are a little bit um, wobbly. So we question that. Thank you. Thank you. 
you. And next caller, you're on the line. Hello, uh, my name is John Sears and I have lived in the circles for over 43 years. I've not given much thought to either of these proposals because the crux of the problem for the neighborhood and community is the proposed demolition of the Circle Church. The Garfield Park Circles neighborhood was designed over 130 years ago to invite and facilitate gathering at the center. It was an amazingly successful di design that served the uh, that invitation, even as placeholders uses, uses came and went, the Victorian Tabernacle, the city park, and the current church. The proposed development will signal the end of that successful design. The community design sections of the general plan list a number of relevant goals that are absent in the staff report. CD415 states, maintain the visual prominence of important city landmarks and destinations as viewed from major circulation routes and public viewpoints when possible. The Circle Church is the most visible church in the city next to Holy Cross and the only one anchoring a grand boulevard visible from West Cliff. Despite having been built by a relatively poor neighborhood, its relationship with the width and alignment of Woodrow, its vernacular adaption of a design obviously inspired by the city hall, its great sphinx-like gaze along Woodrow beholding land, sea, and sky uh, speak of a sophistication not addressed in pronouncements of its worth or worthiness in the application or planning report. The church is self-evidently a monumental structure scaled to a neighborhood of small lots consistent with general plan design goals. No matter how sensitively designed the proposed housing, the monument and the invitation to freely gather in harmony with the church and its many amenities will be lost forever. Please, whatever the council's choice is as the favored plan, let's give further thought to the demolition itself. CD416 from the city code encourages rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of architecturally significant buildings rather than demolition. First, let's do no harm. Thank you. Okay, so if there's anyone else who's on the line who would like to speak on this item, please press star nine on your phone now to raise your hand. Um, and then we, and uh, we'll go to the next caller. Okay, you're on the line. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can, good evening. Okay, uh, my name is Joseph Combs. Um, I'm part of the Circle of Friends and I grew up here and I'm pretty excited to make this happen. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to address, so I wanna talk about the co-housing community and it being tied to us building our houses. Um, Co-housing is not determined by a building. We are setting aside a 10,000 square foot area where we can meet and have barbecues and have community there. Um, I think that by tying that to our building permits, it potentially hinder us uh, from building housing in a timely manner. Um, the COVID is a real thing and we don't know how that's gonna affect us. So we just want the most flexibility. We want the building and we're 100% gonna build it. Like this is our plan. Um, but to tie it to our building permits just could potentially be a problem in the future. Um, and we also have a plan for sharing that with the community. Um, and the plan is to have uh, anybody in our co-housing uh, community can have people come to them. And if it's sponsored by one of us, we will have events. So, and that's not limited 20 year, it can be as many as we want. But um, we plan to open this up to the people and have a good time there. We've been talking with World Dance and Santa Cruz Yoga already. We plan to have classes, we plan to have community events. Uh, this is a real thing. Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about is one of the conditions about garage setbacks. Um, we've been talking with staff for two years about positioning our garages away from the view sheds, because those are very important. Uh, Woodrow, California, and Young Love. But the condition that sets garages 20 feet back from the street there, it wouldn't really be a problem with a square-shaped lot. But with our pie-shaped lots, it bottlenecks our housing, and it, it creates a really bad design problem. And uh, Ruin our, ruin our, am I am I done? I got a minute still. So. That's that time's up. Sound so. Okay, thank you. Great comments. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate you guys. All right. Okay. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to 
us on this item. If so, please press star nine on your phone. Okay, seeing no additional members of the public who would like to address us on this item, I'm gonna bring it back to council for action and deliberation. Um, and I just wanted to start by thanking all the people who have come out to speak to us on this item. This item has been before us a number of times and uh, we've been trying to do our best to ensure that the members of the public have had an opportunity for their voices to be heard. Um, the city council has sent this to the Historic Preservation Commission for review. It's come back to council uh, when we were able to allow the public to speak on that as well as gone to the Planning Commission, and now it's here before us today. Um, and, you know, the unfortunate thing is that there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of emotion around this project, and I think many of us could see this in a lot of different ways. Personally, uh, when I heard that this um, building got sold and a project was being proposed, I very much was hoping, you know, to see this as a community center and maintain the, historic, the community space that it's represented for a lot of people for a long time. But um, the reality is that this was private property that was sold from one person to a group of people who now are um, gonna be in a position to decide which way it's going forward. Um, it's unfortunate the city wasn't in a position to purchase this building. We definitely aren't now as we're in uh, going into a really bad recession. And while this is a very difficult decision, we're trying to do our best to weigh uh, what's the best um, option that we can provide for our community and also for the group who um, has purchased the property and is, um, has their application before us today. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, council members. And so currently we have council member Brown, followed by council member Matthews. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody who has been working very diligently to try to figure out how to move this project forward. Also to community members who have been working really hard to figure out how to maintain a community benefit uh, with attached to the site. And I really appreciate the, the effort that the applicants have made to move the project forward. And I totally understand the challenges that you're faced with and the additional challenges now. Um, that uncertainty has got to be very, very difficult to, to kind of think about moving forward in. Um, and I'm, I'm not opposed to the request to consider an alternative way to, of thinking about how to achieve those additional units that makes it more financially feasible. In fact, I would support that because I think that um, looking at six smaller lots rather than one uh, lot with multifamily housing with a condo so that it would be more compatible with the neighborhood. And so, you know, I, I'm inclined to support that. Um, but I also have, you know, I feel uncomfortable about making a decision uh, based on, uh, you know, kind of a last minute change uh, material that, you know, we're not really looking at that plan. Um, although it sounds great. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I wanna um, just see if I can, it might help me uh, figure out, you know, get a little more comfortable with how to proceed here. So um, Tony, um, I wanted to ask you um, and maybe uh, for Lee as well, um, we've, we've heard kind of this, uh, this sense that um, we must approve something tonight. Um, and I don't believe that's the case. I. I and I'm not saying this because I want to delay, I'm just asking the question. Um, my understanding is we do not need to approve something tonight. We do need to approve something. Um, and so if you could clarify that, that would be helpful. Yes, uh, under the Housing Accountability Act, um, there, are, there are a limited number of hearings that the council can have in order to meet the requirements of moving projects forward as the as the statute is intended to do, it's intended to constrain a city's ability to indefinitely delay taking action on a project. So that's part A. Um, part B is that if it meets all of the objective standards that are set forth in our regulations, then the project is similarly constrained. Um, I will turn it over to the planning director, but I do not believe that we have um, used up the number of hearings that were, in eight, that were allowed to 
have in order to uh, meet the requirements of the Housing Accountability Act? That's correct. The uh, Housing Accountability Act specifies that no more than five public hearings can occur um, on a project. That includes the Planning Commission. That's actually after a project is deemed complete. Um, arguably, the Council's December, or excuse me, uh, February meeting, um, while it wasn't directly on the project, it did happen after the um, application was complete. And so arguably that could be, even considering that, the council could uh, continue the project um, should they see fit. Um, obviously the uh, applicant is interested in, in getting an approval now um, for um, something. Um, that, is, that is their goal and they've, they've stated that. Um, so uh, you do have the discretion to continue it uh, this evening should you choose to do so. Thank you. My second question is for uh, the circle of friends uh, regarding uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm wondering uh, because I, you know, I'm inclined to support, and I was, you know, had studied up and was, uh, you know, had, had read the record and uh, listened to the planning commission, um, and so I was, you know, really focused on alternative one, and I because the other application was withdrawn. Um, so my sense was that that was w what you really wanted. Um, and now that we've received this additional information and suggestion, um, I'm just wondering if um, you are, and I know that there is the possibility of looking at administrative uh, approval for the for the changes, the potential modifications. But I really feel like this is the council's responsibility to make that decision. And so I'm wondering if um, you have an interest in trying to work through uh, with the planning department uh, the kind of more detail on this alternative to alternative two, this variation, which um, council member Matthew said she didn't want to get lost. I don't want it to get lost either. Um, is there a way to kind of sort some of that out and come back to us at the next council meeting? You know, again, I, I have no interest in delaying this. I think, you know, you've waited for a long time. You've jumped through many, many hoops. But I do feel like the council has um, a responsibility to, uh, you know, to really consider that, to, to deliberate, you know, very, be very deliberate about our deliberations. And it's hard to do that when you just see something on a slide right before. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering for, that's one question, like would it be okay to um, bring this back to council for approval in two weeks? Would you feel better about us just approving alternative one? Um, you know, it's a little unusual to be asked to, um, look, you know, approve two. So I'm gonna, I think this is kind of an unusual question to ask you to say what your preference would be approving, if, it, if the choices were approving alternative one tonight or um, uh, uh, continuing this to our next meeting uh, to see uh, the uh, tentative map and uh, plan development application that reflects the changes that you've suggested for the increased density. So that's one question. And then the second is uh, related to the construction of a community building. Um, I understand the, the, um, the tying that to building permits or the timing uh, could make this, make it very difficult. And I understand the financial challenges you're facing, but you also have said that you um, fully intend to build uh, community building. And I'm just wondering if there's something that you can think of that you would support to provide us, the city with some assurance that that will happen uh, because Right now, um, good intentions, but you know, there's there's nothing to to tie anything to um, that actually happening, and so it, it very well could might not. Um, so those are my two kind of uh, questions for the the developers for Circle of Friends. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm going to unmute the Circle of Friends representatives so they can weigh in. Are right, you on the line? Hi, this is Brett Packer. Uh, thanks for those questions, Sandy. So in terms of the timing, you know, we've been at this diligently for two and a half years now, worked very closely with planning staff, been through many, many meetings uh, with staff, 
three different council, city councils, um, and down a historical rabbit hole that cost us three months and tens of thousands of dollars. And right now we're facing the COVID-19 crisis, we're facing a housing crisis, and um, the changes that we're asking for as, as part of um, alternative two, from a six unit condo to six unit um, airspace condo are, are very minor and actually um, will um, impact the, the neighborhood less. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're broken up into small bits instead of mass buildings. So we, we very much request that you approve. We need the flexibility right now. These are really challenging times and there's a challenging project without a COVID-19 situation. And with it, it's extremely challenging. Um, and we don't know what the future lies and things are happening very quickly. Um, we're kind of, we're at the end of our spring, our line. Um, so we would request that you approve um, definitely alternative one tonight. And we think it's good for the city and the, the, um, the overall community to approve both so that we have some more flexibility so that we can move on to create what's best for the city. And that, that two weeks makes a huge difference to us. I, I can't get into the depths of that, but it's very important to us. Um, on the second question of the center building, um, you know, this is about this is about our community building, and um, that building is very important to us. We're all very active in the community. There's a lot of um, things that we do that we want to bring to this circle and to the center, and a building will make it um, even better. But if we have to do it on a deck or a lawn for a couple of years till we can get there to a building while we build our homes, that's what we'll do. And when we have the means to build the building, we will. Um, this is a long-term project. This place is gonna be here as a co-housing community for another 130 years. Um, so if we were to put conditions on us building that building, I'd like to see something like five years for us to get that built. And we. Uh, and all I can say is we, we intend to build it, I believe, with uh, the residents around it that are all part of the um, COA, or not COA, sorry. I've been doing this a lot lately. Um, the HOA, there eventually will be the resources that we can pool together to get it built. But off the bat, right now, we're challenged to build houses, and we want to get ourselves and our families into these houses as soon as we can, and then recover from that. Uh, try to get some ADUs built, so it's not just the building in the center, it's the houses, the ADUs, um, and then we can start thinking about getting a building built. And uh, But it, it, not having a building will not keep us from reaching out to the community and um, having community events happen here and keeping our co-housing group from meeting in that center space. Thank you. Thank you. So I, if I could just follow up, Brett, with one more question um, about that, the center parcel there, because I'm, as I read the conditions for alternative one in um, condition 19, there is a provision that um, the center lot, um, it, the development shall, um, you'll share equal ownership um, between the, the single family parcels and that it shall not be sold separately or developed with a single family house. And um, in our conversation, it sounded like you um, were, you know, had tossed around the idea of, um, of selling those lots for continued community use if needed. And so I'm just wondering if leaving that in, um, we, I haven't heard anything about it, so I just wanted to ask you to weigh in on that. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of selling those lots to continue community use. 
So, it, so well, you. I think you said something about the, you know, potentially the gym if somebody else wanted to operate the gym. Um, and so I, I'm just. I think I thought I heard that. Maybe I heard you wrong um, yeah. earlier today um, when we were talking. That that is that is something we've considered, and as we move forward. Um, It's it's unlikely. It's it's challenging from a planning perspective, um, and th there's many problems associated with it around parking. And um, so at, at this point, we're not considering that. We we are very interested in providing a space for the community to gather in our center space, and we'll do that. Um, Based on, like we said, you know, sponsorship or groups that we're already involved with, or and if neighbors want to ask us for um, to do something on the site, we're totally open to that and supportive of that. Um, but at this point, we're not trying to do anything with the gym as it is, or the okay. church. So just to be clear, then the the bullet point in condition 19 that w prohibits that lot from being sold separately. Um, is is okay from your perspective? Absolutely, because that refers okay. to the center circle. Okay, thank yeah. you. So um, I think those are all my questions. I, I you know, I just want to, while I have the uh, floor, I, I want to just say again that I have some really serious concerns. I just do not feel comfortable approving uh, alternative to, so, uh, you know, option three, which would include both of those alternatives um, with kind of the vague notion that it may be a condos or it may end up being something else. It just doesn't, you know, I just, I can't, I, I can't support that tonight. I um, am prepared to support um, the, you know, alternative one and, um, I am. I'd be prepared to support alternative two if we could. If we could get that, if something could come back to us for the council to approve, rather than leaving it in the hands. I mean, we're essentially abdicating our responsibility here and delegating authority to the planning staff. And I know that they are very familiar with the project and you know much closer to it. But it is the council's responsibility to make those land use decisions, and we're. It's our responsibility to do that based upon. Uh, you know, the general plan and zoning so on the law and the, our interpretation of the law. So I, I just feel really uncomfortable with that. I would um, make a motion that we uh, approve um, alternative one. And I'm just going to go through here. Uh, um, with a uh, change to uh, condition 34, which is um, the, the planning staff had the language. Um, this is to take out the um, July 24th date that's being acceptable um, to the language that staff provided uh, regarding a, an agreement to pay the in low fee by a certain date. And so I don't know if you want to pull that up, um, Lee or Ryan, whoever has control of that. Um, okay. Ryan should be able to pull that up. And uh, Mayor, if I could, um, in response to your comment, uh, Councilmember Brown, you know, we've got in this uh, draft condition that a minor modification would be required to redesign the common infrastructure and site layout. You know, that could be changed to a design permit that goes to a zoning administrator hearing. Um, you know, we have quite a few um, multifamily projects throughout the city that go through that process. Some are approved administratively. Um, some go to a uh, public hearing. If it's desirous of the council, you could say a design permit that goes to a zoning administrator hearing. That would then have the appealability uh, to the planning commission and the council. The minor modification um, also is appealable to the planning commission and the council. However, um, it's not publicly noticed, and so there is that distinction there. So. Um, uh, just as an option for you to consider, I, I thought I would mention that. Thank you. 
Okay, so if I could, um, so uh, requiring a design permit for um, the minor modification to alternative two, um, we could say that that must go to the zoning administrator. And so we couldn't say that that must come to the council for approval of those modifications. Okay. I would say you could because these original approvals have gone through the council. Um, that could be something that you um, that you include. Okay, so um, if we could just look at the um, thank you, that's that's helpful. Um, so if we could look at the uh, language um, to substitute for the in lieu fee deadline of July twenty fourth. Um, I think that was the last slide you had on inclusionary. Can you see that? Yeah. Ooh, it's re yeah, it's really small. Yeah. Um, I can open it, I can make it bigger. Um, okay, hold, hold up. Um, so if I had a magnifying glass. Um, okay, so um, an in lieu fee, so the applicant shall enter into an agreement whereby the total in lieu fee amount, due date, and remedies are specified in accordance with the state local housing trust fund program guidelines and the inclusionary housing. Sorry, I'm having a really hard time reading this. It's like so small. Um, Anyway, so you, the, so this language here, um, subbing the, the July 24th deadline with this uh, language, um, and then uh, a change to, and a couple of uh, members of the public mentioned this but, and said that it was condition 48, but I believe it's condition 47, um, uh, a, a changing the condition number 47 to read a demolition permit to demolish the church shall be issued no earlier than concurrently with the issuance of the first building permit um, rather than the um, grading permit and uh, so that's the first part in terms of uh, alternative one and then I guess part two of the motion would be to um, uh, direct, so it would be um, directing staff uh, to return with the details of a uh, minor modification to alternative two at the next council meeting uh, for, uh, for consideration by the council. I would just say that the applicants aren't going to have it ready by the next council meeting. You know, that's going to take a substantial amount of design work. I, I would call that out as a, um, a, a future council meeting just to okay. provide flexibility for them um, if, if that pleases the council and the maker of the motion. Okay. Yeah, sure. At a future council meeting. Um, I guess I just want to make sure that we get to see the because the, they don't sound so minor to me I understand that technically they could be categorized that way but um, you know it would be nice to be able to see that before we um, agree to final approval so yes instead of the next council meeting uh, at a future council meeting let's see I'm gonna see if I capture that okay so we have a motion by council member Brown just to approve um, Alternative one with changes to condition 24, 30, 24. That's correct. To take out the July 24th date. I think that was condition, condition 34. I think it's 34, yeah. Yeah, to take out the July 24th date. Sorry, yeah, 34. Uh, utilize the staff's language for paying in lieu fees for alternative one. Here's where it gets a little confusing. Um, design permit review, is that, is that for, is that part of, a part of part two? Because yes. Okay. Yeah. So part one, 
We'll have the, the alternative one, change the condition 34, take out the July 24th date, utilize the staff language for paying the in lieu fees, condition the permit demolition, condition the demolition permit be concurrent with the first building permit. And then for part two, to direct staff to work with the developers on the minor modifications for alternative two to return to the council at a future meeting for consideration. Yep. That's correct? Yep. I saw council members' hands up previously, but I'm not sure if any one of those uh, yeah. would come yeah. Mine was up. <laughs> Matthew's headers up before. There, there's three folks in mind. Um, I guess what I'm asking is anyone who has a second, I'd be happy to second this item. Um, but there are other council members with their hands up. So is there a second? Does anyone who have their hand up want to make a second to the motion? I'd like to make a comment. Sure. I would like a comment. Okay. Um, I appreciate this as far as it goes. I think it needs more work. I personally feel strongly that I would like to proceed with approving both options before us. Um, and I'm not sure I can support this uh, now because I think it's uh, too limited. I'd like to make other comments as well, but I would like other council members to consider whether they do want to move forward with approving alternative one and two, each with their own uh, refinements. That's, that is the direction I'd like to go tonight. Um, if there are other comments before, or if there's someone, I was like, as I mentioned before, I'm happy to second this, but seeing the other hands up, I'll move over to Council Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I'd also like to, um, you know, the staff, I believe, made a compelling argument, both the, the Planning Commission agenda report and, uh, and materials, and um, also has uh, really, I think, convinced me of the importance of alternative two. Um, I'm glad to hear that the um, applicants are also willing to look at alternative two and the flexibility that could be built into that um, for maximizing the potential for um, additional affordable housing as part of that. I feel um, that the applicants have worked really hard to get where we are, um, delaying the decision um, with the intent um, to see, especially without even a, a, a scheduled return date, feels very problematic. I think that the applicants um, have designed the project according to our codes. Uh, and I feel like we really need to um, think, think about supporting them in making, um, coming back with, uh, you know, something that's going to work um, to build housing on the site and get affordable housing on the site. And um, yeah, I'd really, I'd really like to um, basically intending to make a motion to support um, to, to support getting alternative one and alternative two approved tonight so that um, the project can move forward. So um, I feel like we're losing an opportunity, frankly, right now in uh, causing further delay. Thank you. Councilmember Byers and then myself and then Councilmember Watkins. Um, I, I may need to uh, get Brett up, but uh, if I, for me, item two, if we just change from condominiums to that idea of the little houses, which would be a, more affordable, I could just approve them both tonight. But uh, if I have to, you know, uh, the idea of a condominium project is what's stumbling me. And um, actually, would, Brett, would you get on the phone or? However, you talk. I can talk to you. Can you do that? Is it Eric? Who Who was it that you wanted on the phone, Catherine? The applicant. The applicant. Okay. Hi, right, Brett. You're on the line. Hi, this is Brett. Hi, Catherine. Hey, hi. Uh, 
Where I stumble on two, to me two is like one, except a major thing, which is that condominium project. And I know you at least more than once, and I think you even mentioned tonight that uh, you were looking at having these much smaller, maybe attached, maybe not attached. That would make all the difference to me, rather than a condominium project, to approve alternative two, because then it would be um, one and two would be alike. I mean, it would be the same thing. Uh, with ADUs and those little small houses that I think you showed or I saw drawings of. So I, I don't know, uh, and maybe planning staff could weigh in on that, whether that, if you're thinking of doing that, could somehow that be done tonight? Could we have a second motion to instruct you to only get rid of the condos and do that if there are votes for it. There may not be votes for it, I don't know. But I think that would really move this whole project along much faster. Um, yeah, go ahead. yeah, so I'll answer that. I'm not sure about the um, protocol for saying approve um, alternative two, is, but just have it approved the the little single uh, mini lot townhouses. So our intention, if we go ahead with alternative two, is to try to work something out with staff and, and through design and uh, to do those mini lot townhomes. Um, we're not interested in building the six unit condos at all period, we have no interest in that, and that's why we took it off the table. But we're very interested in building the small townhomes on the mini lots and think it could be good for the city and the community and provide more housing and, and meet the goals that I think everybody's trying to achieve here. Um, we just can't deal with the financial uh, resources required to build the condos as a chunk right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is is that um well wow, that's it that's, that's okay. my answer to that question. thank you um i i, I need lee uh, maybe lee and tony both the two of them to guide we just heard from the applicant they won't do you know they prefer not to do they probably won't do condos but they'd like to do these little houses how can we get there so the condition that we have provided actually offers that. Um, the question is um, not necessarily, it, it doesn't sound like you're actually opposed to condominiums, even though that's what you said specifically. Um, <laughs> if they are small, yes. Even though they're, if, if they're small, um, single family detached, those can still be condominium airspaces. And in fact- Oh, I understand, yes. Yeah, I'm that's about design. Yeah. Yeah, so-, yeah. so they, they may be small single family detached units with accessory dwelling units, but the way that they're actually subdivided from a sales uh, point of view is um, a, it would be um, through airspace to condominium airspace divisions. It just wouldn't be within an individual building, they would be separate. Now, I guess the question would become, um, and um, I could ask this of uh, our uh, legal counsel, Tony, um, would we have the ability, I, I, would we have the ability to put in um, uh, the actual additional lot lines here. I think that arguably we could, but nevertheless, if we did that, we would then be putting ourselves in a position where we would also, through the plan development permit, have to be approving a substantial number of setback deviations. And w because we don't have that plan in front of us, we actually don't know what those setback deviations would be. Council could got say it. we've got zero lot lines. You know, if you divide that one parcel into six lots, you could just say, well, we're okay with zero lot lines throughout, um, but that would be approving the PD without actually seeing the changes. And that's why in the conversation with the applicant that actually happened this morning, um, we suggested that, well, you could keep that single lot, um, go to the um, detached units, and then sell off those airspace subdivisions, allowing for the, um, the individual financing of those units. Um, 
and allowing for them to be detached or potentially uh, zero, a, a functionally zero lot line. They could have, for example, um, exclusive use easement areas that are the functional equivalent of lots. There just wouldn't be an actual lot line on the ground, and that gets us around the setback. The question tonight would have to happen through the future, hopefully, it's possible with the Okay, what's that talking? Um, okay, I think that uh, I may come back to that. My only other thing I want to comment um, should should the votes be there to bring this back into uh, in the future? Um, the one thing we may be able to do is if well, this is for Tony again. If we just bring the design back, a, a very modest, what they're going to do so we can see it at the next meeting or as soon as possible, can we do without a public hearing? It, it would cut the meeting, cut the time. We simply get the report back. So and we I could. I remember do, doing this. If we've had a big public hearing on a project. Can we just shorten the meeting enormously by just having the new design come back for, that they're talking about. I believe, I believe you could, but what if, that, if that's the direction, the inclination of the council, what I would recommend is that you give that direction subject to my uh, follow-up analysis. And okay. when the meeting comes back, um, you know, if I, if I have to backtrack on that opinion, then you would have to consider additional public comment. I do not believe you would have to hear the same uh, commentary from members of the public who have already spoken to the council. But I'd want to research that one. Sure. That's not a big deal. I just, uh, it would be more efficient if we're only talking about a little piece of this major project. That's all I was doing. Right. Understood. Um, for the purposes of the process, I'm just going to second the motion that's on the floor. I am just concerned to the fact that um, it says, like, I think what we're doing right now is we're actually putting some, what seems to me is we're putting some strict conditions by saying you can do alternative one or two, because there's really no flexibility in, um, you know, if we're saying it's, it's this application or it's this alternative, those are the two things that you can do. And I think what we're trying to get to is a place where we can have that flexibility to move away from these multi-story condos and move into these, you know, single, um, either adjacently attached homes or detached homes. But what it sounds like is that although that can be conceptually um, explained as a minor change, what we are learning right now is that due to setbacks and all sorts of other conditions, we actually don't know what that can look like, and that seems like it's something that is a little complicated. And for the public, I think that one of the things that are important is that we see these maps of how these buildings are going to be laid out in space. We don't have that in front of us today. So my concern is that we're going to really constrain the developers by just saying you can do either this option or this option, and anything in between, we really don't uh, have a sense of what they can do and obviously they've already mentioned that they have financial constraints. So it seems like if we can find a way to build in that flexibility for them to bring something back of what they can financially do, um, that we wouldn't be stuck with one or the other or them just selling off a bunch of pieces of the second one because they couldn't afford it. So that's the rationale behind why I'm going to support uh, alternative number two. And uh, Lee, I know you were on here a second ago. I don't know if you want to comment on anything that was said. I'm okay, but I'm available to answer any questions or provide any comments if, if you want me to weigh in on anything. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, Council Member Brown, then Matthews, then Vice Mayor Myers. Um, yeah, so I, I just I want to try to clarify here because I, I feel a little dismayed that the response to the motion I made was suggesting that um, this is a real setback for affordable housing because I think what I'm trying to do here along the lines of what Council Member Byers and Mayor Cummings is talking are talking about is to provide the potential for that uh, higher density to happen in the way that 
um, the develop the circle of friends have suggested they they could see a way forward financially and um, kind of uh, just for themselves for their for their own interests. So I'm that's what I'm trying to get to by in making this motion, and I feel like um, it, if they have if there is the flexibility to either just Take, we've approved alternative one with a couple of conditions, well, 47 or maybe 48, depending on how um, the discussion goes, the votes go. But um, that, that's, that we'll, we're willing to approve that. We've, we've made it clear that that is acceptable. That's what many members of the community have suggested they wanted. It's what the developers suggested they wanted until this morning or last night, I guess. Um, and so it's not really taking away the potential to do that. And then the flexibility part, I think, you know, I want to, I want to be able to provide that too, but I just don't want to say, well, we're going to approve the plans, both of those plans. And that basically leaves open the possibility that they will become multi-unit condominiums. I want to try to find a way to, um, Get some assurance that a different uh, configuration will indeed be coming. So I'm okay with doing that tonight, um, but uh, as Lee um, suggests, that that does seem to require more than kind of minor uh, sorting it out. So I, I'm at this point I'm a little perplexed Would about. We to review the, the plans um, when we submit them as part of a design review. Ex sorry, what's up? Oh, that was Brett. Yeah. What did you, can you repeat what you just said? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was muted. I said, can council review the plans once we submit them? If we go ahead and approve one and two tonight and then put in the conditions that council will have the opportunity through a design review um, to review the plans before they're approved. So, um, but go ahead and approve. Alternative one and two tonight, and then council can um, review those plans before they're approved. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful. So uh, I could amend my motion, or um, you know, start over. But um, either way, I think that allowing the council to be involved in um, approving a potential uh, higher density project is important. Okay. Council members Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, and then Council Member Watkins. I'm, I'm glad to hear, Sandy, that you're open to modifying your motion. <laughs> um, as I see it, it's the design of the um, condo component that's the right. issue. Now, right. the um, conceptual designs that we've seen already really read more like a single-family house. I mean, you go downtown, you see something that looks like a single-family house, it's got four to six units in it. So, you know, it's the outside form doesn't necessarily define. But that seems to be not appealing to some people, and it's a preference, which I understand, particularly given the pattern in the circles, would be for a number of smaller houses to kind of balance out the larger single family homes. So it seems to me it's the design rather than the dividing up of the larger parcel that's the issue. Yeah. And I do believe, Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we could build in flexibility in a single motion now with the designs to come back for uh, design permits at a future time. We don't have to have the finished designs tonight. We rare for something like this. You know, we don't. So Lee, tell me if I'm wrong on that one. <laughs> You're, you're absolutely correct, and I think we could change the language um, that we proposed for that alternative condition just in a very minor way to accomplish that. Um, and uh, I, could, I could email that to Bonnie, and she could put that up on the screen if you'd like. As an option for you to consider. Because I think if that could get us to the point of approving mm -hmm. one and two, expressing mm -hmm. certainly our preference for yeah. the blue fee, <laughs> we, we've talked about that, and um, also the option for um, 
in the event that there's a an airspace development for individual units, that, that the um, uh, our preference is that that be for uh, smaller units to come back for design review. I think that's kind of where we're heading. Okay. I'll, I'll put something together. I'm also, uh, Justin, or sorry, Mayor Cummings, you're muted. Um, and I'm also hearing that the applicants would be interested in weighing in on the uh, timing of the demolition as well. So if it pleases the council, you may want to. And if I could, Lee, I'd like your opinion on that as well. Sure. The reason why we changed it, um, one of the reasons why we changed it was that, um, you know, most projects, the typical condition is um, at a building permit. Um, you know, we do not want sites sitting vacant. Um, this particular project is different in that the financing is going to occur in a different manner. Um, the financing is, is, you know, for a large project, it could fall through. It could take some time before we um, actually see a, uh, a building get built. Um, in this instance, you know, there's an expectation that some of those single-family homes, there will be an ability to get financing for some of the single, at least one of the single-family homes. And there are a series of steps that, that uh, we need to go through um, in terms of surveying and so forth um, in advance of the construction of the single-family homes actually occurring. Um, I'd like to see um, Eric, our assistant director, Eric Marlat, if, if he wants to weigh in any more on that as well. But that, that was part of the reasoning why we had shifted that. You, you're muted, Eric. I'll try. There you go. You're good. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor, council members. Um, the other concern with the, uh, the condition is worded and tying it to the building permit is that there's a certain sequencing that needs to happen to get the map recorded. So um, lots need to be surveyed, um, utilities need to be installed, and it'd be very difficult to um, do all that work with the building in place. So um, it, our thought is that um, by tying it to a grading permit, the applicants are far enough along to where um, we have pretty good insurance that that lot's not going to sit vacant for an extended period of time. Um, they've invested in the grading and, and the infrastructure, and so that's why we ended up changing the condition the way we did. All right, uh, so Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm encouraged by our conversation now. I, I feel like we're we're heading heading towards a good. Um, I had a question, Lee, regarding the. Um, so if we are looking at revising the language on the alternative to for the motion, um, where would the where would the review of those additional we can call them cottages or what would they be, uh, what, whatever they may be, um, would that come back during the design permit? Are you mentioned going to the zoning uh, administrator. I'm just trying to figure out, do we need to put that sequencing into the motion? Um, I might have some additions potentially for Sandy to consider or Council Member Brown to consider if, if um, I'm just not quite sure on the sequencing. Um, and how to make the motion reflect that intent in terms of having potential for council review of that. So I could structure it at the pleasure of the council. Um, if the council would like to see that as a design permit that comes back as a public hearing, then I could do that. If they would like to see that um, that comes with where it comes back to the council and the council. Um, uh, considers that outside of a public hearing. That was the question that Tony had weighed in on earlier, saying, you know, we could potentially do that. Um, you know, there's, there is a small amount of time savings in terms of the um, potential noticing associated with that. 
Um, and then, you know, that, that's sort of one end of the spectrum. We could also go back, you know, it could be administrative, it could be uh, zoning administrator, it could be planning commission, or it could be council. And um, I can structure the, the condition at the, the council's pleasure. So my understanding, um, Council Member Brown, would be that if we if we were able to work on the language on alternative two, which right now, um, just working from the staff report, would be to include a residential slash commercial demolition, demolition authorization permit to demolish a church, um, to complete a planned development permit to allow variations such as multifamily housing in the R1 zone district and um, I would take out, I would strike out the language referring to the six condominium units unless that's required. Um, the, I would change that to and with minor modifications as allowable under the code. Um, the next thing would be the design permit. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I, and, and the, let me ask this question. Um, with this sequence of events um, approval tonight, would the applicants continue to, to, to be able to keep moving rather than having to come back? I know they might have to come back if we do this as a council decision for that final design, but can they keep moving through, for example, to the design permit have, that might be the place, um, Council Member Brown, that maybe we do have them come back. I just hate to see them continue down too far and, um, you know, have, meet, a, meet an issue at the, at, the, at the last minute. So I'm just trying to see where you might have um, some, and, and uh, council member buyers, I think, I think you're thinking the same way. So I'm just trying to put this into the sheriff of that yeah. in a place. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Council Member Brown, do you have thoughts on that? I'm just working off of the description on the top of the of the uh, agenda report, which is right. um, details out this sequence. I right. typed it for myself. That's why I'm looking up. <laughs> I know. I have to look down. So yeah, I so I um, I agree. I guess uh, so. A couple of comments before we, um, and then I'll let other people weigh in. You know, I, I think that that makes sense in terms of the, so there's this challenge then, and I'd love to hear um, Lee, if you want to weigh in on, on the timing and sequencing, because if the next time that we, the council weighs in on it, should the, um, my colleagues agree that's important, if that's a design review, then they, the applicants have made it pretty far down the road. So um, with the potential for the council to um, then continue to tinker with it. So I, I mean, I guess if that's acceptable, um, then I'm, I'm fine with doing it that way. I just feel like um, leaving, it, leaving the possibility that it would, it would just be the condos is, uh, and multi, mil, mul, sorry, not condos, multifamily, uh, rather than the um, smaller cottages is, I, you know, I just don't want to leave that un, totally um, up in the air. And so the other thing that I'm, um, I'm just trying to kind of wrap my mind around the, um, the process for that, because I know Lee, you said that it doesn't, it could, it could happen with one lot. It doesn't need to be subdivided. But what I've heard, what I heard from the developers was, um, or the circle of friends, I keep saying developers, but the, um, the applicants um, that they want, they, the flexibility would be in the ability to sell off those parcels and, um, and then uh, gift the potentially up three of them to Habitat for Humanity. So um, I guess that, so I, I just wanna get clarification on that because um, if, if it, it, leaving it as one lot is not going to achieve that with their goal. So it, it would, um, and it's atypical. It's certainly atypical. To usually you would see those ground lots, um, but they could proceed with the sale of um, of airspace rights and say, all right, we're going to sell you the airspace rights for 
lot one or, or airspace one, excuse me, I don't want to call them a lot, <laughs> for airspace okay. one um, or airspace two or airspace three on that lot or four or five or six, and then they could come forward um, with that. Now, the one thing that um, is somewhat challenging related to this is the, uh, the developer, you know, we, we could, for example, say, um, come forward with a um, design permit showing the new uh, site layout, and it could have building envelopes. I think in conversations with the developer, they wanted to kind of preserve their ability to have individuals design their own homes on mm -hmm. those lots. And so that could be done with subsequent design permits, similar to what we're doing with the design permits for the, um, the single-family homes in, uh, on the single-family detached lots. Um, so that could uh, have the same thing, and then the council could um, review and approve just the site layout um, and um, take that into consideration. Got it. Okay. So um, I'll leave it there for now. But yes, um, count, uh, Vice Mayor Myers, I, my, I'm, I'm trying to move forward with the <laughs> along with you there. So um, we'll, we'll come back around. Uh, we have uh, we have Matthews Brown. I think we have to lower people's hands. Oh yes. Um, no, we're at um, Council Member Watkins, Byers, and then I have a couple of comments as well. Well, I'd like to ask the um, maker and seconder of the motion: Are you moving now to being inclusive of both uh, alternate one and two? the direction we're headed now. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm open to that, uh, assuming we can add in the language uh, that the this would return to council with, for design review and um, Lee you just said something that is now and um, looking at um, uh, it's not a <laughs> Site, site plan, site, so site plan and design review um, back and to the council. My own personal feeling is that um, probably the council doesn't need to do the design review for every single one, that that could be done at the CA level. Otherwise, oh my God, every single one. You know? And we've seen the aesthetic that the uh, circle of friends are aiming for um, both in um, the uh, draft images that they present, their, their discussion of the project, even the images that they showed of what were to be the condos were a traditional look. And so um, I think, you know, they are hearing this discussion, planning staff is hearing this discussion, and um, I think we could have the review happen at uh, a lower level. I don't think it has, every single structure has to come to the city council. So uh, Lee has said that could occur at, at any level. I think it's probably appropriate that it occur at a level that has public noticing, but not a lot of necessarily high drama associated with each one. That would be my suggestion, Heather. If I could chime in as well, it sounds like the site plan mm -hmm. what, what would need to come back to council, and the design review could potentially go to planning commission, because if it's at the individual um, structure as well. Or even VA, even yeah. yeah. I would comment that the the current conditions of approval r require administrative design permits for the larger uh, single-family homes. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, obviously it's the council's discretion. I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that the conditions are currently structured that it's administrative review for the single-family right. homes. I'm drafting something up. I'll get it to you shortly. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send a. I'm going to send something to. I'm just sending something right now to. Sorry to interrupt, Mayor. And I'm. I just want to add uh, one additional condition. It sounds like it came up, which uh, I think would be helpful for the community. And it sounds like the um, the applicants brought it up. But with respect to the community building, um, the applicant mentioned that they could potentially have that up in five years. And so one of the conditions I think that may be amenable to the community and to the applicants is that we build in that they um, construct the community building within five years with the possibility 
of a one-time extension not to exceed three years. And further extension would need to be approved by the city council. So if we can include that in the language as well, so that if they can build it within between now and in five years, that'd be great. If they can't, they can apply for one extension. And then if they need more time than that, then they have to re they have to come back to the city council. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay. fair. So. Um, okay, I'll keep going down the list. So we have Council Member Watkins is next, and then Council Member Byers. Okay, thank you. I keep raising my hand, lowering my hand, because my questions keep getting asked and answered. But I do want to see if possible, Lee, and I know that you've been working on what the motion would look like about how to reconcile this. So for me, I feel like I need to see sort of visually where we're at in terms of our options and what the next steps could be to reconcile the two. Sure. Um, I am just about done with the specific condition. I'll email that over to, the bon to Bonnie and um, we can uh, get that put up on the screen for you. And I'm specifically working on the additional condition that was added in relation to um, going to a detached condominium or some other alternative configuration. So I'll get that to you momentarily and then you can wordsmith that as you see fit. Thank you. And I did just send a, a draft of the motion. I don't know, Lee, those should sync up. I sent it to you and Bonnie and, and Council Member Brown. Lee, do you, do you guys want me to put it up now? Sure. Sure. And then next up is Council Member Byers followed by Matthews. Mine is real quick. I think it, uh, as I get it, um, planning department is going to um, do a site plan that we will see and approve, and then the design of all the units will be approved by the planning staff. So it will come to us, as the big houses are going to be. So I think we already covered that. I'm sure it's in your motion, Donna. I think so. <laughs> Let's see. It's a truly well, we'll a find out. <laughs> and maybe that doesn't uh, have to I be. don't see it. I just yeah, sent I mean, you, Bonnie, I just sent you the additional thing, so you may want to take a look at that. Bonnie, I don't know if you can edit this for us. It's hard to do on Zoom, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> so the site map, um, Lee, would be the tentative map. I'm not seeing the word t site map, so I'm just trying to translate into some of the terminology in the motion. <sighs> Or would what, that be uh, during the design permit? Sorry, go ahead, Captain. Well, I think uh, Lee should be able to frame that motion. I mean, add it. I think, as he said, we, uh, the applicant needs to do a site visit or a, a site. Yeah. If I could just, while we're waiting, it. it I think it may make more sense to just withdraw my motion and kind of work off of this other one because they're so different now that it's just going to get more confusing. So if you're, if my second is okay with that, we'll just withdraw it and get a new motion to work off of. I'm fine to me. So, All right. yeah. uh, so for the record, motion was withdrawn by um, Council Member Brown and Calvin Mayor Cummings. Does that mean that Vice Mayor Myers is now proposing this motion? I guess there's no motion on the floor, so if someone is willing to make yeah. a motion. I would I would like to make that motion. Sorry, I'm, uh, uh, I didn't have my hand up, so sorry. This is very hard to do with with all the hand raising, but I'm happy to make the motion or, or Mayor, I think Mayor Watkins is understanding where we're heading to. <laughs> she has the floor, so sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't mean to take the floor. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> was trying to get clarity on the process because I know that you sent this motion over. If you do want to make the motion, I'm happy to second it. Okay, I will make the motion um, that was just previously put up, which basically monuments what, or, or reflects the language in the um, recommendation, 
with the changes that, I'm sorry, Lee, I just don't know how to write into the motion what we need to be doing. So I'm, that's where I'm struggling, um, where to put that in. So I'm looking at your language here. Um, is this language here, Lee, what you would propose that we put into the motion well, um, for is, alternative two? This or is, is this what a I condition? This was a condition of approval that I was uh, aiming to. I was uh, I was aiming to capture the essence of what the council was talking about with this. So, it sounded like you did not want to have the the current design, um, and so I changed the may from shall. You wanted to have a review of the common infrastructure and site layout at the council. So that was the second change. And then the third change there is identifying that uh, design, administratively approved design permit shall be required right. for individual condominium units. Okay. I think that was your intent, Kathy, yeah. too? Yeah. Right? Okay. yeah, that was fine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's that's saying the planning department will approve the design. Yeah. Right. But we'll, right. Look at the, we'll look at the site map. The layout, the infrastructure, the common area. So right. here's where the, the common driveway would be. Um, here's where we would expect the building footprints for each of these condominium units. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lee, I could I just rep sorry, go ahead. I think, uh, Aaron here, I think that second sentence, my understanding was that the site plan shall be considered and approved by the council at a later date. Yeah. On the common infrastructure and site layout and administrative approved design permit. So I think that we would need to strike design mm -hmm. in that second sentence, and that would be a site plan. Site plan. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, could that continues that? to say that the, the site layout, so essentially the site plan. Um, you could do that through a minor modification. A minor modification shall be considered and approved by the council. Um, if you don't want to do a, a full uh, design permit, that would be another option. Well, I think we decide not to do, council would do the design. We would look at the site planning site department plan. to do that. Right, so, so a design permit could um, approve the site layout, or you could have a minor modification approve the site layout. Which is the... Keep it easy. Minor yeah, make it easy. Minor modification. modification. With sure. minor mod, okay. So you wouldn't strike that right. Right. How would yeah. you work that then, Lee? Uh, I would just change design permit to minor modification. Yeah, there you go. That that could stay as a design permit. Yes, that other part, yeah. That would be consistent with what we have for the other single family homes on the site. So my understanding then is that where we're at, this is one piece of a bigger motion. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Matthews, you have your hand up. Yeah, I want to get back, since the original motion's been withdrawn, I'd like to get back to the poor motion, <laughs> the big original motion, which the big is, motion. Yeah. Uh, I think what we're talking about, where people seem to be headed is, um, um, a resolution acknowledging the environmental determination and approving uh, both alternative one and alternative two. Am I headed in the right direction there, Lee? <laughs> yeah, so far, so good. Um, which includes a residential commercial demolition authorization permit that has to happen in either case. Um, and then this is where I would like um, language that differentiates alternative one and alternative two. Can you help me with that? And, I, and, and I'll just say a little bit more and then I'll shut up and you can help me. But um, 
uh, Justin made a suggestion about um, a time sequence for construction of the central building. Um, in my own feeling, uh, I'd like to hear from the applicants on that. I anticipate it will happen. My own feeling is that they made a very good case and it's consistent from what I know of, um, of co-housing projects. There's a whole lot of variation and it could be as simple as a whole clubhouse with all sorts of facilities or it could just be kind of a pop-up thing practically. I, we're not defining the nature of what that central space has to be. So um, I, I suspect the five years and three year extension Something's going to happen, <laughs> but we don't need to dictate what form it takes. Um, you know, if the applicants want to weigh in. So I'm, I'm happy to include that language. I think it would happen anyway. And then the other thing that I wanted to bring up was uh, I would like to um, keep the language about the timing of the demolition permit. I think a case was made that um, it's hard to even survey the lots until you can do the grading and the uh, um, this is a project that seems um, uh, poised to move forward. So um, anyway, I started a motion and then uh, I kind of bifurcated it because the conditions, as I understand it, are a bit different for, our, for alternative one and alternative two. Am I correct in that? Please. <laughs> yes, the conditions are a little bit different. Um, I think that um, for the demo permit, you wouldn't have to make any changes to what's in your agenda report because that, uh, based on your comments, it, it seems like you're wanting to go back to or, or stay with what's in the agenda report. Yeah. We would need to make a change to the conditions of approval in um, both alternative one and alternative two for the sequence of construction of the central building. Um, should you want to do that, um, we, could, we could easily put that language in. So maybe the... Um, I'm gonna, can, I, can I interject for a sec? Sorry, we have to pause. Um, apparently the microphones in the in chambers are cutting in and out, um, and so we're going to have to reset the mics in the chamber and um, pause the meeting for a sec. Mayor, may, may I make a suggestion as we do pause that if, uh, Lee, you want to take a moment to integrate the recommendation, the modifications so that we have a comprehensive motion to work from, while yeah. we make that change. And, that and, cool. and I, if I can just before you sign off, think we, we would say approval of, oh, there we go. <laughs> Nobody needs to sign off either. We just need to turn the mics off and turn them back on. And um, the inclusionary condition, um, would you be interested in including that as part of your motion, the changes to the inclusionary condition? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, what I'm trying to do is say which are the things that would be universal to both alternatives and which, and then we could say, and subject to the conditions of approval for alternative A and alternative B. Is, is that the clean way to do it? Yes. I'll be right back.
council members are on, you can just turn your videos back on so we know that you're here. Okay, it looks like everybody's back. And we left off with Council Member Matthews, so I'll return to the floor to you. Thanks, and I'm waiting on his lead. Of, um, are, are you typing something up? I'm, I'm typing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, in, while Lee's typing that um, up, Councilmember Brown, did you have a comment that you wanted to make in the meantime? Or the no, I, I can't remember why my hand was up, so no. <laughs> but, Mayor Myers, did you have a comment that you can make while Lee's typing this up? I did, yeah. I had a question, and Lee, I hate to bother you about this because you're doing that, but I don't know, Ryan, maybe you could, <laughs> you could take this one. Um, yeah. The applicant also um, brought forward uh, a letter from their architect and designer regarding the, uh, the garage setbacks and um, requesting the potential for um, a you know, double driveway and being able to have that flexibility of a, of a, you know, a minimum of a five foot setback just based on the shape of the lot. And, um, I don't believe that was accepted uh, as a condition, and I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about why just knowing the site and being someone who has a single driveway um, and how problematic that is to, to basically function. I'm just curious. Um, it does seem like the width is there to do that, to be able to have two cars. I'm just, I'm just a little bit curious as to why that, that is, uh, was, not, uh, was not accepted um, and that condition potentially changed. Um, so the reasoning behind the single um, driveway approach versus a double driveway approach? Um, I think I think it all comes down to just, um, and a lot of those conditions revolved around diminishing the, um, the impacts of, 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 a, of a garage um, uh, on the street, and also some concerns that we had about with the, um, the possibility of cars. Um, stretching out over when they're parked and stretching out over the sidewalk and blocking the sidewalk, and so when you have when you have it, have either a single car or have it coming down to one uh, driveway approach, um, I think that was some of the reasoning behind um, that condition. I don't know if Lee or Eric had any other um, anything to add to that, but that was like kind of my understanding of, of that condition. You're muted, Eric. Okay, uh, I can jump in a little bit as well. Um, in the architect's letter, he notes that the street frontage is around 74 feet, um, but uh, those, those are pie-shaped lots. So when you get past the required front yard setback, those lots get much narrower. And there's a real concern that um, uh, because of that narrowness, the garage may be a little more uh, prominent on the streetscape. And so, as Ryan said, we're trying to de-emphasize the, the appearance of the garage. Um, there was also some concern by staff that given the nature of the community um, that they're creating, there was some concern that the dwellings might be oriented towards the center. Uh, common space with less attention given to the, the street frontage and, um, you know, uh, de-emphasizing the garage is, is something that's required of all the substandard lots in the neighborhood, so um, we prefer the condition to remain as worded. Thank you. You're muted, Justin. Thank you. Uh, earlier there was a question of the applicant, I think, as it was related to the building. And so while we're um, continuing to get a draft of uh, the motion up, I'm going to see if the applicant, um, seeing their hand raised, would like to comment. Brett or 
Caitlin. Hello? Hey, you're on the line. Hi, hi, this is Brett. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Yep. Um, in terms of the timing on the common house, we're okay with that, the five and the three years. Um, that seems reasonable, thank you. Um, I would like to speak to the garages a little bit, if I may. Um, so what happens is you push those garages back on a pie-shaped lot, is it bottlenecks the house and, and kind of makes for poor house design. It also cuts you off from the back of the lot. Um, and while Eric was concerned that we might orientate the houses towards the rear center, um, we've already said we're including front porches, and, and that's because we want to accent, accent the front of the house in order to encourage community interaction with not just ourselves, but with the outside neighborhood. Um, you know, the fronts of the houses are important to us. And also on those, the 75 foot wide frontages, you have quite a wide house frontage. They're much wider than most houses, so that the, most houses in the neighborhood, I should say, so that a garage door five foot set back from the front face of the house will um, be in, in a, in a, the proportions will be good um, because of the width there along the front with that five foot setback. And the other aspect of this is that planning is suggesting a uh, single car curb cut to what could be a two car wide driveway. Now what will happen there is you pull one car in and because there's only a single car curb cut, if you pull another car in, you can't get one of them out, so therefore you're going to park on the street. So that single wide curb cut is going to effectively force people to park on the street, thus causing um, more issues with street parking. So the double wide curb cut is crucial to getting cars off the street. And the uh, setbacks on the garage uh, more than five feet will negatively impact the house design. And I think if you read, you know, Matthew Thompson has been designing this town for something like 50 years, has a tremendous amount of experience in this sort of thing, and I encourage council to consider his letter closely. I think he makes some very strong points on this. Thank you. Yep. So I'm not sure if there is the if we're getting close. We are getting close. The only thing that I would add in relation to that um, is that you know this is a pretty unique site in terms of uh, the um, terminus of these really major view corridors. And so having those additional setbacks does um, really reduce the prominence of those garage doors along the frontages. And that's something that, you know, we really want to make sure that we are um, de-emphasizing at the terminus of these um, important view corridors, you know, all the way from Woodrow, all the way from Mission, along California. And so that's why we had the additional setbacks included from uh, those view corridors. And then uh, the uh, single car driveway, actually some of the, um, the lengths of the uh, single car uh, curb cut, I should say, some of the lengths of those driveways are not conducive to having tandem spaces, and having a single car length um, would help discourage that. If you get into a 25, so you got a 15 foot setback, for example, for the house. If you go 10 feet back from that, that puts you at 25 feet. Um, if you look at two cars trying to stack there, what's going to happen is you'll end up having a, uh, a car hanging out over to the sidewalk, which is something we want to avoid. Um, you're less likely, if, if you go in and you have a single car width at the street and then you, uh, you widen that out, at that particular distance, at 25 feet, it's actually better to have the single car because it's going to discourage, even a Mini is 14 feet. 
in length. So now you got 28 feet and two car lengths, and that's going to be hanging out, you know, three feet over the 25-foot driveway. So those are some of the things that we considered. Um, and uh, you know, as you uh, as you start looking at the the angles for the lots, um, the the houses themselves aren't going to be the the full 74 feet in width. You know, once you step back, that lot's going to be narrower. And then um, when you start looking at the right angles for the homes it's actually going to be narrower. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to de-emphasize that. It's more important at the um, ends of the view terminuses, the view termini, than it is at um, those other areas. The, the inner lot there, you know, there are only, I think, two, um, uh, two car garages on the other side of the street there. So consistency with the neighborhood as well is one of the things that we were looking at. And Lee, my understanding too with that that it's only in those um, the termini of those streets where this is happening. I uh, so there are recommendations for for both. Um, the recommendations are greater at the view termini than they are at the other locations. Um, every location uh, has a five-foot setback from the front of the house, and that's going to be required anyway um, because the houses themselves are at 15 feet, so you have to have a 20-foot driveway. So you, that puts those five feet back. So that's a standard, but that, that only allows for a one-car garage under these conditions. It would, um, if you want to go up to a two-car garage, then you would have additional setbacks. And the one-car garage, you know, the applicants had concerns about getting things in and out. We, we said you can have a 10-foot wide one-car garage to facilitate getting things in and out, or you can have a tandem garage. We just didn't want a wide expanse of um, garage doors along the, the housing, uh, along that circle, particularly at the view termini. Okay, thanks. Of course. Uh, Council Vice Mayor Myers, do you have a question? Yeah, I just um, maybe for the applicant, um, it's hard because I'm it, I'm, I'm trying to picture um, all of this, but um, uh, so the the applicant just mentioned though, um, Lee, that the intent is to have the house is facing the out, outward towards the towards the community that they're the driveways so in other words the houses aren't going to be towards the middle of the circle they are intending that the design would bring their houses facing their neighbors across the street basically so um you know that's how the circles is now everybody's looking out you know nobody's nobody's parcel most most uh, homes in that neighborhood are set on the you know on the street frontage with either the garages tucked to the side typically um, there's all, I don't even know if there's here. I, I can't. I can't picture right now a two-car garage on the circle, but I'm sure there's a couple. So, with the applicant's intent to try to mimic base or to to basically um, be consistent with the neighborhood in terms of having the, the houses at the front. Um, I guess I'm just confused why we are why we're restricting the garages if in this way if they are going to be consistent you know along the side of the house or but with the with the width we could potentially pull in two cars i'm just worried that you're going to end up with all cars on the street um and you do have the curb curb width so i'm just just trying to understand um a little bit more why why this is why we're we're holding them to this I would say that the, the garage um, setbacks are more important than the width. Um, what it does is it provides more landscaping out of the street and more landscaping um, right behind the sidewalk where that, um, that driveway curves out a little bit. So, so there's a, a small um, increase in landscaping there. There's also a small increase in the available parking on the street. So um, those are some of the considerations. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly, if, if the council's desirous of um, finding a middle ground on this particular issue, 
I can include that as, uh, you know, you could say, for example, um, so, uh, you could find a middle ground on the, the setbacks, you know, uh, in between what uh, the applicant is proposing and what we're proposing um, could be an option for the council to consider if you're struggling with this issue. Um, when we looked at the uh, site planning exercise, keeping a five foot setback and having uh, a substantial um, uh, a, a setback for the two car garage width um, that um, is consistent with the view termini that are at the, uh, that, that is consistent with the current conditions. Um, mm -hmm. It does, it, it left about uh, 17 or 18 feet of developable area um, as an estimate for the remaining area outside of the garage. So to Brett's point, um, it does, if you wanted to put in a two car garage at those view termini, um, it does leave, you know, ample space, but it, uh, it you know, 17 or 18 feet is, is going to constrain you some. Um, and that would be a decision that they need to make. You know, they could still do 10 uh, feet. They could still do a two-car tandem garage um, under these conditions. So if that's, you know, it's just a little bit more information for the council to consider based on, you know, the, the sketches that we did here in considering the conditions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm kind of inclined to split the baby. <laughs> uh, can you tell me what's the width of a single curb cut and a double curb cut? Probably not double, is it? Uh, Ryan, you want to chime in on that? Because I would tell you estimates, but they, they may not be accurate. What, what was the question again? It was what's the width of a single and a two? Single curb cut and a double curb cut. I'm not sure if someone from Public Works is on the line. They would probably know right off the bat. I'm looking to see. Oh, of a curb cut. Um, I think a single is 10, but a double, I'm not exactly sure. Um, okay. Sorry. 16 or so would be my estimate. Yeah, yeah I, I was going to guess 16 as well. Yeah, not, not, not exactly double. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually fine with just the uh, five-foot setback from the wall of the house. Actually, I'm going to just float this out there. I'm just thinking how people live. Mm -hmm. um, limit the garages to a one-car garage, but a wider curb cut. And um, I do notice in your language, ooh, where is it? Um, now I've lost it, but there's, oh, it's in item uh, F, I think, uh, on the guidelines. It talks about um, special attention should be paid during the design permit to ensuring the design materials and screening of the garage enhance and do not detract from the visual character, uh, enhance garage door materials, orientation of the garage doors on the site, screening trellises, or other architectural features can be used to accomplish this goal. And I think what you're envisioning in the design process here is this is not like the cheapo 60s <laughs> version, you know, that the, the whole facade of the house will be well designed. So I think that can be achieved, um, giving a little bit more flexibility there. Okay. So are you staying consistent, are we staying consistent then with the wording in the uh, condition, condition number 34? No, going down. Or 35, number, excuse me. Uh, 35, going down to E, the garage is mm -hmm. showing that we've got five feet from the front wall of the house, period. Um, garage shall be limited in width to a one-car garage door with a maximum door width of 10 feet. And then I would allow uh, curb cuts shall um, be allowed up to a double curb cut. That's okay. A suggestion. Okay. 
But I, I do think the point is made that. On, on these papered lots that um, they they want to um, not push more of the garage toward the usable part of the back backyard and and uh, mm -hmm. I would support those. I would support those changes as part of the motion. Yeah. So, Councilmember Matthews, um, yeah. could you repeat that? So, on 35E, just the, the uniform garage shall be set back on a minimum of five feet from the front wall of the house. So you're not, so no additional setback for uh, the uh, the view termini. Right. I think with all the other criteria you've got in for design, I, I think that, that answers the concern. And then garage is limited in width to a one car garage door. It means that the whole double garage door thing does not dominate the view, um, but allow a broader curb cut. So um, F would stay the same, G would be deleted. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Okay, I think I'm tracking with you guys now and have the motions with the uh, <laughs> changes for each alternative. Um, and um, Bonnie suggested that I share my screen, but I'm actually uh, on my iPad for the video and I'm on my computer for the uh, uh, for what my work here. Oh, Lee, um, you can go ahead and send it to me then. All right. Thank you. Uh, I will send it to you, Bonnie, um, as well as to Councilmember Matthews. Um, and then to, uh, was the seconder of the motion, Councilmember Myers? I was the maker of the motion. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Justin. No, I was gonna say that you were the maker of the motion. That was seconded by Councilmember Watkins, I believe. Okay, I will send it to, oh, Donna was the maker. Sorry. Oh, I was. Oh. <laughs> I think Donna advocated <laughs> I thought Donna kind of started it and then <laughs> you kind of <laughs> added on. He was questioning that one phrase and I said, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. And I don't know, it's yours, Donna, you take it. Okay. So, on its way, and I've, I've copied Ryan and Eric as well, and Tony Condotti to make sure that I didn't miss anything um, that I should have caught. So I just want to want to get some clarity here because I think you know, kind of backtracking in the conversation earlier, Councilmember Brown withdrew her motion along with the mayor. The vice mayor had said that she was prepared to make the motion and Council Member Watkins said that she was prepared to second the motion. Oh. And I think where we're at right now is that we're unclear who's actually making the motion. So I think as we're kind of getting things on the screen, because a lot of languages was moved around, we should get some clarity around um, who's gonna be making the motion and, and so forth. Mayor, if I if I may, I recall. I think I recall Vice Mayor Myers sending the motion to make the motion, and then uh, I was willing to second the motion, and then we left it with Lee either refining the motion at that point. That's sort of kind of for record. I'd say that's sort of how I recall it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds sounds about right. I'm not seeing anything coming from Lee. Uh, here. Would you like me to email it to all of you? Yeah, that'd be cool. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't scroll, so yeah, that would be great. That's off. Vice Mayor Myers, um, once you receive that, would you be willing to read the motion? I'd like to move approval of both alternative one and alternative two, including findings and conditions of approval and acknowledge the environmental determination for the proposed project at 111 Eret Circle. Alternative one will include a residential slash commercial demolition authorization permit to demolish a church and a tentative map to subdivide the parcel into 12 single family lots with changes to conditions as noted below. Conditions for alternative one uh, include changes to the inclusionary condition number 34 as follows. The applicant shall comply with the inclusionary housing requirements set forth at the Santa Cruz Municipal Charter um, section 24.16 part one and shall enter into and record an affordable housing development agreement prior to or concurrently with the final parcel map or final subdivision approval or prior to issuance of a building permit for any structure in the residential development, which occur, whichever occurs first. The affordable housing development agreement shall run with the land and bind all future owners and successors and in interest. If an in-lieu fee is used for alternative one, the applicant shall enter into an agreement whereby the total and in-lieu fee amount, due date, and remedies are specified in accordance with the state and local housing trust fund program guidelines and the inclusionary housing requirements set forth at Santa Cruz Municipal Chapter 24.16 Part 1. If an in lieu fee is not used for Alternative 1, the applicant shall enter into an agreement and offer up for sale two of the lot, lot, land lots at an affordable sale price in accordance with the inclusionary housing requirements set forth in Santa Cruz Municipal Charter Chapter 24.16 Part 1. New condition, build, pull a building permit and begin construction for the common building within five years. So the applicant can have a three-year extension approved administratively through a minor modification. Subsequent extension would require council approval of a minor modification. Council, no. Condition number 35E shall read, garages, sh garages shall be set back a minimum of five feet from the front wall of the house. Condition number 35G would be deleted. Alternative two will include a residential commercial demolition authorization permit to demolish a church. Plan development permit to allow variations such as multifamily housing in the R1 zone district and with minor modifications as specified in the agenda report and plan design permit and tentative map to subdivide the parcel into 10 single family parcels, a common central lot and an additional common parcel that can accommodate six condominium parcels that include four ADUs subject to the conditions, condition revisions noted below. Conditions for alternative two, changes to the inclusion, inclusionary condition number 34 as follows. Lee, is this the same? I'm sorry, this, it is different. The applicant shall yeah, comply the, with the inclusionary. Sorry, the first Lee? paragraph is the same, the second is different. Okay. The applicant shall comply with the inclusionary housing requirements set forth in Santa Cruz Municipal Chapter 
24.16 Part 1 and shall enter into and record an affordable housing development agreement prior to or concurrently with the final parcel map or final subdivision map approval or prior to issuance of a building permit for any structure in the residential development, whichever occurs first. The affordable housing development agreement shall run with the land and bind all future owners and successors in interest. If an in-lieu fee is used for alternative two, the applicant shall enter into an agreement whereby the total in-lieu fee amount, due date, and remedies are specified in accordance with the state local housing trust fund program guidelines and the inclusionary housing requirements set forth in Santa Cruz Municipal Ch Charter Chapter 24.16 Part 1. If an in-lieu fee is not used for alternative two and individually financed airspace units are sold slash developed, the applicant shall enter into an agreement to donate three of the six air rights condominium spaces to Habitat for Humanity or a similar affordable housing developer for the purposes of providing affordable housing. The affordable housing airspaces, airspace areas must be adequate to provide three affordable units plus um, and associated parking. If an in lieu fee is not used for alternative two and a single project is developed as is contemplated in the current alternative to multifamily project design, then two two-bedroom condominium units, each with an associated ADU, shall be sold at an affordable rate in accordance with Santa Cruz Municipal Charter Chapter 24.16 Part 1. A new condition is uh, attached to alternative to pull a building permit and begin construction for the common building within five years. The applicant can have a three-year extension approved administratively through a minor modification. Subsequent extensions would require council approval of a minor modification. And new council, member, council Member Myers, yep. for that condition um, in both uh, scenarios, um, I think it would be good to say within five years of a specific time. And so how about within five years of the um, issuance of the initial building permit? Sounds good. Yeah. Is, that, is that okay with you, Mayor Cummings? Okay. That, that sounds good. A new, a new condition for all. Sorry, really quickly, is, within five years of what? Uh, the issuance of the initial building permit. Thank you. Another new condition for alternative two is that the six units and four ADU shown in an attached configuration shall be provided in detached or another alternative condominium airspace configuration with four attached or detached ADU. And if I can uh, yes. a minor modification, we changed that to minor modification and I didn't catch that. Right, a minor modification shall be considered and approved by the council at a later date. To, re, to redesign common infrastructure and site layout. An administratively approved design permit shall be required for the individual condominium units. Should an alternative approach that allows for individually financed units be pursued, condition number 36 herein pertaining to the construction timing for the condominium structure shall be revised as part of the minor modifications such that only the construction of common infrastructure elements in water, sewer, driveway, et cetera, parentheses, are tied to the construction timing for the other single family units. Condition number 35E shall read, garages shall be set back a minimum of five feet from the front wall of the house. And condition number 35G would be deleted. And that's the end of the motion. Okay. A motion by Vice Mayor Myers. I still second that long motion. <laughs> All right, we have a second. Oh, Watkins. Um, is there any further discussion on this item? All right, hearing none. Wait, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't hear. There we go. Uh, uh, Council Member Matthews. So I'm wondering why the first. Alternative one will include a residential commercial demo authorization to demolish a church and tentative map to subdivide the parcel to 12 single family lots with changes to conditions, but it does reference the common lot in the middle as the second alternative does. See what I'm saying? Alternative two 
includes the demolition and um, and a map to subdivide the parcel into 10 single family parcels, common central lots, and addition common central parcels. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, 12 single family lots and a common central parcel. Yeah. That's correct, Bonnie, at that location. Good catch, thank you. <laughs> it's the nub of the whole issue. <laughs> it is, I agree. Okay, oh God. Hey. Bonnie, did you catch that uh, correction? Something like that. Yeah. yeah, including that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, are there any further further comments on this item? We have the same uh, timing change in alternative one that we had in alternative two, Bonnie, um, for the construction of the common building. Uh, mm -hmm. Should be. Yes, five years from issuance of an initial building permit. Oh, uh, you were there a second ago. That's yeah. There you go. It's further down. It's the first bullet point out of the three. Yes, right there, new condition within five years from issuance of the initial building permit. or comments on this item? I have a question. I just wanted to go back and double check. In the slides, when you um, had presented the inclusionary, can you just bring that slide back up? I just want to double check on some language that was said earlier. Ryan, can you share screen? Thank you. Was it, was it this one or was it another slide? Yeah, it was this one. I just, I just wanted to double check. I think in the presentation at one point, um, someone might have said three two-bedroom condominium units, each with an associated ADU. And so I just wanted to double check the, the language to make sure that it was two and not three. So it, it, um, the condominium air spaces would be three? Uh -huh. Um, but if they develop the project, which actually, you know, we could even delete that now because the council has directed that the, um, the project not um, be developed as contemplated in alternative two. So we could delete the end of that one. Ryan, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. Then, um, we could go back. And Bonnie could pull that up. So under alternative two, the last sentence uh, for the inclusionary conditions. Um, starting with, um, if an in-lieu fee is not used and a single project is developed as, con as contemplated in the current alternative two, yep, that whole sentence could be deleted because the council has uh, just down below said alter attached uh, configuration shall an alternative um, shall be provided. Can 
you can find you scroll down to that new condition. I just want to read the um, thank you. Lee, however, um, where would the language then be that would account for if the in loop fee is not used for alternative two? So if you if you go up just a little bit, Bonnie, it it's right here. It, uh, so it's the second sentence here. If an in lieu fee is not used for alternative two, and individually financed airspace units are sold or developed. We have the six air I'm wondering if there's a way to incorporate both of those so that there's options, because it seems like the only option currently is donating the sites to Habitat for Humanity or a similar affordable housing developer. However, if the project was developed and they wanted to sell units at an affordable rate, would that be something that we could also keep in so that um, there are options? Yes, we could build something in to that effect. Um, it could come back to council for approval um, if that's something that the, the council is desirous of. I don't know what others think, but I'm just kind of trying to look at this and, and see, you know, if in the fees are not used for this alternative, if there are options. It, it seems like the way that it was proposed initially with alternative two is that there's these two options. One is um, if the in the fee is not used, then the applicant can challenge an agreement to donate the I don't mean spaces to have that humanity of course sold in for board eight. Okay. I think that that share that. Um I would add in accordance with SCMC chapter twenty four. Yes. I think uh Jessica is on the line here. Yes, she is. Uh, Jessica, does that look okay to you? Jessica DeWitt, our housing manager in economic development? Yeah, that looks fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Matthews. Yeah, thank you. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of including that language would be um, because, so, or sold at an affordable rate, there's a big step missing there, it seems, which would be development of those parcels, right? So I'm just not sure how, what that gets us or gets them for flexibility. Uh, um, it, it would be or developed and sold at an affordable rate. And, and I think Council Member Brown, um, they would likely, uh, you know, they, they may look at that and say, hey, you know, from an economy of scale perspective, we could develop this, sell it at an affordable rate, and actually make a little bit of money um, on it. So that, that could provide some more flexibility for them. Okay. But yeah, I think with developed in there, then it makes more sense to me. Thank you. Good catch. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, we'll finish this sometime tonight. <laughs> um, I'm certainly.
searching and searching. Where is where is the? I know we're not requiring the um, ADUs be mapped initially, but we there's language somewhere about ensuring that all the plans um, can accommodate an ADU. Where where is that in here? I'm searching and I can't find it. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. Um, it's under condition number 19, under the CCNRs, and it says, language shall be included to sufficiently ensure that residents within the site, whether living in single family detached home, oh, excuse me, that's the wrong one. That's it, yeah. Um, let me find the next one. Okay, it is a 35J, design permit plans for each home shall show a conceptual design confirming how and where an accessory dwelling unit could be accommodated on the site in conjunction with the proposed home design. Okay. okay. And at some point, I'd just like to make a comment. Sure, I think now is a good time for that. Okay, well, I just wanna say, um, I think co-housing really is a very beneficial model. And I have many, many friends that live in different co-housing projects to have for many years, serving different kind of demographics and lifestyles. And it's, it's really, it's a wonderful model. And I think this group has come together and worked really hard uh, with changing conditions and um, uh, meeting with staff, trying to meet the guidelines, and what we see here is, uh, and they're facing some real, uh, utterly unforeseen conditions right now, but um, it does, to my mind, fully meet the intention and description of a co-housing project. Um, it meets all our general plan and zoning standards. It can provide housing variety, it provides in one form or another, it meets our inclusionary requirements, and I am pleased that we're building in, particularly right now, some flexibility. So um, I know this has been an important site to the neighborhood for years and years in different ways, um, but I do think that this can be a real asset to the neighborhood as well going forward. All right, thank you for those comments. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, just really quickly, I, I wanna say, uh, just, uh, say thank you to everyone for kind of hashing this out here. I, I guess y'all were more ambitious than I, I wasn't feeling ambitious enough to figure this all out tonight, which is why I originally thought maybe coming back in two weeks, this could all, this could get worked out. But um, I'm happy to uh, support this as I think you all know by now, my uh, biggest concern when we're looking at a uh, housing project is maximizing the f potential for affordable housing. And I think that the, um, the conditions that we've set up here will, will do that for us. So um, I'm, I'm pleased that we were able to um, include this and, and wordsmith it tonight. Okay, with that, um, I'd also just like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues, and I'd also like to just thank um, the community, and um, yeah, because this has been, as the uh, uh, applicants have mentioned, it's been a long process, and a lot of people have been involved, it's been a lot of emotions, and I think that we did, uh, we tried to do our best to make sure that we heard from the entire community to incorporate those concerns into our decision making this evening as we're moving in some, into some of the final phases of the approval of this project. Um, and I really hope that the, uh, the applicants as they're uh, moving through their various stages of development can uh, really reach out to the folks in the community and build uh, stronger relationships with them given that they will be your new neighbors. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to the city clerk 
uh, so that we can have a roll call vote on this item, um, which was the motion, which I, I cannot read all the way through again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, Find your bed. Second I, number one. I'm sorry. Um, can I just clarify, there's nothing in the motion that says to adopt the resolution, so I just want to make sure the resolution encompasses that motion. Okay. So I'll just add that. Thank yeah. you. Sorry about that. Okay. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Matthews? Oh, aye. Brown? Aye. Holder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all for your hard work, patience, and diligence on this item. And with that, um, we will adjourn our city council meeting and we will see you all in two weeks. And thank you, staff, for all your work too. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a great night. Stay safe. Thank you. We'll see some of you tomorrow.